Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our webinar today on AV integration. I want to invite you and encourage you to submit your questions throughout the day uh, through the various workshops. Just a little bit of background about ASGCT. First of all, my name is Beverly Davidson. I'm a professor at Penn and my laboratory is at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I have some vested interest in this as a scientist. Um, it's an incredibly important topic. ASGCT, for many of you, you know that it's a nonprofit professional organization of about 5,000 scientists and growing. We work in a variety of fields uh, in a variety of settings, including academic institutions, biotech, hospitals, and big pharma. And we're the leading scientific organization for gene and cell therapy researchers, developers. And in addition to um, our annual meetings and, and events throughout the year, we play a key role in convening experts to address significant and timely questions facing the field of which today's event is one of those. Today, we're gonna include discussions of non-clinical research on the integration profile of AAV vectors, the translatability of animal data to clinical data, best practices for AAV vector inter integration risk assessment and, and methods to mitigate that, and approaches to consider the risk benefit of AAV uh, integration. I hope that uh, you enjoy the entire workshop. There'll be, again, discussions throughout the day. And it's, it's led by uh, Dr. Kevin Egan and, and Doug McCarty. So Dr. Kevin Egan is, uh, is the head of BioMarin's uh, Discovery Research Programs and has been in that position since October of 2020. And prior to that, many of us knew Kevin through his role as professor in the Department of Stem Cell and regenerative biology at Harvard University, as well as being director of the Stanley Center, or the director for stem cell biology at the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research at the Broad. He's also an institute member of the Broad Institute of Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Harvard. So I'd like to introduce Kevin here to get us uh, rolling this morning, this afternoon, or this evening. And again, thank you so much for attending our webinar and we look forward to an exciting event with lots of active discussion. Kevin? Thanks very much, Bev. I'd like to echo your thanks to everyone for joining us, whether or not it's in the morning here on the West Coast, um, in the afternoon in Europe, or in the evening in Asia. I think Samantha is gonna share my slides here in a moment. And um, I'd like to set the stage for our event today with just a, um, a brief um, background introduction on the science at, at 40,000 feet and some of the rationale um, for this event today. As we all know, AAV gene therapy has emerged as a promising therapeutic approach for gene replacement. And the first products are now approved and many clinical trials are, are underway. And as our ASGCT community continues to study the process of AAV-mediated gene transfer, we're learning increasingly more about the biological mechanisms that influence its success. These include important progress in understanding capsotropism, trafficking, the nature of the immune response to AAV, and processing of the recombinant genome. And Samantha, if you could animate this slide, it's that step of vector genome processing and nuclear maintenance that we'll consider in our round table today. And I wanna thank Doug McCarty and all of the ASGCT staff for their effort in assembling our panelists and the presentations today on this topic. Now, while recombinant AAV genomes are generally found to be in an episomal configuration within the host cell nucleus, it's been observed that a subset of vector DNA can be found integrated into the host cell genome as integration of vector genomes could negatively influence host cell gene function, it's natural for our ASGCT community to consider the mechanisms that govern this process. Many of the mechanisms that influence vector genome integration are really still in need of further clarification. These include, for example, the vector and genomic sequences that influence integration frequency, whether all target host cell types display a similar propensity for vector integration, 
and the precise forms of vector that are integrated. Observations that young mice, especially, transduced with high doses of certain AAV vectors developed hepatocellular carcinoma associated with vector integration, while comparable doses of distinct AAV vectors did not only increase the importance of achieving a more granular understanding of these factors and their biological ramifications after AAV-mediated gene transfer. Sam, next slide. Now, for the moment, initial observations of HCC events in rodents have led to the natural question of whether these findings translate to other species widely used as preclinical models and, of course, to patients that are being actively treated with AAV gene therapy. Thus far, a decade of studies in K9 models has not surfaced ochrogenic events associated with AAV gene transfer, but has certainly corroborated the vector genome integration can occur. Likewise, AAV vector associated oncogenic events have not been reported following several years of clinical experience, while it's clear that vector genome integration can also occur in that context as well. So there's clearly much more to learn about this subject, and that's the landscape in which we're meeting for the roundtable today. In the next slide, I wanted to briefly recap our goals for today, which are to do everything that we can as a community to surface our current scientific understanding of the factors that govern this process of vector integration and how similar it is or is not in different species. We will also try to surface areas where we need a better understanding of integration and where ASGCT could advocate or create a forum for speaking about those forms of research. I think it's also critical that we come together as a community and discuss paths uh, all together for navigating this theoretical risk to patients during preclinical development and understand how we're thinking about it together. With that in mind, it might inform our um, experience from the clinic, how we should be thinking about the events that we're seeing or not seeing, and how to best be responsible to patients who are in trials that are underway. In the next slide, I wanna briefly walk you through the agenda for today. As Bev implied, the agenda today will play out in three distinct parts, which um, really um, both reflect our current understanding of this science and also the different stages and different contexts in which we think about the ramifications of vector integration. In the morning, we'll do our best to surface our current understanding of the preclinical science of vector integration and its implications. And I'm very pleased that we've been able to assemble an expert a panel who have both been involved in the earliest discoveries of vector integration, but also continue to pioneer our understanding of it as a community. After a brief break for lunch and a roundtable discussion after these initial um, presentations, We'll gather back together in the afternoon Eastern time. Go to the next slide, please. And we'll spend time thinking about the clinical considerations and best practices for risk assessment of either near-term clinical candidate molecules or those that are um, currently being assessed in the, in the clinic. And I'm very grateful for Eugenia Montini, Ricardo Dolmesh, and Marcus Grampe for joining us for the, uh, with their presentations on that topic. We'll again then have a roundtable discussion um, with all panelists with plenty of time for your input and questions to um, discuss these talks. Final, we'll, finally, we'll close. Next slide. With a session that will broadly synthesize what we've talked about today, and that we'll do our best to align on a path forward and some initial thoughts on how ASGCT should react um, from what we've heard today. And uh, our goal from this really is to come together as an ASGCT community um, to potentially put a white paper together around this important topic uh, with all of the panelists and others interested in um, participating. So we really look forward to not only the active participation 
of the panelists today, but also all of you who are attending through the chat function. Next slide. So really in, um, in closing, I'd like to again thank Doug for all of his efforts in pulling together um, this event, all the roundtable participants, uh, no matter where they are in the world, for taking time aside from their normal activities for this important event. Um, Bev Davidson for her leadership in um, uh, putting aside ASGCT resources for this event and ASGCT staff for um, their participation in making sure that today's event is a huge success. I'd also look to really acknowledge the collaboration of the ASGCT Regulatory Affairs Committee um, for um, their prioritization of this event and um, their shared view of the importance of this topic. So with that in mind, I'd like to just close by um, introducing the panelists today, beginning with my um, co-organizer for this event who will be moderating discussion and questions in the first session today. Doug, uh, Doug McCarty is unaffiliated at the moment, but many of us know him as having previously worked at Pfizer and as an associate professor for many years at Nationwide Children's Hospital. And again, I'm really grateful for him assisting and, um, and really working hand in hand today um, on this event. Mark Kay is a professor of pediatrics and human gene therapy at Stanford University. And again, as I applied, was really one of the pioneers in looking closely at vector integration. Phil Tai is an assistant professor and principal researcher at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Randy Chandler serves as a staff scientist at the National Institute of Health. We're grateful for Denise Sabatino joining us. She's a researcher in the Division of Hematology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. David Lillycrap is a professor in the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine at Queens University. Irene Gil Farina currently serves as the head of research and development at GeneWork. Fred Bushman is a professor of microbiology at the University of Pennsylvania. Guangping Gao is a principal investigator and director at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Dinosaw is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board at Vita Ventures and Voyager Therapeutics. Eugenie Montina is, Montini is a group leader at the San Rafael Telethon Institute for Gene Therapy. Ricardo Dolmesh is joining us as president of research and development at Unicure. Marcus Grompy is a professor at Oregon Health Sciences University focusing on pediatrics research. And Ron Crystal is the chairman of genetic medicine and professor of internal medicine at the Weill Cornell Medical College. So thank you again to everybody for joining us. And uh, Samantha, I think you can take my slides down now and we'll jump into the first session, our reflections on emerging non-clinical data on this important topic. Once again, thanks very much to everyone for joining us for this roundtable today. Um, we're looking forward to this important event and insights from all of you as a community, as well as from our panelists today. So Mark, if you wanna share your slides and, and begin. Uh, thank you, Kevin and Doug, for the invitation to speak. Um, I was asked to kind of um, talk a bit about characterizing AV integration from a historical background. And uh, this is a, a recent uh, a trip I had taken Oops, backwards uh, down towards um, a Big Sur. And if you can think of this region here as a broken piece of DNA in this bridge and integration event to, to, to make the pathway contiguous uh, at a macro scale. But uh, what, what I'd really like to do is uh, touch a little bit on, on what uh, Kevin alluded to. The fact is uh, kind of summarize what we know about uh, AV transduction. And again, a lot of this is obvious, although a lot of this, the detailed mechanisms are, aren't really known. And although it's obvious now, back in the early days, meaning the mid 90s, when this was being studied, there was a lot of confusion about integration because as we know, the AAV, many of the AAVs, uh, proviral genomes end up as 
large concatamers, which were uh, sometimes in the early days confused with integration events. So we know that there are concatameric sequences that exist in a non-integrated form. Now, when the AV comes in, it has to become double-stranded. Uh, there's uh, two mechanisms that have been promoted. One's annealing, one second strand synthesis. Um, there is a circularization of monomeric uh, sequences and then concatamer formation. And what we really don't know is what molecules in what state go from the, the linear uh, genomes to the concatameric. It's unlikely to be the circular DNAs, but it could be either single-stranded or double-stranded DNAs that then concatamerize uh, perhaps by a, a non-homologous end joining mechanism. And then again, as pointed out, and will be a topic of great discussion today, is the integration events. And again, we don't know the exact molecular form uh, that ends up integrating, whether it's single-stranded DNA that starts or whether it's double-stranded linear DNA. Um, but really, the, the molecular forms that end up integrating uh, is an important topic, as well as the copy numbers that integrate and where uh, they integrate. So there's quite a bit that we don't understand yet, and uh, this will become important as we uh, uh, approach these various topics. Now, some of the earliest studies where uh, integration of AAV uh, were eluc uh, elucidated were uh, done uh, by David Russell's lab and Jude Samolsky's lab. And what they did was they used a clever trick back again in the, in the mid, late 1990s, where they made AAV vectors that contained um, bacterial origins of replication, as well as both a eukaryotic and prokaryotic antibiotic selection system. So they simply transduced the AAV vectors into various cell types. They could then use G418 to select for integrants. Uh, pick clones, uh, go ahead and do southern blots on the various clonal lines, digest with restriction enzymes uh, that don't cut in the vector, and then circularize and then use these DNA molecules to transform bacteria to get plasmids that would contain uh, breakpoints at the where they had integrated into the genome. And back in these days, we really didn't have large uh, uh, genome sequences. So what was found was that there were a, a number of integration sites and the mechanism appeared to be th primarily through a non-homologous recombination because there were all sorts of deletions, duplications, things uh, at various uh, in integrants. And there was no specific site uh, that was picked up in these er early studies. Now, when we knew that AAV was integrating, there was a lot of debate about why AAV persisted in terms of transgene expression when the vectors were injected into mice. Um, and there were a lot of us, even myself, who thought perhaps these AAVs were primarily integrating. But what we did was we did a study, and again, a lot of the work I'm going to talk about um, some of the work from our lab that I'll talk about as long as, as well as other labs uh, data uh, were, was done by Hiroyuki Nikai, who at the time was a postdoc in the lab and now has continued on to contribute to this field as well uh, as an independent investigator. But what we did was a two-thirds partial hepatectomy where we could, after we gave the AAV, we could actually uh, uh, stimulate all of the remaining hepatocytes to divide once or twice. And that way, we knew, based on studies that we had done with retroviruses and DNA transposons that were known to integrate, we could look at what, get an idea of what percentage of the expression was coming from episomal forms. And what you see is that after partial hepatectomy, there was a 90 to 95 percent loss in transgene expression. And this then suggested that at least uh, um, 90 to 95% of the uh, vector forms in vivo in a mouse liver uh, came from episomes and that there, were, there was some proportion 
perhaps less than 5% that may be integrated. And this was further depicted by doing southern blots, uh, looking for AEV genomes uh, pre uh, partial hepatectomy and then post partial hepatectomy and, and seeing the loss of the genomes as well. So this was kind of the first estimate in vivo of what percentage of AAV genomes were integrating. And it was important to note that we also wanted to know, does integration continue to occur over time? So we had injected mice and waited a long period of time, like almost a year, and then went and did a partial hepatectomy and saw that we lost the, the same amount of transgene expression. So it appears, and all the data subsequently suggests, that integration occurs early after transduction and does not continue to any appreciable degree over time. And another interesting finding here was that when the cells divide once or twice after partial vitectomy and the removal of 66% or so of the original liver that were transduced, based on the loss of genomes, there was more than a dilutional loss of AAV genomes during cell division. Now, what really caused some alarm was a study done by Mark Sands' group in which he had treated mice, and was trying to treat a um, MPS7 in neonatal mice, and he used an AAV that expressed the uh, uh, transgene missing in, in, in this animal model of a human disease. And what he found was that a small number of animals developed HCC, and this was reported and caused a, some concern. Now, the issue was that there were no controls because these mice didn't survive. And these mice were also in an unusual background. So the background rate of HCC in these animals um, is, was not known. At the same time, myself and Kathy High had proposed to do AEV2 human factor nine uh, in, in a clinical trial and with the recent retroviral insertional mutagenesis that led to leukemia in the X-Link SCID trial, there became a lot of concern about this study. So in March 2001, the RAC and FDA had a public meeting to discuss the risk of genomic integration. And the uh, minutes from this or the transcripts used to be online, but I, I couldn't get them, but I'm sure I have them somewhere if people are interested. But I remember when I was asked to participate in this, what I did was I called all the uh, labs that were doing animal studies with AEV and looked for individuals that had kept animals for long periods of time and had done uh, post uh, uh, autopsies, necropsies, and looked for any evidence of tumors. And um, I assembled all that information. And at that time, there were no other reports of a hepatocellular carcinoma. So in the end, there was lots of discussion and really there was no clear uh, evaluation of what the risk may really be, but they allowed the clinical trial to move forward. Um, shortly after that, um, we uh, did a study where we looked at uh, AEV integration in uh, mouse liver uh, studies done in my lab and in collaboration with Marcus Grumpy using both selected uh, hepatocytes in vivo as well as unselected hepatocytes. And we were able to characterize 29 uh, AAV integrations. At the time, you know, this was a fair amount of work. We didn't have the modern sequencing technologies. And what we found that most of the AAV integrations were either in or near genes, all of which were expressed in the liver, and that the integrations were all types, monomers, complicated uh, uh, insertions, deletions, bidirectional, and there was no single type of integrant that was uh, isolated uh, in these animals. And then a commentary came out in Nature based on this paper that really kind of upset me because they tried to imply that this uh, was, was dangerous. And, you know, sure, there's some risk issues, but I thought that, you know, because of the nature of gene therapy at the time, uh, there was um, perhaps uh, went a little bit overboard in some of these uh, concerns. Uh, subsequently, we followed up 
and um, we what we call large scale sequencing, which on today's standard wouldn't be large scale, but we were able to identify about 350 or, th or 400 uh, integrants and define where the integrations had occurred um, after giving AAV in vivo, um, again, using um, a, a selection system that you'll hear more about from Marcus Grumpe later. And what we found again was that most of the integrations were occurring in, um, in uh, gene uh, sequences that were defined back in, again, this is around 2004, um, and found that we, when we compared where the integrations were actually found versus if we had random, we, we ran programs to look at what would happen if these were random integrations, that there, there was a significantly higher number of integrations either in or near uh, gene sequences. And we found that there were lots of different events that occurred. There were um, uh, deletions, um, uh, which, which was the, the primary event, but we also saw various duplications. Again, large de deletions and insertions may not be picked up by these screens, but we also found evidence of uh, translocations, which again, all of these may not be picked up, but we did pick some up. What was interesting was that we found a, a 10 times higher than expected number of integrants in the ribosomal DNA locus. And uh, this was uh, really uh, interesting um, at the time, um, in part because uh, Jude Samalski and then others started to find that uh, some of the encoding of the AV vectors appear to occur on the nuclear membrane, and perhaps that's in part why uh, you find uh, more integrants than expected in, in ribosomal RNA genes. 4% um, of the integrants were in oncogenes versus 2.3% expected via random integration, but again, uh, this wasn't quite statistically significant. Um, David Russell's lab did a very nice study where they made uh, uh, genomic cell lines through a retroviral insertion that contained an ISCE1 rest restriction endonuclease site. And then he was able to add a, a gene that would uh, induce breaks here. And he found that there was a high number of integrations that occurred in double strand broken regions of the genome. And he confirmed this in additional studies using gamma radiation or topo uh, isomerase inhibitors. Uh, and again, he found high proportion of integrations in genes and associated, again, with vector and chromosomal deletions of various sizes, insertions, and again, the presence of microhomology between the vector and the chromosome. Um, and, and again, the location of these integration sites were similar regardless if the integrations were spontaneous or occurred at double strand breaks implying similar mechanisms. Um, Mark Sands and David Russell then uh, did this early study where they repeated basically the treatment of these uh, MPS7 mice. This time they had a control arm where mice were treated with bone marrow transplant. Um, and they found that there was a higher incidence of HCC in the AEV treated animals. Um, and again, what um, David Russell did then was characterize um, uh, integration in four of the tumors and found that there was an integration of AAV um, upstream of the Ryan locus, which is a very complicated non-coding RNA locus, which is known to be associated with hepatocellular carcinoma in humans as well. And that this integration activated this locus, which is normally only on in fetal and early development uh, in the neonatal period. And of course, you'll hear more from Randy Chandler's uh, uh, talk uh, where he and uh, Chuck Venditti published a, a very impressive large scale, scale study about this. But you can see that these integrations increase the expression of some of these non-coding RNAs um, that are known to be involved in uh, tumorigenesis. So again, uh, this was some uh, first evidence that AAV integration from the promoter of the AAB could activate 
uh, a proto-oncogenic sequence. And these were neonatal mice. And you know, one of the important questions is, is this locus as targetable uh, in adult mice when the locus is not active? And again, this is an important theme, which I know will be discussed further. So um, as I uh, would mention, there's lots of uh, different uh, sites of integration, broken DNA, uh, regions of very small microhomologies appear to be common, palindromic sequences. Uh, again, these all imply various mechanisms, which I won't get into. Uh, CPG islands, transcribed sequences, whether the chromatin's more open, whether these uh, molecules uh, will have transient breaks uh, that would make them more accessible, and also the issue about the ribosomal DNA loci. So what is the integration frequency? Well, we can assume the number of hepatocytes in an adult liver. If you take a relatively low transduction frequency, that would be equivalent to 0.1 or 0.5 AAP genomes per hepatocytes. Um, and also to point out that um, uh, there was a study in molecular therapy, you'll hear from the first author of this paper, uh, estimated that in, the, in their study, both in non-human primates and humans, that somewhere in the neighborhood of one in a thousand hepatocytes are transduced. It, um, I don't believe these were corrected for non-hepatocyte cells. And about 0.05 to 10% of the AAV genomes were integrated. Um, and you know, the human data was collected from an AAV5 trial. Um, but again, uh, this was a subtherapeutic dose. So the human sample was taken after a year and the non-human primates after four weeks. Um, the Grumpy Lab will present new data suggesting that uh, as many as one to 3% of human hepatocytes in a humanized mouse liver contain AEV integrants. So if you take the, the trans, a relatively low transduction of frequency and you assume that the integration is 0.1%, which may be on the low side, we're still talking about hundreds of millions of integration events. And again, the consequences of this and the risk of this aren't known. This just shows something that I mentioned and you'll hear more about is the various type of integrations you can get they're all over the map, if you will. And um, uh, as I mentioned, all sorts of different integrations. I think the complexity in trying to characterize and quantify these are related to the use of various animal or cell models, flaws or biases in various sequencing approaches. Again, we talk about various serotypes, dosing, which tissues. Um, integration into repetitive regions of the genome um, may be difficult to map, and this will be a topic that I think will be discussed in further detail uh, as we move forward. I'll just say that, you know, even though this is probably a, a property of AV we would prefer not to have, um, some of these properties have been very useful for genome editing, either with uh, using nucleases to break the DNA and insert DNA of interest, transgenes, for example, either through non-homologous end joining or homologous recombination, or even nuclease-free uh, AAV uh, mediated homologous recombination um, are being used and exploited uh, clinically in genome editing approaches, which isn't the topic of today's talk, but I just want to mention there are some positives to this type of uh, property. So I'll just end here. And uh, what I'll say is um, we still really don't know the true integration frequency in the liver, at least in humans. The risk of insertional mutagenesis, I would say, is also not clear. It's clearly not zero, but um, what is the risk? Um, what's the best way to study it? To date, I'm not aware of any tumor suppressor gene, uh, suppressor gene knockout uh, from AEV resulting in a malignancy. They're all due to uh, activation of proto-oncogenic sequences, but perhaps we'll hear something new today that I'm not aware of. Of course, we need to talk about developing better technologies to assess integration, the mechanisms, because I think that's important to understanding what actually, what type of, what the forms of integrants are. Um, and again, uh, which is the best uh, uh, approach to study this? And um, we and others are working on non-PCR approaches uh, 
uh, to try to uh, look at integrations because all of these approaches have their uh, biases, their pluses and minuses, and we'll hear more about that. So for now, which are the best models and methods to get the most accurate quantification and unraveling the mechanisms? And I'm sure uh, we're gonna talk quite a bit about this later today. So I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Mark. And we're gonna have loads of time for questions in the round table. And so we'll go directly to Phil. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Egan. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kay, for uh, such a wonderful introduction into the, to the field. And so um, again, yeah, my name is uh, Phil Ty. I'm an assistant professor in the Hori Gene Therapy Center. Um, and today uh, um, I put together a few slides, um, not necessarily uh, to discuss AEV integration, uh, per se, but at least some of the methodologies that have been developed in the field uh, to characterize uh, AAV vectors, because we know that integration does uh, exist. And so um, I think some of the next steps that we have to take as a community is to assess, um, you know, how these um, vector genomes are packaged into AAV and therefore could potentially cause some uh, cause for concern, um, either in the short term or, 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 or long term. And so uh, here are my uh, uh, disclosure slides. Um, and so um, Dr. K and Dr. Egan gave a wonderful introduction into um, the mechanism of, of, of vector transduction. And you know, uh, it goes without saying that, again, this is a multi-step process. And it's very complex. And it's not really fully understood. And, um, the round table, of course, is focused in on what is happening in the nucleus. And of course, this also, um, many parts of this um, is still a black box. And as Dr. Egan had um, uh, described, at once in the, in the nucleus, the, the DNA is thought to be encoded. And because just like wild type AAV, uh, AAV vectors um, package um, for, for conventional vectors, they package equal amounts of plus stranded and minus stranded uh, genomes. So these can then uh, undergo strand annealing to form double-stranded uh, um, forms that is necessary for transcriptional activation of the transgene. Uh, but they can also undergo, of course, second-strand synthesis to form the same. Uh, if the vector is a second-generation AAV, uh, where one of the ITRs is mutated to form self-complementary AAVs, these are already in the double-stranded uh, configurations. So one of the leading characteristics, of course, for AAV is the ITRs. And so uh, through um, ITR, um, um, uh, presumably recombination, they can form these very stable circular episodes that have been discussed um, in, in, the, in the previous uh, talk. However, again, what we're most interested in is what sort of drives integration in the host cell genome. Um, and so, you know, this delicate uh, balance, if it is a, a balance, is not very well understood. And of course, the factors that um, that drive these sort of mechanisms for integration needs to be better understood. Um, and so um, um, myself and, and Dr. Gao, um, we've been currently pursuing uh, how to assess sort of the composition of AAVs uh, that may lead to uh, these uh, the integration events. Uh, because they, they definitely need to be um, uh, addressed, right? These integrations currently are unavoidable. So, uh, um, what we ought to do is to at least understand what is actually being packaged. So when I first joined the AAV field, the expectation was that whatever you design faithfully uh, is uh, represented in the packaged vector, but this is certainly not the case, right? So the reality is that the encapsulation of the vector content is, is really a black box. Um, you can get a packaging of AAV packaging components like uh, segments of uh, rep and cap genomes. You can also uh, package um, genomes from um, helper plasmid or the, or the helper virus. And you can also package components from the um, genomic DNA as well. Um, and uh, as I'll show you, uh, you can also package truncated genomes and other sort of events. Um, and so in the past few years, uh, there have been a few groups that have um, developed Illumina-based sequencing methods. So these are these uh, short fragment uh, sequencing 
uh, methodologies um, or, or uh, next-gen sequencing methodologies. So for example, SSV-seq that was uh, developed by Magli Budlu and uh, Edward Ayoso's group um, uh, uses a second-strand synthesis uh, um, to uh, generate the required double-stranded um, fragments uh, um, for loading onto, um, for generating the Lumina libraries. The FastSeq method, which was developed by Nicole Polk's group, also um, utilizes a second strand synthesis to, in order to create the necessary fragments. Uh, VGS, which was developed by Melinda Fan's group um, from Adgene, this actually uses a, an annealing of the plus and minus strands in order to generate the double strand genomes. However, all of these uh, three uh, methodologies require um, fragmentation of the genomes. Again, because Illumina sequencing is a short fragment technology, it requires that you generate short fragments um, um, in order for you to cover uh, the vector genome um, sequence. And so, as you can see here, there are a few limitations to this methodology. Number one, you get very poor coverage across uh, highly GC-rich um, um, regions of the, of the genome. And in addition, you uh, also get very low representation of uh, ITR composition. Um, and this is, uh, again, true for, for uh, whether you, you um, utilize a sonication method or a tagmentation uh, method approach. And so because of these things, these methods uh, fall short of defining uh, truncation events. Um, and so what we had been doing in the past few years is developing a, a single molecule real-time sequencing approach uh, to query AAV preparations. And so initially we had developed a methodology to sequence um, self-complementary AAVs because um, smart sequencing requires a double-stranded template just like the other technologies. Uh, because this is already in the double-stranded confirmation, you can then uh, adapt or one open end of the, of the vector genome with this uh, DNA loop uh, to form this uh, single-strand DNA template. Um, but uh, last year, we were able to describe a methodology, again, very similar to the VGS method to anneal plus and minus stranded genomes to form the double-stranded uh, uh, gene, uh, double-stranded template to form this uh, circular DNA template that's um, required for um, strand displacement polymerase activity uh, that is required for the technology. So you get essentially rolling circle replication. Uh, and then you can uh, subject all of the reads to strand-specific consensus reconstruction to then um, um, characterize um, uh, minus and plus strands as separate uh, reads. So we were able to show that uh, this methodology uh, is able to fully represent uh, uh, the different uh, species of genomes that can uh, be readily observed in, in, um, in standard uh, DNA gels. Um, and again, uh, we were able to show that we can sequence both um, uh, single-strand AAV genomes as well as self-complementary genomes. Uh, but what's very satisfying uh, is that we are also able to display these IGV um, uh, displays of uh, these genomes to show the heterogeneity of uh, the vector preps. And so what I'm showing you here is basically every line here that you see is an individual read that's squished and compacted down. Uh, sequences of, uh, uh, sorry, regions of these alignments uh, that match the reference uh, depicted up here are, are in gray. And those sequences that uh, have gaps in them are represented as black dashes and then mismatches are, are colored. Um, and then insertions are, are also depicted in purple. And so what you see here is that uh, you can really quickly tell which genomes are self-complementary because you, uh, you can uh, fully appreciate that self-complementary genomes only uh, align to the reference genome of, of half of the genome. And then uh, if you have soft clip bases displayed, then the other half is sort of this colored rainbow segment uh, representing the complementary uh, half. And so through these methodologies, we can actually uh, um, look for regions of um, truncated genome hotspots as depicted here by uh, the sequence that is uh, designating this uh, single strand, uh, sorry, uh, a single guide RNA sequence that was developed uh, into this uh, SA-Cas9 uh, vector that we had in the lab. Uh, and we can show a uh, percentage uh, wise, uh, you know, the abundance of these truncated species uh, in these preps. One of the other things that we also wanted to show was that uh, the technology can also identify 
contaminants, right? So reads that either map to the packaging plasmids, the backbone sequences, or even the genomic sequences. And lo and behold, we are also able to um, identify these contaminants through this technology. But because uh, uh, smart sequencing is a long read sequencing technology, we actually revealed that some of these reads actually aligned to multiple references. So uh, here's a Venn diagram showing reads that map to the, to the host cell genome, uh, the add delta F6 helper plasma that we use in the lab, as well as the, uh, um, the uh, transplasmid. And what we were able to show uh, um, when you take some of these um, uh, individual reads was that they are actually chimeric. So here on the left, I'm showing um, a very short uh, AAV vector genome that consists of human sequence that's uh, now recombined with a BGH uh, poly A sequence of, um, that is related to the vector, but it's also now uh, contiguous with uh, uh, wild type ITR sequence. And on the right here, we see that there is a genome that is a, a, a result of six recombination events where you have a capsid sequence, uh, human sequence from chromosome 16, vector backbone, partial uh, amp resistance gene, and bits of human sequence from chromosome 5. But again, more importantly, you have some sequences that uh, are contiguous with intact ITRs. And so this is a little bit problematic because, number one, it, it demonstrates that uh, these contaminating genomes, they're not passively packaged into AAV, uh, that there is a mechanism that can drive AAV integration. Um, and in addition, because um, uh, episome formation is, is presumed to be reliant on ITR uh, recombination events once in the nucleus, these type of species may become um, persistent uh, in, in, in non-dividing cells. So the real question for us is really, you know, uh, what are the next steps? Um, but right, but before um, I jump into that, um, one of the things that we quickly realized is that these type of sequencing technologies, they're not cheap. Um, and so what we did was we also developed uh, in, in our lab um, a means of sequencing AAV using Oxford Nanopore. And so uh, what I'm uh, showing here is the small uh, pocket size sequencer in my messy desk here. The technology relies on a helicase that unwinds a double-stranded uh, DNA that threads a single strand sequence uh, um, through a ion pore and changes in the current are direct readouts for the base pair composition. So this read technology, uh, sorry, sequencing technology is pretty uh, uh, robust. Uh, you can get 50 to 100,000 uh, reads of AAV genomes in a few hours and live analysis can be performed. So 15 to 30 minutes into runs, uh, you can get some data. Um, and it also allows for multiplexing and, and, and uh, in addition, it allows you to reuse flow cells. So as an academic lab or a small lab, you can use these uh, type of sequencing methodologies in order to, to sequence the composition of your AAV. Uh, actually, this work, uh, Utilization of Nanopore, was published last year by uh, Radikic uh, et al., um, where they were able to demonstrate that nanopore sequencing can sequence single strand uh, vector genomes from uh, M13 and M18, uh, but it can also sequence AAV. So one thing that uh, should be noted is that uh, sequencing single-strand DNA is about 1% as efficient as double-stranded uh, DNA, uh, but because this methodology uses a tag mutation method, uh, coverages of ITRs are, are a little bit reduced. Um, we have, uh, are still under, um, we are still developing uh, and, and are looking forward to publish uh, some of our work in using nanopore to describe uh, how these vector genomes uh, are packaged when compared to the, the parental plasma that's used for the packaging event. Um, and this is work being done currently in, 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 in our lab uh, by graduate student uh, uh, Sok Nemkun. Um, so we were able to show that uh, nanopore sequencing can achieve ITR to ITR uh, coverage without having to fragment the, 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 um, uh, the vector genomes. Uh, and it looks as if the uh, percentage of truncations in chimerics are similar uh, to what you uh, can identify through smart sequencing. So uh, when thinking about different utilizations of the technology, um, there are definitely benefits uh, and minuses for each of the different uh, sequencing technologies. 
So of course, the, the real strength of Illumina is the very high throughput. You know, you can get 300 million reads on a single flow cell, and depending on how you uh, multiplex, you can get very good coverage of, of your libraries. And so if you were um, interested in a needle in a haystack type of uh, study, Illumina sequencing uh, would be what you would uh, be interested in utilizing. However, if you wanted to quantify vector heterogeneity, uh, and to look for full open reading frames of the contaminants, and you have to rely on these long read sequencing technologies. And in addition, uh, you want to, uh, if interested in, in, the, uh, in the function of the ITRs, then definitely PacBio and Nanopore uh, are the uh, ones that, uh, technologies that have the capacity to, to read through strong secondary structures. Um, and so uh, in leading into this, um, what I wanted to now uh, sort of discuss was some of the work that we've been using, uh, that we've been uh, heavily invested in, in using uh, smart sequencing to look at the composition of ITRs. And so um, really ITRs are the, the final frontier for understanding AAV biology. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, leaders in the field like Jude Samolsky is continuing to, to, to uncover um, you know, mechanisms that are uh, uh, for AEV and, and, and uh, vectorology that are dependent on the function of these ITRs. And so this is just the simple structure of, of the two configurations of ITRs, flip and flop. And um, just to note that uh, AEV, like other parvoviruses, they can have these different sort of um, uh, distributions of either plus and minus strand uh, of the genomes as well as uh, equal amounts of flip and flop for AEV, whereas these other parvoviruses have different um, ratios. So actually uh, one of the means of validating the methodology to, to really represent uh, ITR configuration is our capacity to actually uh, quantify the, um, the percentage of uh, flip, 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 flop, flop, flip, and flop, flop uh, within our vectors. Uh, if uh, the vector genomes have replicated um, uh, properly, you should again see one to one to one to one ratio of all of these uh, different compositions in your in your preps. And this is just an example of a V vector that that gives this sort of expected breakdown. However, one of the things that we uh, also started to dive into was to uh, see whether we can actually detect mutant ITRs. And so, um, one of the uh, open secrets in the AAV field is that people are sort of sharing vectors that have an 11 nucleotide deletion of the C domain. Uh, many investigators have been interested to see whether these uh, mutant ITRs actually show up in packaged uh, genomes because there's no knowing what sort of um, effect they may have uh, short term or long term. But we were able to show, like others, uh, through this uh, through this uh, sequencing methodology is that you get a significant repair. So it turns out that the, uh, the, the, um, the mutant ITR is repaired using the wild type ITR as a template. So there's just a, a distribution of uh, flip and flop compositions at the left and right ITR. There is definitely a difference in the flop and flip uh, percentages, but again, this could be a result of a, of a poor replication because of the mutant ITR. But you know, more than 98% of the genomes that we found are uh, these repaired uh, mutant ITRs uh, in packaged genomes. This also led us to try to investigate, um, you know, heterogeneity in ITRs. So, um, you know, through standard molecular biology methodologies, uh, um, many investigators have shown that ITRs are uh, indeed carry mutations. And so what we wanted to do was to see whether we can use uh, smart sequencing to give us uh, um, profiles for uh, ITR uh, heterogeneity that may be related to different ways of packaging genomes. And so I'm showing you here two preps uh, that, uh, that show a breakdown of lengths of ITRs. And so if it's a full length ITR, it's about 100 45 nucleotides in length. We can also detect unresolved ITRs that are 165 nucleotides in size. But we also see some of these more bizarre uh, um, and rare mutant ITRs in, in this uh, bottom prep here, where we see ITRs that have a deleted B arm, uh, ITRs that have deleted C arms, as well as these really fascinating trident form ITRs that are 187 nucleotides in size. Um, and so when we break down uh, the different preps, um, we see that, you know, PrEP1 is predominantly flip and flop, which means that uh, it's properly being um, um, 
um, process and their wild type and the genome is probably replicated uh, faithfully. What we see in REP2 is that uh, the, the majority of them are unresolved and also carries a large population of some of these, uh, some of these uh, um, mutate, mutant ITRs with missing B arm and missing C arm or trident forms. And so why this is important is because if we, if we look to see the genomes that carry some of these uh, some of these mutant ITRs, we find that they look, that the composition of the genomes look very much like uh, genomes that have unresolved ITRs. And so I think utilizing this sort of technology uh, to be able to assess, you know, how, um, how our vector compositions look like just by looking at the composition of ITRs is going to be very um, informative, at least in terms of understanding uh, AAV vectorology. So I wanted to close by, by um, stating the, sort of these critical questions and, and what uh, sequencing AAV vector preps uh, can sort of uh, achieve and, and enlighten us on. So really questions is, are, uh, what is the frequency of integrated residual uh, genomes? Um, and does ITR heterogeneity contribute to this frequency or, or locations of integrations? Uh, as stated before, we don't really know uh, what uh, causes these integration event, uh, events um, and where uh, they are integrated in, but at least um, in terms of what's understood, that there could that integration events. Uh, some fo some labs have found that there are hot spots in regions that have motifs that are similar in in, in sequence composition uh, as uh, uh, as the as the wild type ITRs, and so the ITRs themselves could be driving integration. But you know, further investigation need to be. Uh, dived into in order to explore this uh, hypothesis. Um, and then the question is, how can we minimize these chimeric genomes? So we're able to show that these chimeric genomes that carry ITRs, so they can definitely persist. And um, you, know, you may have cases where you can have chimeric genomes, which uh, span a full open reading frame uh, and is now persistent in the cell and could have the capacity to also integrate. So are these going to be uh, risk factors? And so um, I, I just have this sort of slide here because, you know, I, one of these talks I was asked, well, what exactly is a chimera, right? So chimera is, of course, a fire-breathing monster in Greek mythology with the lion's head, the goat's body, and the serpent's tail. But of course, it's really uh, a part that consists of, of diverse genetic constitution, right, which is what we see in our AAV genomes. And, um, but the, the, the second definition is an illusion or fabrication of the mind, right? So um, you know, we didn't, uh, uh, so when we first utilized this technology, we were able to describe these chimeric genomes, and it was a great surprise to us. Um, and, you know, I think the more and more uh, uh, vectors that we sequence using these uh, long read uh, platforms, uh, we can start to understand how these chimeric genomes are formed, uh, and we may have a better sense of controlling the factors that drive these, the formation of these chimeric genomes. And so uh, I just wanted to end with this acknowledgement slide. I want to thank some of the people that have been involved in this project, uh, in, involved in developing some of this technology, Tam Tran, Suk Nam Kung, and uh, Mitch, Mitchell Yip. Um, we did uh, um, have a continuing a, a co um, collaboration with Pacific Biosciences, uh, Christina, Aaron, Matthew, Seaton, Dan Brown, and um, 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 uh, these are the individuals that help us uh, get, get started on, on some of our, our pursuits. Uh, without their help, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have the technology we have now. And of course, I, I want to thank uh, uh, Guangping and Jun Shei in the lab. They taught me everything that I know about AAV, so I'm continually thankful for them, as well as the, the vector core that made all of the vectors, um, um, uh, save for the vectors that uh, we were uh, that um, I, I showed as PrEP1 and PrEP2. This was uh, through a collaboration with the, the University of Dinant uh, with uh, Magali uh, Budlu and Edward E. also driving those projects. And I also want to thank the, the sequencing core, uh, Maria Zapp and Daniela um, uh, Wilmot. And with that, I'll, I'll leave it to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And uh, so Phil has told us uh, a lot about what we're actually putting into these patients and what presumably gets integrated if it does, uh, if you do have an integration. Uh, Mark has told us uh, a great deal about the basics of integration and how it works. And uh, now we're gonna have Randy Chandler from a, a staff scientist at NIH talk about some of the consequences of uh, AAV integrations in terms of uh, HCC in mice.
do you want to go ahead, Randy? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this um, interesting roundtable. Um, so, just I mean, I think we're all aware of the concerns surrounding AV and integrations and some of the more recent uh, reports. Um, I think one of the one of the things at the bottom that I'd like to point out is, I, you know, there's a lot of patients that are, you know, going to have HCCs, um, natural occurring HCCs, who have been also treated with AV, and it'll be important to to, to be able to identify and either um, determine if the AV is causative or or just to to rule out the AV integration as a potential toxin. And I think you know some of the mouse studies that are out there might help, uh, you know. Um, Help, help answer those questions. So uh, Mark, Mark covered this, but in 2001, uh, that was when this, this concern first arose in, in the mice, and it, it halted uh, the uh, AV gene therapy trials at the time. I think it's interesting, in 2001, there, there were two clinical trials going on um, at the time. Now I suspect there's, there's probably hundreds. So I think that's an interesting, uh, interesting and, and encouraging that AV, the AV field is doing so well. Um, and, and I just want to reiterate what, what, uh, what Mark said earlier that, that uh, you know, eventually uh, Dr. Sands identified uh, integrations in the rean locus, uh, showed that these were, were clonal in comparison to normal liver, liver tissue or more clonal or have higher copy numbers. And he also showed that the, uh, the um, RNA, these microRNAs in the area were upregulated as a result of these integrations. So I, I think you know once again it's it's important to study um, the, the integrations in mice. You know, it, 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 we will be able to more thoroughly um, assess the potential risk in humans. Although it might not be a perfect model, it'll it'll help us understand it better. Um, we could uh, some of this data will hopefully help us um, design inherently safer AV vectors, and it once again it'll allow for the differentiation between naturally occurring HCCs and, and potentially toxic uh, events following a AV gene, gene therapy, which hopefully won't occur. But I think it's it's important to be prepared to answer that question and answer it quickly. Um, so there have been a number of studies that have looked at AV um, integrations and or um, hepatocellular the occurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma in mice. And as was mentioned before, it, it's more commonly seen in, in neonatal treatments, but it, um, in this OTC study by Bell and then a follow-up study by Zhang, they actually did see hepatocellular carcinomas in mice that were treated at nine to 11 weeks old. So there, there is actually an example of older mice, although it's, it's much less common. Um, but for, for, for this um, presentation, I'm gonna talk specifically about, about our studies. Um, uh, just just as an example of what's been seen in these um, hepatocellular carcinomas and, and what, what the integration profiles look like and actually what some of the integrations themselves look like. So um, we, we, we first, uh, we started our studies, we studied methylmonic acidemia in our lab and I don't, I don't really wanna spend a great deal of time discussing methylmonic acidemia because it really doesn't come to, into play in the integrations or the, the HCCs. But we started out um, look, following mice long-term to look for efficacy because methylmonic acidemia is a sear uh, metabolic disorder, which causes um, elevations in, in methylmonic acidemia. And the homozygous knockout mice are neonatal lethal, which required us to treat the mice um, just after birth with, with, at the time, what were considered high, high AV doses. Um, but currently, these, if you back calculate these doses to the weights of the pups, the dose is roughly around 1E14, which, which is, is clinically relevant. Um, we, we tested a number of promoters um, and, and serotypes, and, and even some, we even used some vectors that, that carried reporters um, to try and determine which, 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 which serotype, um, which promoters might be more efficacious in treating MMA. But what we saw as we followed these mice out um, long-term is we saw an, an increase in hepatocellular carcinoma in the mice. Um, we could only, because these mice are neonatal lethal, as in the case of, uh, of the SAN studies, we could only follow heterozygous mice out 
And, but we were also treating heterozygous mice because we weren't genotyping the mice at the time of the treatment. So we were treating both heterozygous um, mice and homozygous mice. Heterozygous mice, like the patients who have MMA, are carriers, but are, are, have a wild type phenotype. We observed a similar um, increase in hepatocellular carcinoma in, in mice that actually had methylmonic acidemia, and also in heterozygous mice that were treated with a GFP reporter. Um, um, interestingly, in, we were able to, to look at the, a dosing effect um, on, the, on the occurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma. And what we observed is, is as, the endose of, as the doses increased, the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma increased. Um, this is a, a study um, comparing the rate, the frequencies of hepatocellular carcinoma with different AAV serotypes and different promoters. Um, what we, we observed the highest rate of hepatocellular carcinoma in our AAV8 treated mice, either with a, a chicken beta actin, or sometimes it's called as a CGAG promoter and the TBG promoter. Interestingly, in the less um, liver tropic AVs, specifically AV2, and to some extent AV9, we observed less hepatocellular carcinoma. And I'd like to point out this group right here, which was treated with an AV8 with an HAT. Uh, it was a total of 10 mice, but we saw observed no hepatocellular carcinoma in those mice. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that um, later. So as discussed earlier, there's a lot of methods for detecting AAV integrations. And this is a, a, a somewhat older method where we use a ligation uh, mediated PCR using an ITR primer and a linker to detect integrations. Um, the, the shortcomings of this, of this type of approach is that unless an ITR is present, you will not detect the integration. And we only get short reads from, 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 these, um, from this type of uh, sequencing. So we can, only do, we can only map the AAV integrations, but we, we don't really get an idea of what the AAV integrations, the, the entire AAV integration looks like or what, what's inside the AAV integration. So we were able, to, um, we were able to, to pick up quite a few AAV integrations in both um, normal liver tissue or sorry, hepatocellular carcinoma and normal liver tissue. And what we found is only at the re and locus did we see an increase in AAV integrations in the hepatocellular carcinoma, but not in the liver. I think one of the, one of the interesting things about this is we're seeing, and, and this is not totally surprising, but we're seeing a high amount of integrations on albumin, which is a liver specific gene that's highly expressed. And also since we, this is alpha fetal protein, a gene which is expressed at high levels um, early in life and then and then turned out off. Um, Rhiannon is also suspected to be expressed at, at, at higher levels early in life and then uh, it decreases over time. So I think what what's striking but not totally surprising, given you know so, some of the some of the AV integration studies that, that have been done um, in the past, is that we have a, a lot of integrations in a specific gene that's expressed, it, it's, it's, to me, it's striking. I, I was surprised to see so many in this. And there's a number of genes um, that I'm not showing here that where, where we see no integration. So, so there is definitely a, a, a striking preference in, in our studies that, that's been reported before. And here's what, what we're showing here is that this, this, you get actually a fragment count from this tech uh, from this technique. Now, fragment count isn't the same, quite the same as a copy number, but it gives you an indication of how many times you're seeing the sequence. So when we do a cutoff of 100 fragments, um, Rian really um, surfaces as the culprit in these hepatocellular carcinomas. So, so next, what we did is we looked at um, RNA transcription in our cancers versus our wild type, and we saw upregulation of genes in the Rian locus on either side of the AV integrations. So, so, so the point of reference here is MIR341, here's MIR341, here's MIR370. Uh, and so these, so the AV integrations are here and on either side of the integration, you see um, pretty dramatic increases in some of these, in, in the expression of some of these genes. Um, similar to what uh, Sands 
um, you know, pretty much identical to what um, Mark Sands and his group had seen in his cancers. And we also see at these are these are looking at the copy number of the junctions. So we also so see see high um, junction copy numbers in our HCCs, and all, and we we couldn't even detect these junctions in normal liver tissues that were were in in the same mice. So going back to the um, the AV8 APOE HAT um, treated mice, we saw pretty much similar integration patterns to what we did in, with our other vectors um, outside of this this gene right here, and then. When we look at the fragment count, albumin comes up as a, up AFPs there again, um, and we do see integrations in the re and locus. But once again, to to remind you that that we didn't see any cancers in in these ten mice that we studied. So this suggests that the regulatory elements um, in these vectors strongly influence uh, cancer, and this is our hypothesis: is that the H hat just isn't isn't activating these. Art, um, genes um, nearby, the microRNAs and RTL1. So in conclusion, HCC seem uh, more common after AV treatment in neonatal mice, but this is not, um, it's not that it's never been observed in adult mice. AV insertional mutant adenosis is dose dependent. Um, the liver specific trophism of AVs could increase the risk of mutant adenosis by increasing the number of transduced cells and the total AAV integration. So that's pretty much, um, you know, if you, if you use a less tropic AAV, but a higher dose, um, you, could, you could have, you know, more integrations and potentially um, a, a higher chance of toxicity. But that's more of an observation than, than I can say that, that we really have strong data to support that, but it, it, it makes sense. Um, the AAV integrations display genetic preferences and appear to, to be influenced by tissue-specific gene expression. Um, the regulatory elements used in AAV vectors appear to influence toxicity. So now I'm gonna go show you some, some, some of our unpublished data where we went back and we tried to um, sequence some of these AAV integrations in the HCCs. And, and for one of these vectors, for the first vector we sequenced, we used um, 10X genomics, which I'm told this, this platform is no, no longer available. But the benefit of using this platform is you, you, you um, partition high molecular weight a, um, DNA, um, label it, and then fragment it so, so you can track back and make longer contigs of short reads. Um, and we could you know, potentially sequence all the way across the AV junction. And we were able to do that and we identified um, you know, the first AV integration we identified, we noticed that it had um, parts of the enhancer of the AV. So then we came up with a, a simpler strategy where we just PCR amplified out um, using primers an anchored in, in, the, uh, in the enhancer. And, and we used the genomic locations, which we identified from our earlier studies to put primers in the genome and then just try and sequence out two arms and, and, and align them. And that worked quite nicely for a number of of our of our vectors, so just to just to um, remind you of the vectors we started out at, in, with in, in these studies where, where we're looking at these mice. So one one mouse was treated with a TB, TBG um, vector that carried um, mut the mut cDNA, and the the most of the mice were um, were treated with an AV8, the CMV uh, chicken beta actin promoter. Intron and the MUT transgene. And these vectors were 3.9 and 4.6 KB. So, so that's the original size of the vectors. Uh, what we found uh, with these sequences, we were able to sequence uh, six AV integrations across both junctions. The size of these integrations were from 428 base pairs to 1,216 1, base pairs. Uh, we only detected small alterations in, in the mouse genome, the largest being a 17 base pair deletion. We were able to partially sequence five AV HCC integrations, which means we, we were only able to capture one, uh, one side of the junction. And we, we were able to sequence approximately 500 base pairs. Now what all these AV um, 
uh, sequences that we were, we were able to capture all contain were the CNV enhancer, this wild type AV enhancer, which was described by Ian, Ian, Ian Alexander's group. And what this is, is it's a, a carryover from the cloning of the original ITRs. Um, and it has some enhancer function. A truncated five prime ITR. So this is all continuous in the vector in, in every sequence that we were able to capture, which is 11. Um, and what was, what was striking is that we found no transgene cDNA sequence was detected in, in any of these AAV integrations. Um, so, so one important thing that I think I'd like to point out is while um, many of the integrations were found to be in MIR 341, which is a locus, a small locus is 96 base pairs, which is only found in, in mice and rodents, which in, in, in some ways gave some, some comfort in knowing that this locus that was seemed to be causing a problem, you know, was found only in, only in mice, and, uh, mice and rats. Um, we did find uh, two um, AV sequences that were entirely outside of MIR 341. So, so we found some, some, some unusual um, elements in some of these AAV integrations, and I'm, I'm gonna point those out now. And these are the unusual things that we found. So not, not, not things that we think are causative, but, but that's the conserved reason that we see in all of our AVs. And for this one, this is our one, um, one AV that was generated from, from the, the TBG uh, vector. Uh, the whole the whole insert is only 1,000 base pairs, where the original vector was um, 3.9 kb. In this, we we detect part of the the actual promoter in the sequence, which we we observed uh, promoter sequence in I think two other vectors, partial promoter sequence. Um, in this one, we also saw part of the three prime ITR and part of the poly A, which was an unusual finding, and we saw a number of truncated ITR fragments. And what some of the, we've seen this in a number of them where, where it's continuous with a five prime ITR fragment, but then there's this, um, another portion of an ITR that's, that seems to be homologous in some portions and then overlapping the other was where it doesn't completely align, suggesting that some kind of re recombination event between, either between ITRs or self ITR recombination event may be occurring in some of these integrations. This is a, a, another unusual AV insertion that, that we, we found. Um, that's the typical conserved region that we, we, we see is the CMV um, enhancer and the, the uh, five prime ITR truncated. What we found in here, and this was talked about earlier, is aberrant packaging. So, so what I'm showing here is the F1 ORI from the original um, AV packaging, um, which we were surprised to find considering we only um, fully sequence uh, six AV integrations. Um, and once again, we see a number of um, ITR fragments in this, in this particular integration. So I, I guess the question is, are, are, we, are, these, are these going in as truncated? Are these going in as some kind of full length or concatamer? And under selective pressure in the HCC um, being whittled down to the, uh, the CMV enhancer and the uh, five prime ITR. It's a question we don't know. Um, these, these cancers are from mice that were two years old. So, you know, there's the pen potential that a lot of uh, different recombinations and selections had gone on, but we just don't know because we, we, we have no idea what the original AV integration in these tumors look like. But it strongly suggests, I mean, it, it, it strongly suggests that the, the enhancers are the culprits in, in these HCCs in the mice. So this is just the, the mechanism um, that, that we believe uh, is, is, happen is occurring in these tumors. It, it's it's um, you know, upregulating, the, the enhancer is upregulating you know, genes on either side of the enhancer insertion and by definition, that, that's um, what, what enhancers would do. So in conclusion, uh, targeting the AV vector transgene to assess AV genotoxicity is not adequate. So 
you know, in a lot of these AV, uh, therapeutic AVs, your biggest target is your cDNA of interest, your, your gene of interest, your therapeutic transgene. But you know, targeting these in these HCCs wouldn't wouldn't have been successful because those sequences are are not present in the integrations. Um, there are there are non mir three four one AV integrations um, in the rean locus that can cause HCCs. The enhancer elements are always present in the AV HCCs uh, integrations and therefore are likely driving the upregulation and carcinogenesis we observe in the mice. And the AV toxicity, you know, it, the, our experiments seem to, to um, suggest that the AV toxicity could be uh, reduced by the inclusion of less um, potent enhancers and, and probably, you know, probably also by targeted integrations. Um, but that's just, um, you know, suggestive, it's, it's not concrete. So I'd like to thank, um, you know, all our collaborators at the um, NHGRI, the Burgess Lab, who helped us do a lot of the sequencing and, and bioinformatics. Um, more recently, we've been working with the um, uh, NIST, the sequencing core, cure, cure, core at the NHGRI. And it, it's, it's required a lot of work from our animal pathology and our, our mouse room to, to um, recover um, these sick mice um, and help us evaluate the uh, the, the pathology in these mice. Uh, thanks, and, and that's that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Randy. That was a great talk. Um, we are going to uh, again discuss these uh, issues after the next three talks, but right now we're going to take a fifteen-minute break, and we'll be back at uh, ten thirty-five or nine thirty-five central. Uh, so we'll, we'll see you back then.
Hello and uh, welcome back. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Denise Sabatino, an associate professor at CHOP, who's going to talk to us about some interesting observations from the canine uh, hemophilia model. Okay, thank you for uh, that introduction. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to present our work on a long-term follow-up study of hemophilia dogs that were treated with AV vectors delivering factor eight. And so um, just give me a moment here. So uh, I really, uh, before I begin, want to acknowledge that this has been a very collaborative effort. Um, this work was uh, begun and initiated by Hey Kazazian, and this has been a longstanding collaboration with Tim Nichols at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And Rick Bushman, my colleague at the University of Pennsylvania, performed the AV integration studies, which, um, which we will be discussing today. So I would like to begin by briefly introducing Hemophilia A and some of the clinical aspects of this study, because I think it really um, is important to consider as we um, then later dive into the AV integration um, studies that were performed in these dogs. So to remind everyone, Hemophilia A is an excellent bleeding disorder caused by deficiency in factor eight. And these uh, patients, have bleeding episodes in response to trauma or injury, but they also have frequent spontaneous bleeding episodes. And these occur mostly into the soft tissues, but also into the joints. And these joint bleeds really lead to the debilitating arthropathy uh, associated with this disease. Importantly, the factor eight activity correlates with the severity of the disease. And so patients that have uh, less than 1% factor eight activity have a severe form of the disease. And patients that have between five and 40% of normal levels have a mild form of the disease and might rarely bleed. And so even modest levels of the clotting factor can really uh, ameliorate some of the bleeding phenotype in, in these patients and similarly in the dogs. Um, as many of you know, AV-mediated AV gene therapy for hemophilia A is actively in clinical development. Um, with now um, at least eight uh, clinical studies ongoing. So preclinical studies in the hemophilia A dogs uh, at both the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill dog colony, as well as at the Queens University dog colony, which you will hear about um, from Dr. Lillycrap, have really supported the development of AV gene therapy for hemophilia A. These dogs have an inversion in intron 22 of the factor eight gene that is analogous to the most common mutation in humans. They have severe hemophilia, so have less than 1% canine factor eight activity. Um, and the bleeding phenotype mimics the human uh, phenotype. So this large animal model has really proved to be very valuable because it gives us opportunity to follow the hemostatic parameters in the dogs after AV gene therapy as well as monitor durability and safety for many, many years after vector administration. So we treated the hemophilia dogs with two different AV delivery approaches. The two chain delivery approach delivered the canine factor eight heavy chain in one AV vector and the canine factor eight light chain in a second AV vector. These were co-delivered and this really was uh, developed to overcome the challenges of developing the, delivering the large factor eight cDNA. The single chain delivery approach was then developed, which delivered a B domain deleted form of factor eight um, within a single AAV vector. Both of these approaches use liver specific promoter elements, the TBG promoter and the HAT promoter element. I wanna point out that the single chain construct used in this study was really a first generation construct and current constructs I uh, use more minimal promoter elements as well as codon optimized sequences and are closer to five KB um, in the current uh, clinical studies. The, a range of doses was tested in the dogs between one times 10 to the 13th and four times 10 to the 13th. And notably these are similar to doses that are currently uh, 
being used in clinical studies. So five dogs were treated with a two chain delivery approach uh, and four dogs are treated with the single chain delivery approach. The dogs sh shown in blue were treated with the higher vector dose and the dogs shown in green were delivered the lower vector dose. And so we saw dose dependent factor eight expression in these dogs for the, and we saw uh, no decline in factor eight expression for the duration of the study. And you can see that some of these dogs were followed for as long as 10 years after vector administration. So I think this really demonstrated the durability of expression after AV delivery of factor eight. Now, while seven of the dogs had very stable expression after AV delivery, two of the dogs had a gradual rise in factor eight expression that began about four years after vector administration. And those dogs are highlighted here in yellow. And so as part of this work, we were very interested to try to understand and investigate the potential mechanism for this rise in factor eight expression. I wanted to, to point out some of the similarities and differences between the two dogs that had this rise in factor eight expression. Um, these dogs were both treated with AV8 vectors. However, Linus received the two chain delivery and M50 was delivered the single chain uh, delivery, both, and these different approaches use different promoter elements, as I had mentioned. The vector doses were not identical, but they were both times 10 to the 13th. And Linus was four years of age when the vector was delivered, while M50 was about seven months old at the time of vector delivery. And throughout the study, there were no clinical concerns in either of these dogs. So we uh, monitored the liver function in these dogs um, throughout the study by following ALT levels AST levels, as well as alpha feed of protein levels. Um, there were some mild asymptomatic elevations in the liver enzymes, specifically the ALT, but these were not consistent with any specific liver pathology in the dogs. Alpha feed of protein can serve as a biomarker for HCC, and uh, we did not see any elevations in AFP during the study. And this is consistent with the absence of any clinical manifestations of HCC. So these dogs didn't have any evidence of malignancy. And at the time of necropsy, there was no, uh, no tumors were found or, or nodules of concern. So we also studied some additional biomarkers, uh, including von Willebrand factor levels, uh, fibrinogen levels, as well as um, clearance receptor levels to try to understand if there might be some, uh, this might explain this um, increase in factor eight expression. And none of these biomarkers was associated with this rise in factor eight expression in these two dogs. So based on these studies, we did not have an explanation for the rise in factor eight expression. And so while there was no evidence of malignancy in these dogs, we did, um, the increase in factor eight really prompted us to consider whether AV integration and potentially clonal expansion could be a potential mechanism for this um, observation. So at the time of necropsy, liver samples were collected from the dogs for DNA analysis. The vector copy number was performed, uh, analysis was performed by QPCR. And this really is an estimate of the total vector DNA copies that would represent both episomal and integrated forms. And then the AAV integration site analysis was performed by Rick Bushman's group uh, at Penn. This was performed by ligation mediated PCR, followed then by aluminous sequencing. And then the DNA sequence data was analyzed using a custom software pipeline that they had developed called AAVenger. So the uh, the integration site analysis uh, not only allowed us to identify integration sites, but it also allowed us to estimate clonal abundances. So the DNA samples were shared by sonication and then adapters were ligated on to the uh, DNA fragments. And then we utilized primers that resided within the ITR as well as in the adapter sequence to selectively amplify the genomic fragments. And then the, the sequencing was then performed. So when uh, we can count the number of unique genome breaks as illustrated here in the figure, and, and this can tell us uh, or provide an estimate of the clonal abundance uh, 
um, of each of these um, integration events. So in this example, you see five different genome breaks, and this uh, would allow us to infer that this was found in um, at least five cells. So the method I just described is illustrated here as strategy one. So this was our integration site analysis. But once we had the information from the integration site analysis, uh, we could use the sequencing data to, to design additional PCR-based strategies to really further characterize and validate the integration events. And so illustrated here in strategy two, we use the uh, genome information um, to design primers and then utilize primer sequences within the uh, transgene to try to uh, sequence and validate um, these integration events. And this third strategy uh, utilized primers designed in the genomic sequence flanking the integration event to try to give us some information about the structures of these integration events. So this table summarizes the DNA analysis. Um, for these dogs, we uh, analyzed between five and 29 liver samples for the vector copy number analysis. And shown here is the mean copy number per diploid genome. And this ranged between 0.01 and three vector copies per diploid genome. But generally the vector copy number was well below um, one per diploid genome. The one exception to this was the dog J60 that required a splenectomy at the time of vector administration. And so we hypothesized that uh, the liver was transduced at higher efficiency um, in this particular dog, and then this resulted in a higher copy number. So we selected six of the dogs for AV integration site analysis. We selected three liver samples per dog. Those three liver samples were selected based on a, a low mid-range and a high vector copy number for that specific dog. And the integration site analysis revealed um, over 1,700 integration events in these liver samples. I should point out that um, we used control dogs that were untreated hemophilia A dogs also for this analysis. And so if you um, look at the panel on the right, you can see that there was a significant, cor significant correlation between the vector copy number and the number of integration events that we detected in the dogs. So through the analysis, we um, analyzed the distribution of the integration events throughout the canine genome. And shown here are each tick mark represents a different integration event and each color represents integration events from a different dog. And so you can see that the integration events were distributed throughout the canine genome. We also found that integration events were favored in transcription units. So the gray bars here represent 1 million random simulations, which were compared then to the experimental integration sites that we found in the dog. So the observed frequency in the dogs is shown here by the blue arrow. So you can see it was favored in transcription units. And, it, and the heat map shows that integration sites were also found uh, more prominently in genomic features associated with active transcription, such as CPG islands, as well as GC rich regions. So, so we also looked at the distribution uh, within of the integration events within these transcription units, there were also cancer associated genes. So catalogs of cancer associated genes in humans were annotated onto the canine genome for this analysis. And there was a modest enrichment of integration events that was associated uh, in genes associated with growth control and cancer. So as I mentioned earlier, the way that we perform these studies allowed us to uh, quantify the, um, the abundance of the cell clones, as well as the specific sites of integration. And so in this analysis, we did identify um, some clonal populations. So of the 1700 unique integration events we found, we found a handful that is 54 abundant clonal populations. And so these are defined as integration events that are in exactly the same uh, integration position and were identified in more uh, in at least five cells. And so shown here on this figure are the, the top 15 
um, clones for each of these dogs. Each color represents a different gene. Each bar represents a different expanded clone. And you can um, see that some of these, uh, or I wanna point out this about half of these clone expansions were found in genes that have been known to be associated um, with cell growth and cancer. Five of the genes that were found in these clonals, where clonal expansions were found, were found in multiple dogs. And these are highlighted here by the red stars. All of these, these genes have been associated with transformation in humans, all five of these genes. Um, and so uh, I wanna point out that two of the clonal expansions were uh, found to have a clonal abundance greater than 100 um, cells. And this is a DLU2 expansion that was found in Linus and PEBP4 in J60. DLU2 has been associated um, with leukemia and has also been found to play a role in HCC and PEBP4 has been associated with multiple cancer cell types. So overall, these findings really supported the idea that um, the integration within these specific genes uh, may have been the mechanism responsible for their outgrowth, um, uh, the outgrowth of the cells. So, so we also did some analysis to understand if there was any clustering of the integration sites in the canine genome. And this was performed by um, model independent scan statistics. And five clusters were identified. Three of these are illustrated here in EGR2, CCND1, and EGR3. And um, this really, I, I should point out that these three genes um, have all been found to um, be play a role in um, transformation uh, in humans. And they also um, were also found in the, to be in expanded clones um, that we identified. And so this really provides additional evidence that the integration events within these specific genes uh, may have been somehow associated with uh, proliferation or at least cell persistence in, in these cases. Um, so we also attempted to characterize some of the structures of the integrated vectors. And as pointed out by Randy Chandler, this is a very challenging task. Um, but illustrated here are the full length vectors um, in the upper right portion of the slide. And then the integrated vector fragments are shown um, at the bottom of the slide. We did identify one full length coding sequence of a vector that, that had an intact heavy chain coding sequence. It did have an intact promoter element, but all of the others that we characterized uh, were very rearranged or truncated, which was also um, described um, in Brandy's findings. So um, while we did not identify a specific uh, integration event that could explain the rise in factor eight expression um, in these dogs, I think that the, the, the findings do support that the, a candidate explanation for the increase in factor eight expression could be clonal expansion of cells harboring integrated vectors in portions of the liver that we did not analyze in these studies. We also identified rearrangements of the AV vector. So about 80% of the integration sites seem to show apparent integration of the AV into the factor eight itself. And so that is into the um, factor eight cDNA. And so how do we know this is not in the genomic factor eight sequence? Well, highlighted in this figure, you can see each dot represents an integration event. And, and these integration events were those mapped to the AV vector itself. This illustrates the single chain AV vector. Shown here are seven exons within the factor eight cDNA. And we did not find any integration events in, in introns. And interestingly shown here is the B domain uh, encoding region in exon 14, which is not included in the B domain deleted uh, AV vector sequence. And we found no integration events within the B domain. And we also found that the sequence reads uh, read across exon-exon boundaries. So there was certainly evidence of extensive vector rearrangement. And from this analysis, we can't tell if these are integrated or episomal forms. And it's not clear if these rearrangements occurred during vector production and or 
after transduction of the target cells, but certainly Phil Tai and others are now um, providing data that really shows that at least some of, there are some rearrangements um, within the AV vectors prior to delivery. So in summary, uh, these uh, dogs were followed up to 10 years and demonstrated stable and sustained expression of factor eight. Two of these dogs uh, had a gradual rise in factor eight activity. And we believe these studies support at least a hypothesis that this observation may be due to clonal expansion of cells with integrated vectors. And while there was no evidence of malignancy in these dogs, um, uh, the AAV integration uh, and clonal expansion were certainly observed. And uh, the durability of factor eight expression uh, was observed without any liver toxicity or clinical concerns. And in conclusion, uh, we observed that these AV integration events are very complex and frequently re rearranged and or deleted. Um, we don't know the contribution of AAV integration events to long-term factor eight expression in these dogs. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that a lower AV vector dose may reduce the potential of frequency of AV integration. And the studies certainly highlight the importance of following subjects in the AV clinical studies um, more long-term. So with that, I want to acknowledge the many contributors to this work, in particular, Yang Nguyen from my laboratory, who is the lead scientist on this work, and Rick Bushman and his group, especially John Everett, who is the bioinformatician who did all of the AV integration analysis for this study. So I thank you for your attention. And with that, I will end. Thank you, Denise. Uh, we're right on time. So we'll go right into uh, David Lillicrap's uh, talk from uh, Queen's University. And he'll uh, continue to the discussion in uh, canine uh, uh, findings. So Doug, thank you very much indeed. So I'd like to thank uh, Doug and Kevin and uh, ASGCT for uh, inviting me to give this presentation today to you. Um, this presentation is about studies that we've carried out in collaboration with Sylvia Fong at uh, Biomarin and the group at GeneWork uh, with Irene uh, Gilferina and Matteo Franco. Um, you'll see in this presentation that there are some features that I'm going to describe which are very similar to what you've just heard from Denise, but also some things which uh, are a little different. So let's start here. Um, so you've already heard a, a significant amount about hemophilia and um, the dog model we have at Queens has now been here for about uh, four decades. It has a similar genotype to human uh, factor eight deficiency. This in, intron 22 inversion mutation has a similar clinical phenotype with spontaneous bleeding. Uh, we treat these with recombinant uh, canine factor eight infusions. Uh, and the colony at Queens um, has about a 25% incidence of antibody formation to the infused factor eight. And the study you're gonna hear about um, today uh, involves long-term follow-up for more than 10 years uh, with following AAV delivery. So of course, um, this study is about the long-term persistence of the form of uh, AAV vectors uh, either being uh, non-integrated or integrated into the host genome. Um, so this slide illustrates um, the material that was delivered to these dogs. So at the top of the slide, you see the uh, transgene construct with the ITRs. Uh, the expression of factor eight is with a, um, a, a modified transthyridin uh, promoter. There's a synthetic uh, five prime intron uh, the transgene delivered is a canine B domain deleted factor eight cDNA sequence, uh, which is non codon optimized. And then at the bottom of the slide, you see this table here. So uh, there were eight animals that were treated. Uh, in two of the animals, uh, ANG and uh, OMOR, um, the treatment um, resulted in factor eight levels below 1%. In the other six individuals, the other six dogs, uh, there was productive expression of factor eight. And you can see that, that um, four of the animals were treated with AAV2 vectors, three of them with AAV6 and one with AAV8. Uh, 
The vector doses range from 60 12 vector genomes per kilo up to 2.7 uh, E13. So again, these vector doses, as Denise um, highlighted in her presentation, are similar to what's being used in clinical studies. Uh, the dogs were treated between um, six and seven, 15 months of age when they were infused with a portal vein infusion of the vectors, and they were followed up between um, eight and 12 years. Uh, so out to 12 years after AV delivery. Um, here's the factor eight expression profiles. Um, what you're looking at here is factor eight activity measured by a so-called chromogenic assay. Um, you can see that in the red and green lines here, these are the two dogs that really showed uh, minimal if any expression of factor eight. The other six dogs um, express levels between two and 8% with a chromogenic assay. Uh, the other way of measuring factor eight is with a so-called one stage assay, which gives you values about 1.6 fold higher than this. So between about 10 and 12% levels. And essentially these dogs out to beyond uh, 10 years, you see going up to 12 years here, um, had minimal bleeding following their AV vector delivery. So uh, this level of factor eight is enough to uh, mitigate spontaneous bleeding. So, First of all, regional differences in DNA and mRNA expression. So at the time these dogs were euthanized, we took multiple samples from the livers of these animals and then carried out um, AAV DNA analysis and mRNA analysis. And you see, um, let's deal first of all with the DNA analysis. Uh, these are vector uh, genomes uh, per diploid genome. Uh, and you can see that in many instances, the, th those levels are below one. Um, in, in occasional samples, they're above one. And you also see that, that between the different animals, so first of all, here's a, a negative control, a hemophilia A dog that was not treated. Um, here are the two dogs that did not um, show expression of factor eight. And then the other six animals in some individuals um, there's relatively homogeneous um, DNA um, evidence of the vector, but in some other animals like uh, JUN, you can see that there's very significant variability in the different samples that were tested. And in VEC, these three um, DNA analyses were on a single biopsy, but different parts of that biopsy where you can see significant variability. This obviously has significance about how we would um, collect liver biopsy samples and in interpreting those liver biopsy samples. I won't say much about the mRNA expression, except to say that in the dogs that did not express, you can see the mRNA levels were pretty much undetectable, but otherwise the level of heterogeneity here uh, mirrors that pretty much with what you see with the DNA sampling. <clears throat> So we then, um, in collaboration with the group at uh, GeneWork, um, analyzed with next generation sequencing, um, vector persistence as episomes or integrated copies. Um, we used two orthogonal uh, sequencing methodologies, uh, LAM PCR, which I'm not gonna show you today, and then this target enriched sequencing methodology. Uh, suffice it to say that the results that we obtained were actually pretty similar with both LAM PCR and with uh, target enrichment sequencing. Uh, so this methodology involves um, genomic DNA um, uh, isolation, mechanical shearing, adapter ligation, uh, then hybridization uh, with different baits, uh, magnetic capture, and eventually uh, Illumina MySeq sequencing and uh, bioinformatic analysis. And as I say, this was all carried out by um, Irene Gil Farina and Matteo Franco at GeneWork. Um, so you can see in this tabular form here that each of the dogs um, had two liver biopsy samples that were analyzed and the blue bars, which represent the, 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 the frequency of integrants um, this is the where we're seeing vector vector reads, and assuming that those 
predominantly represent um, episomal concatomeric reads. And the orange bars, which are um, in the significant minority, represent uh, vector um, host genome reads. And thus the assumption here is that these are integrated reads. Of course, some of these vector vector reads could also represent um, catamers which are um, integrated into the host genome. And maybe we'll get into that uh, later in the round table discussion. So um, integration occurs mainly in non-coding regions of the genome. So what I've just shown you is that 90, 95% of the material um, is uh, episomal, uh, but the integrated copies um, shown here. Uh, so if we look at the table, first of all, here again are the eight animals, um, the two that did not express factor eight, where the integrated um, sequences per cell numbers are shown in this um, right-hand column. And then in the other six animals that express factor eight um, for the duration of the study, you see the integrated sequences per cell range from about one in a thousand to one in 10,000 cells have integration um, copies of the vector. And then in the table on the right-hand side, um, you see that the vast majority of those integrations occur either in downstream sequences in blue and in green uh, in upstream sequences. So about 95% of the integrated uh, sites are um, not within genes, but in intergenic regions. And about 5% of the integrated sites shown in the orange bars here are within genes. Not surprising, uh, given the amount obviously of uh, intergenic sequence in the canine genome as with the human uh, genome. So where do those integrated um, events occur? Well, that's shown here on this chromosomal distribution of the 39 um, canine chromosomes. And what I'm now gonna focus on in the next two or three slides are these areas. So you can see in this color coding here, um, as we go from uh, green to uh, yellow, orange, and red, you see increased numbers of integrations. And there are three regions on chromosome uh, 14, 28, and on the X chromosome where there are large numbers of integrated copies. And that's illustrated here in the frequent integration seen on chromosomes 14, 18, and the X. So, and you see that in each of these instances, these represent uh, chromosomal regions of about 10 megabases. So that maybe we should keep in mind. They're, they span about 10 megabases of chromosomal regions where there are multiple uh, integrations up to over 600. Now the common events um, are shown here. So here are the rank order of the 10 commonest events. Here are the number of integration uh, events. So going to 15 to um, over 700. The majority of integration events, as you will already seen, are single or very small uh, numbers of events. But these events occurred many times. Uh, they occurred over uh, regions um, shown here of multiple kilobases. Um, and they occurred in genes like KCNIP2, which is a potassium channel, CLIK2, which is a chloride channel, ABCB1 is P glycoprotein, and here's the factor VIII gene, uh, and various other genes, including uh, what we believe may be annotated uh, microRNA sequences. Um, you also see that albumin was, was targeted within the gene, both within introns and exons. Uh, and in contrast to what you just heard from Denise, we, we think we saw integrations within the uh, chromosomal locus, factor eight, both within exon sequences and within the introns. Um, so when we looked at to see whether those um, events uh, regulated gene expression, so most of those events in KCNIP2, and I'll show you the other sites here as well, uh, click to uh, P glycoprotein and albumin, we then 
sought with a DDPCR to see whether that altered expression of those genes. So here you see KCNIP2, here's CLIK2, uh, ABCB1 and albumin. And we compared the transcript levels with uh, beta-2 microglobulin. And we didn't really see any evidence of an upregulation of KCNIP2. Um, here are, by the way, um, hemophilia A controls a normal dog and um, non uh, transfected or untransduced control. Um, we also didn't see any uh, change in the regulation of uh, click to expression um, in any of these animals, uh, nor with uh, P glycoprotein, although there's a, a bit of a, a reduction in a couple of the dogs. Uh, we did see increases in albumin transcript normalized to beta 2 uh, uh, microglobulin. Um, not surprisingly, given that albumin is so highly expressed within uh, uh, hepatocytes. So th these results uh, indicated to us that, that uh, integration um, close to these three genes uh, did not influence the um, expression of those adjacent loci. Now, lastly, we also looked at um, liftover of the top 10 genes that had integrations um, to see whether there was any evidence of cancer gene uh, involvement. And so here are the different dogs um, and different um, samples from some of those dogs, which showed that on um, investigation of CANFAM3, the dog genome sequences, um, some of those dog genes um, contained integrations in significant numbers um, in some potential oncogenic sequences, most notably MET. And when those were lifted over to uh, build 38 of the human genome sequence, uh, you can see that they also lifted over to um, sequences which were identical in some instances to the dog genome, uh, particularly to the MET locus, um, and were um, some distance away from the MET gene itself. So there was some potential um, of those integration uh, events uh, dysregulating expression of uh, MET. And that's addressed on this slide here, uh, where again we uh, performed uh, DDPCR of the MET transcript and normalized it to uh, beta, microglob beta 2 microglobulin expression in the animals that um, had successful um, expression of factor VIII. Uh, the two that had no expression to two uh, hemophilia A dog controls and then to a normal dog. And you can see that looking at multiple samples here, uh, there was no clear dysregulation of MET expression uh, despite the, these integration events uh, occurring close to the uh, MET gene. So um, lastly, post-mortem uh, liver appearances in the haemophilia A dog, so we carried up both gross and uh, histopathological um, examination of these animals on multiple examples. Um, we saw, um, and this examination was carried out by three blinded uh, pathologists who are used to looking at uh, dog um, liver samples, no evidence of adenoma or cas carcinoma, no significant parenchymal inflammation, uh, no evidence of hepatitis or fibrosis, no cirrhosis in these samples. There was, however, macroscopic multifocal parenchymal nodularity. Uh, so this nodular hyperplasia, which was seen in six animals, is a recognized age-related change in dogs. And we also saw uh, this pathology of uh, vacuolar hepatopathy uh, in eight of the dogs, which can occur with adrenal hyperplasia and corticosteroids, which actually were used in some of these dogs and also with chronic illness. And here's examples of nodular hyperplasia. So here's um, the edges of that uh, hyperplastic uh, region. You can see the nodules here within uh, one of the animals showing evidence of the nodular hyperplastic change. Within those regions, there was a mildly thickened liver cell plates as illustrated here. And then here's evidence of the vacuolar hepatopathy uh, showing um, cell uh, cytoplasmic clearing very clearly here, 
which can be related to chronic illness in these dogs or the use of steroids. So in summary, um, I've shown you evidence of regional differences in AAV uh, DNA and mRNA expression, which may be important in terms of liver biopsy uh, sampling. Non-integrated episomal forms are predominant um, after a decade following vector administration. Uh, the integration uh, occurs with this sort of frequency in all animals with some common non-random sites of integration. Uh, the integration sites were predominantly in intergenic regions, and we've shown some evidence that they don't appear to dysregulate ad adjacent genes. And there was no evidence of liver adenoma or carcinoma shown on post-mortem examination. So I'm finishing now with acknowledgements. The postdoctoral fellow in our group, Paul Batty, who led this study shown here. Um, uh, Amy Mo was a, a research assistant in our group. Laurie Harpel and a a a Abby Pender, shown on this slide here, uh, were the people involved at Queens. Uh, we also had pathological help and uh, interventional radiology help from these two individuals. Um, I've highlighted the fact that Sylvia Fong's group in Biomarin were a critical and productive um, collaborator, and then the group at GeneWork, Irene Gilfarina and Matteo Franco. And so with that, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, David. That's an amazing amount of information about these animals. Um, we're going to go on from here uh, to hear from Irene Gilfarina uh, from GeneWorks about potential uh, in vitro model systems that might shed light on AV integration and how it affects uh, gene expression. So, uh, hello, uh, good morning. So thank you very much for the invitation uh, to talk in this panel. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk about in vitro model systems for AV integration. So one sec. So uh, basically this is an introductory slide which aims at reflecting uh, why addressing integration and uh, um, yeah, what was uh, sort of the trigger from the clinical perspective. So in this uh, figure that it's from a nice review from Professor Bushman from last year. So it basically shows how uh, in this case, lentiviral retroviral vectors were found to um, have a functional consequence and lead to uh, oncogenesis. So uh, basically these three mechanisms of uh, insertion, uh, insertional activation or uh, truncation did a bit reflect uh, what happened in the different uh, uh, clinical trials and severe adverse events observed. So that some of them uh, led to or not to clonal dominance. And um, um, some of the events were accompanied by the development or, uh, of um, cancer. So uh, on the right side, uh, this represents the um, different uh, mouse, so uh, in vivo and in vitro models that aimed at a sort of reflecting or um, predicting the uh, gene toxic potential of the different vectors. So the, the first ones, they represent models that had been used for uh, gamma retroviral or lentiviral vectors. So one of, of the uh, most used ones uh, were the transplantation, so either a serial or not of mouse, uh, of human cells into mice that allowed to identify the uh, clonal expansions. Also uh, for the uh, retroviral field, uh, mouse models uh, were used either using uh, models prone to tumor development or um, also the fetal model. And uh, some uh, here are just some of the in vitro assays. So David Mansaka from uh, the group of Professor Sambach, uh, who uh, really are uh, trying to 
uh, predict what's uh, uh, toxic or genotoxic uh, vector, and then also some uh, models in the cell lines. So in the last points, I try to reflect some of the uh, in vivo models used uh, for AAV vectors, and where, let's say, uh, most of the evidence is for either uh, genotoxic or non-genotoxic effects have been collected. So um, most of these uh, evidences for genotoxicity, uh, it's worthy to consider that they have been retrieved in models. So either upon neonatal administration or some others which were mouse models of human disease or um, also some other studies were directly targeting uh, the Ryan locus. So basically, it is uh, putting together and in the context of also a uh, lot of other studies conducted in adult uh, animals or um, let's say uh, wild mice uh, that did not show for any evidence of um, um, oncogenic events sort of bring us to the current situation in which it's not so clear what's the clinical relevance of all these findings. And this, uh, so maybe also worthy to mention the studies in large animals. So we just heard uh, about the findings in two do different dog studies, long term. And uh, there were also additional data sets published in NHP or even uh, larger studies like follow ups of seven years in the GAT model. So that um, also are providing evidences uh, for clonal expansion, but where also no oncogenesis has been observed. So aside uh, from the different models, something too that I would like to highlight is that although in many cases, many, many of these models, they tend out to be um, sort of uh, oversensitive or a drive to um, conclusions that they were not so relevant in the clinical setting, they all, sort of allowed to identify some of the risk factors for insertion and mutagenesis, and they also led to the development of a safer gene therapy vectors. So this piece of slides basically aims at reflecting a bit all the challenges that uh, an in vitro model uh, assessing uh, the, poten the genotoxic potential of AAV vectors would uh, face. And I think the more or less sort of also reflects all the, um, um, let's say, features and the processes that have been discovered about, uh, about AAV integration over the years. And so I uh, would just uh, like to fastly go through them and provide some points for discussion uh, later. So one of the main points that we see is that most of AAV gene therapies, and we are not talking about maybe, um, so where we are using uh, AAV just an homology template, but um, many of these therapies, they are aimed at uh, treating inherited diseases. So this means that these drug products, they uh, are targeting post-mitotic tissues. And uh, what the key features of AAV, so this predominant episomal persistence, uh, also um, uh, brings the point that what we are worrying about is about the long-term effects. So we are talking about the vector that will be injected and we aim it to produce a lifelong expression. So this is, I think, uh, really complex to capture in an in vitro system. Because, uh, so on the one hand, many of the models that we already know and have been characterized about uh, for insertion and mutagenesis, they are based on uh, using dividing cells. So when you uh, have, for example, an hepatocyte or human hepatocytes that you have them in vitro and you plan to um, infect them and uh, sort of evaluate any kind of over time uh, effect then uh, it for sure um, gets complicated because they are not divided. And then another point that was raised with the talk uh, from Professor K is that uh, so it looks like integration occurs at the very beginning. 
And that's interesting because uh, when looking at the sequencing data, even some of the doc studies shown here, that after so, um, um, so many years, if the integration occurred at the very beginning, the vectors that once is uh, integrated after, I don't know, seven, eight, 10 years, they are highly rearranged. So this uh, would indicate that having a model that it's able to show how these genomes are changing over time uh, would also provide uh, safety, but also efficacy information. So another critical point for in vitro uh, models would be uh, to be able to fairly reflect what happens in vivo. And this means transaction efficiencies and integration frequencies. So basically, uh, so it's known that many AV serotypes show the limit transduction in vivo. And it's also not clear that integration frequencies in vivo and in vitro are exactly uh, the same. So given the fact that increased integration frequencies uh, uh, might come with increased uh, risk for insertional uh, mutagenesis, then um, one would aim at uh, estimating as close as possible. So aside from this, the last four features sort of uh, recapitulate many things that have been observed for AAV. So in the in vivo models, we learned that there might be some species specific effects. Somehow it looks like mouse models uh, are a bit more sensitive for insertional mutagenesis or at least in the uh, neonatal step uh, stage. It also looks like uh, development stage matters, probably related to the fact that uh, there are uh, genes actively transcribed, which are, let's say, a bit more risky that are not um, active at later stages. And all this uh, means that one would need a model which is able to provide a bit of flexibility in terms of which cells you can use. So uh, the usage of human cells would be, of course, an advantage, but also the investigation of different differentiation stages might be uh, informative, also for the later treatment, either at the pediatric or adult populations. And then just as the last point, and this what everyone would like to have from a model, is that, okay, aside from being able to reflect the individual features, that it allows for standardization and it has a proper control. And this is something uh, probably challenging the AAV fields because in the end, all vectors are different forms from the other. So you have the IDRs, which are usually the common regions by expression cassettes are different, serotypes are different, production systems are different. So there are some studies showing that vectors produced in the, for example, baculovirus or the 290 uh, three cells uh, may have different deficiencies. So um, yeah, in the end, say yeah, we would require a really flexible, but um, at the same time, uh, sort of uh, being able to standardize model. So with this, I would like to, oh, I'm sorry, because, okay. With this, I would like to um, sort of provide a, a short overview on a model that where we had the chance to uh, collaborate. And uh, this model has uh, been basically uh, conceptualized by Professor Themis at the Brunel University. And basically it's a human in vitro say that aims at evaluating the genotoxicity of the gene therapy vectors. So one of the main points of this model is that it captures an initial step that uh, considers the DNA uh, damage um, ability of the target cells. So the potential of this is that you would be able to evaluate your patient, specific patient cells for their capacity to repair the DNA. And here, basically, what you see, it's, it consists on counting. So it's performed by immunocytochemistry, and it counts the spots uh, of DNA damage repair. If you can see here, they evaluated different cell, uh, cells from different patients. And what's divergent here is a cell line that it's deficient for repair ability. So the idea of including this essay was providing a sort of go, no go uh, decision uh, on a patient 
basis. So it was it's oriented to a, a personalized uh, approach. So in the second stage, uh, the model uh, MSATs sort of uh, providing uh, an idea of the genotoxic potential for the specific vectors. So one of the uh, strengths of this model is that it has two uh, components. The first one is a cellular component. So the model was designed in such a way that says, so, uh, so we were infected at an, at an IPSC stage, but these IPSCs were also reprogrammed into HLCs. So for these hepatocyte-like cells, they are grown in, C in 3D cultures. And each of these is for the young, like 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 cells. And the idea was to infect the cells at both the stages. So one could capture the uh, vector effect at uh, both differentiation st stages. In addition to this, it has, so once the cells get infected, it has a molecular component. And this molecular component in the end aims at uh, reflecting how the vector persists in the cells, but also how the vector affects to the cells. So it, it uh, looks at integration sites, integration profiles in terms of are we disrupting uh, oncogenes, uh, are the specific genomic regions cluster, but also uh, provides a functional readout. So what is, are these integration sites really having an effect on the cellular gene expression. And then uh, the model also looks at epigenetic changes. So um, the initial tests for the model were uh, performed using two different lentiviral vectors, one with a full IDR and the other one with a thin configuration, and two different AAB vectors with a weak and a strong promoter. So basically cells were infected at the IPSC and HLC stage, and um, the uh, different analyses were performed. So the uh, model has been designed for lentiviral vectors, but uh, here we'll fastly show you some of the preliminary data on the EAV. So uh, basically this recapitulates the integration sites. And as you uh, can see, uh, see here, so there are observed increased levels of integration for IPSC when compared to HLCs. So um, uh, the development states does look uh, like having an effect. And for sure, when comparing lentiviral and AAV vectors, the level of integrations are uh, much lower. So when uh, having a look, so there is a second component, which is a, a called clonal tracking. So this is currently only evaluated for lentiviral vectors because they are the infections at the, uh, three and 30 days so the comparison of the data sets could be performed. And this basically consists on looking at the sequence counts and how this the fold increase looks like over time. So in this case, it focuses on the oncogenes because what one is, uh, let's say, interested in looking at is that, OK, do I see um, an uh, expansion of integration sites on uh, specific oncogenes? And um, yeah, basically, uh, these are the data ready for the lentiviral vectors and analysis for AAV are going. So the uh, second, uh, the third and fourth components were gene expression. And uh, so this was basically mainly analyzed by RNA-seq. So we look at the global gene expression. And as you see, as you can see here, so red, this is the AAV with the strong promoter. And it induced, so this is the number of differentially uh, expressed genes, which means they can be up or down regulated. But uh, so from the AAV data set, you see that the strong promoters have a, a significant effect on the global gene expression of the cell. So these are uh, some uh, genes that were found to be up regulated for some of the clones generated for the lentiviral vectors. And these were quantified by quantitative PCR uh, by the group of uh, from Weiser. So the uh, second uh, readout from the gene expression uh, side was the analysis of fusion transcripts. So the presence uh, of uh, here, what we saw is that for the EAV vectors, so aside from the uh, known uh, 
uh, lentiviral generation of uh, fusion transcripts. We also observed a similar phenomenon for the AAB vectors, so we could identify fusion transcripts. And um, interestingly, they were higher for the strong promoter uh, when infecting HLCs. In addition to this, and this is something uh, probably particularly interesting, is that uh, we also had a look at the methylation. And if we look at the methylation of the cellular genome and not of the genes. So in here, what we see is the number of differentially methylated regions, so hyper or hypermethylated. But what you can see here is that the infection with the AV vectors also is able to induce the uh, changes into the um, methylation of the cell. So basically, uh, this inject docs, um, it's a model that uh, could also fit to AAB vectors. So it uh, contemplates different uh, dimensions of uh, what we have learned from the insertional mutagenesis and oncogenic events. And uh, it also provides uh, a robust platform for testing that uh, would be also suitable for AAB vectors. And uh, just to end up, it's just uh, so the factors that uh, might be interesting to can be considered for uh, in vitro assays. And um, I would like to finish by thanking um, uh, Dr. Themis and all his team from Brunel University and Destapec, as well as all the people involved in the immune immunogen challenge. Um, that uh, what was the purpose of the model that I presented. Thank you so much. Thank you, Irina. Um, we're uh, now open to questions and uh, we're, we'll start the uh, panel discussion. And uh, I'll just start with uh, one of our, uh, our prepared questions, which is uh, what, What's the latest thinking on whether findings from mice are translating to larger animals or, or humans? Uh, and, and this is open for anybody to uh, weigh in. Well, well, Doug, you know, one thing I'll say is um, when the Ryan Locus data came out from, um, from Mark Sands and David Russell, and then by uh, Venditti and Randy Chandler, there was a lot of discussion about this locus in humans. I mean, there is a syntenic region, but there were a number of editorials written that the microhomology regions and the mirror 341, uh, there, there were differences in human and people thought that that would make it less likely that that region would be targeted, but I'm not sure I totally agree with that. Um, but, but I do think it's interesting the fact that that locus is on early. So if we talk about really young individuals versus older, whether or not there's going to be a difference in, in the frequency at which you get integration because the chromatin uh, may change as the locus is turned, uh, turned off. So I, I think that's an important question and whether or not you know, I, I think there are a number of similarities between the mouse and the human and uh, that I think could be an important model. Would you say that a, a mouse is a, in some ways a more sensitive uh, readout uh, for one thing, because when we dose a mouse, uh, you're getting a whole lot more genomes per cell in the liver than with any of our larger animals or, or humans, as far as we can tell. Yeah, well, I think that's a really important question. And some of the, the questions that came up in the chat during the talks were the dose response and the integration rates. And I don't think, or I'm not aware of, others can chime in, of good studies where they did careful dose responses and actually looked at dose response in terms of uh, the rate of uh, the frequency of integrations. So... Um, I, I agree with this uh, comment uh, on, on the MRI or doses. So if anything, I think uh, uh, Marcus' uh, uh, new paper, new data may be informative in the, uh, in the humanized mouse liver. Uh, there you can play around about doses. It's very hard to do in human. Thank you. Yeah. 
I, I wanted to say we, we I'll present when I give my talk, we have some data I, on this. I, I think that mouse hepatocytes are vastly more sensitive to oncogenesis than, than human hepatocytes. Um, and one of the reasons I think, uh, molecular reasons is that human HCC, and it would be really useful, I think, for this group to have an HCC expert um, as part uh, of, of the discussions and the white paper in the end. But um, human HCC requires activation of telomerase uh, or early, as, a, as an early step in oncogenesis, well-established. And mice don't need that. Um, the, the, the mice have such long telomeres that you can get an HCC without telomerase activation. So I, I, I think that in my mind, there's no question that uh, rodents provide a maximal uh, estimate uh, and, and, and almost certainly reflect uh, an overestimation of the actual risk to, to larger animals. Um, but, um, you know, I. That's my opinion on that. And then, into the, may I may I um, uh, add a comment on on this uh, topic? Absolutely. Yes. So, so I would like to mediate a little bit between you know the mouse model, you know, and the the the, the human hepatocytes, or anyway, so human as models and and pure mouse models. It is absolutely true that the mouse models are, are, are unvaluable, you know, uh, in this case, especially for AAB, the dose, you know, response can be very important, which is a little bit different instead with, uh, with other vectors, such as, for example, lentiviral vectors. Uh, but there is, there is another aspect, however, that using uh, humanized models, it can tell you specific culprits that you cannot really find in, uh, in mice, okay? So, in my experience, our experience in the lentiviral field or retroviral field also is that when we use mice, or at least how I use mice, is that uh, we compare vector A, vector B, the vector C, and so on. And so you can graduate, you know, the, the dose and the, the different the type of vectors that the genotoxicity of each of one, uh, each vector, right? And so this doesn't mean that the genes that you're going to find alterated in the mouse. Are going to be always, you know, found also in the human. So many of the genes that you find in the humans are going to be not, not present in the mice and so on. And so, so I think both models are very important and uh, and they, they require, uh, I think, important attention. Well, I think that that leads us right into the next question. In fact, is how translatable are the integration analysis in the uh, preclinical models uh, to what's going to happen? Uh, in humans in terms of vector uh, chromosomal interactions? Well, at the molecular level, I think uh, mice will respond exactly what happened in the humans, right? So you're gonna have a vector that activates genes. This can be oncogenes in mice, but they can or maybe not in humans and vice versa, okay? But still, you know, the mouse has a strong value to tell you vector A, vector vector B, or, or you know, the problem is, for example, if you have different diseases, then using a wild type mouse model, you know, is okay. So should you use the uh, disease model in mice? And this is very difficult to do. And so in general, I, I see the mouse more to compare vector designs rather than the gene therapy per se. Although it's important to do it anyway. Uh, instead for the human, it will be important to find specific culprits, right? So you wanna see, for example, MECOM, which is a gene that you don't find in mice and is activated in human, uh, specifically for myeloid uh, uh, dysplasia syndrome, right? There's a specific culprit. So if you see targeted MECOM and you see an expansion of a cell that has a harbor expansion, uh, harbor integration near MECOM, well, you're very worried about that. Instead, for example, maybe other genes, uh, I mean, they cannot tell you that much, but you know, you are less worried. So, so it is important to know also the culprits that are specific for humans because they're biomarkers of insertion mutagenesis. Yeah, I, I think that the fact is that if you look in mouse and human cells or in, in vivo or whatever, the types of complex integrations and deletions and things like that appear to be relatively similar. But I think comparing the loci uh, 
that are, are more commonly hit is, is an important study. And I don't know, maybe Marcus has some of that in his, in his new study, um, but at least they, they have the integration in the, in the humanized liver and they can compare that to what's been described in the, in the mouse studies to date. And actually that model may be a good model to do a direct comparison, um, looking at integration in the mouse cells and the humanized cells in the same animal. I agree with you, Mark. I think that'll be a great comparison side by side. One, one thing that I wanna mention in, in mice versus humans, I think the data on the clonal proliferation uh, by, um, by Denise and, 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 and the uh, group from Canada are super important because, um, I mean, the timeline during which HCC develops in humans, we have a relatively good understanding about this uh, from hepatitis B infection. You know, we, we know the timeline roughly from viral infection until HCC, it's about 20 years or so, right? So we're, we, we don't have any dogs or monkeys or anyone that's out 20 years. So I think the, the biomarker that we really, I think, need to investigate more is clonal expansion. Um, because if you got clonal expansion that, uh, that's AAV driven, right? You, you can predict what that's gonna do over the next 20 years. Um, you know, there's this gonna be a significant chance of additional hits in a, in a, in a continuously dividing clone. Um, and we have very, very, these, these, these dog um, experiments are the very first really. Uh, and, and we've not systematically looked at, people have always looked for the final readout, which is an HCC. Um, that's just, we can't wait that long. Um, we need intermediate, uh, in my opinion, assays. Um, and, 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 and these, uh, these focal hyperplasias, I, I saw, I looked, I was looking at the, the, the questions channel here. Several people asked, well, have you looked at those specifically? Um, uh, Dr. Lillicrap, you know, laser capture microdissection or try to rec to capture them uh, and see whether they're AAV driven or random. Um, I think that would be super important. And, you know, in, 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 in uh, Denise's uh, study, I, I totally understand why you only looked at 18 or so little chunks of liver, right? I mean, but uh, um, I, I think what we really need as a field is to look at every little chunk of that entire liver, um, which is a huge cost and, ex and, and effort. Um, but that, I think it would be very, very important to know what the rest of the liver looks like. You had the factor eight levels going up. Something's making that happen. What are the chances that you would biopsy that specific clone? Not very high, right? I mean, what percent of the total liver mass did your biopsies represent? 5%, 10%? So I think this is a really important point. Uh, you know, I mean, this really rep represents a very small portion of the liver. And for obvious reasons that you mentioned, we, you know, we only, uh, you know, s did analysis on several samples from each dog. We have additional liver from these dogs. We can certainly pursue this um, in, in more detail. Um, and importantly, as I highlighted, you know, we didn't have any nodules or foci or anything at the time of necropsy that looked like anything we should focus on for the analysis. I think the other point this raises is it, it may be valuable, which, which is um, to consider um, some of the work that David presented where they did the RNA analysis and looked at gene expression um, profiles um, in the, the samples where these integration events are detected. And uh, you know, this is sort of an unexpected finding. We didn't isolate RNA from the same identical tissue samples. And I think going forward, that is an important thing to consider. So at least we can get as much information as we can from the samples we analyze. Okay, I wonder if I could just comment briefly uh, as well. I mean, uh, so we, we, we also had a couple of dogs, which I didn't point out, who had minor increases in factor eight um, after about six 
or seven years after the delivery, we, we actually didn't think they were particularly significant. And we certainly didn't see any clonal dominance in the analyses we did. Now, um, when we did clonal studies with sequence reads and shearing counts, there, there probably are clones of cells of 10, 20, you know, small numbers of cells that carry the same sequence. So I think with the, while there was no clonal dominance over 10, 12 years, and if these integrations occurred very early, you'd expect that there is going to be an outgrowth of some cells that, that produce clones. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, they were they're, they're, they're similar, I think, but, but not quite as um, obvious maybe as some of the findings that Denise presented. David, did your vector have the um, enhancer mapped by uh, Alexander and friends? Um, you know, that's a great question and I should know the answer and I don't. No, 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 we didn't have it. Okay, there you go. Okay. Well, so the other thing we, we, we obviously should do, I mean, Marcus is right. We should go back and, and do micro dissections of those nodular areas and see um, what we find in the hyperplastic areas, which I mean, those things do occur in aging dogs, but you know, this is possibly driven by AAV insertions as well. Yep. Hi, this is Rick Bushman. Let me comment briefly on one like huge difference between Lily Crap and Sabatino studies on the dogs, um, which is the proportion of integration in transcription units or genes. Um, David said 6% or something like that. We said over 50%. So what the heck's the deal? So. Um, I think it's totally about the annotation that was used on the dog genome. Um, the uh, gene work folks used uh, CANFAM3, um, but my guys felt that the um, dog genome was kind of an annotation desert and um, instead poured it over human annotation onto the dog genome using something called Xenoref, which allows you to try to merge the two. And so we, I think we used a much, much richer uh, annotation on the dog genome. Now there's there's drawbacks going both ways. It's probably less accurate also, but um, I think that explains the, the huge difference in a, apparent integration frequency in genes. I mean, can I comment on that? I mean, there's nothing special about AAV when it comes to this. You know, viral vectors, when they integrate like the five prime region of actively transcribed genes, that's true for Lenti, that's true for pretty much every... Um, so this, I don't think this is AAV biology. I think this is just... Um, integration. So I, I, it makes sense to me, and we have data that I'll present in my talk, that the majority of integrations or a large percentage are near the transcriptional start site of genes that are active yeah. in, in the and, liver. And in our mouse liver data, uh, using the, the old approaches with the uh, rescue uh, plasmids, or even some approaches where we, we, did, we did use no selection and didn't quite use that approach. I mean, we, we saw a high statistically significant number of integrations in or near genes. I mean, I think there are some differences between different vectors about which portion of the genes are more likely targeted, but, but I agree uh, in general. So, so I, I would say everything points to the fact that there is more integration uh, in or near genes. One thing I want to mention that I think is really important from a liver biology perspective, you know, we've only in recent years been learning about clonal hematopoiesis in normal humans from John Dick and others. Uh, we know nothing about clonal proliferation or clonal clones that form spontaneously in the aging human liver. Um, I mean, people look at cirrhotic nodules, sure, they can see that's a clone, um, but in a normal liver, uh, and we also don't know anything about this in dogs. You know, no one's ever asked the question whether there is clonal expansion naturally during aging in the adult mammalian liver. And I think before we go off and interpret AAV data, we're going to need those um, those controls. Um, you know, I, you know, we, we can we can see clones if the cells that emerge are histologically distinct from the surrounding liver tissue. But I can tell you from clonal marking studies that we've done in the mouse liver in precancerous states, there's large clones of completely normal appearing hepatocytes that form way before you get nodules. 
Um, and we, we, we don't know anything about that in, in humans or large animals. And to interpret what we see with AAV, we're gonna need that as well. So Marcus, what do you think about ploidy and, and multinucleation uh, and, and what role that might play in the, in the process? Um, I, I'm completely open-minded. I, I really don't, uh, I, I really don't have anything to base an opinion on, on that. Um, I, it, it's worth looking at, but, um, you know, the, 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 the AAV, um, could be found in clones, but then we should not necessarily turn around and conclude that AAV is making the clones. I, all I'm saying is we, we if we're going to do this right, we need normal animals uh, that are exposed to the same deep analysis for clonality, and which is of course much harder if you don't have an AAV integration. We're going to have to rely on, uh, on, on naturally existing single nucleotide polymorphisms to do this. Uh, if anyone's at the, at, at the NIH is listening in today, just um, there are some studies that ought to be done and funded. <laughs> so I'm not sure if you're aware if because I'm just thinking that I mean when once it wants to attribute genotoxicity to AAV vectors. So in the end, AAV is and if putting all together the different studies and showing the relation into actively transcribed genes and so uh, regions with double strand breaks and things like this. So it really points to a passive integration. So I'm just wondering if some kind of study putting together something like a plasmid that in the end, any piece of DNA is susceptible of integration. Plus, com and comparing it to an AV vector, for example, it could uh, sort of draw some light on the fact that, okay, maybe you're having a clonal expansion, that it's not driven by AV, it's simply that it's a passenger event and it simply gets so, clonally expanded yeah. because they said. So, so, we've looked at that, and I put a, a paper in chat that was done by Nakai when he was in the lab, but we've looked at linear DNA versus circular DNA with and without ITRs and linear DNA has a much higher propensity to integrate, but circular plasmids, it's much less uh, common. Yeah, but yeah. did you try putting together something without ITRs, for example? Because it yeah. would be the regions yeah. more prone yes. to integrate. Yeah. Yeah, and I put the paper in chat, and it's been a while since I remember the data. There was a slight difference with and without the ITRs, but it wasn't a huge difference. I have a question, by the way, on the on this aspect. You know, so so all these bar ITR variants, right? That you know, you have been talking about. So this is very interesting because the ITR, you know, has a strong role. You know, it's been very reactive. You know, interacts with all the DNA repair machinery, and you know, and goes right away in any DNA break, uh, and you know, use also play with homologies and so. On. I was wondering, like, like play with the ITRs, right? So two loops, three loops, or the one loop only. I mean, uh, so that's the, 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 uh, there are studies that do analyze the, the changes in the integration site uh, and the distribution, uh, or in the in the recombination actually within the, the vector itself. Or, 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 I mean, uh, uh, let's say high throughput analysis, you know, to optimize uh, ITRs uh, to, to reduce the unwanted events. Uh, I was wondering if, how, how much is known about this. As Mark uh, said, he, you know, they've studied uh, whether the presence or absence of an ITR on a linear uh, DNA really increases integration. And we've done similar studies where uh, looking with uh, linear DNA with no ITR or an ITR and sort of an open duplex conformation versus ITR locked in a hairpin conformation. And in terms of integration rates, there's very little difference. Uh, mm -hmm. Where there are differences are in the different recombination uh, or DNA repair factors that have to interact with that end in order to get it to move to either a circular or an integrated state. Um, now we, we did all those studies in dividing cell cultures. And I think what we're uh, 
looking at in liver in, a, in an animal is that in these more quiescent cells, uh, you're not going to have so many recombination or DNA uh, pair uh, pathways active. Uh, we're, we're going to be mostly reliant on uh, non-homologous uh, and joining rather than homologous recombination. So I, I think a lot of what we've done in cell cultures uh, isn't so easily applicable to uh, liver. And that's, I think, you know, part of the importance of what Irene brought out was that we need to be looking at these in terms of in vitro models with quiescent cells. So Doug, I wanna reiterate that and, and say that, you know, the studies I mentioned were done in mouse liver and it's similar to what you guys found as well. But, but I, I do wanna point out, I, I'm not sure that linear DNA transfected into cells either in vivo or in vitro necessarily will recapitulate AEV because you know, the, you know, you guys showed too that the AEV is encoding in the nucleus. And, and I think the capsid encoding process and how you go from single to double-stranded DNA and what molecular form actually results in most of the integration events isn't well understood and could influence a number of parameters such as where integration tends to occur and things along those lines. Well, I have a question. I'm not aware of a paper or a study of that's directly compared self-complementary AAV versus single-stranded AAV um, integration frequencies. Um, does does anyone have any information? I thought you guys did some of that. We 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 did that uh, and looked at the different recombination uh, factors that uh, that influence that. Um, we've also, you know, done some studies in, again, in vitro cell cultures uh, where there's no difference in integration rates uh, between self-complementary and uh, single-strand AAV, which is kind of a stunning thing. Uh, I mean, they overlap absolutely. Uh, you take that same thing and do it in a mouse liver uh, and then evaluate integration by partial hepatectomy, and we see that we uh, have a great deal more integration from the self-complementary. But that integration is more or less uh, proportional to the increase in transduction fre frequency. So it seems in general that the more genomes you get in there actively, uh, the more integrations you're going to get. So the, the reason I bring this up, I mean, we have, we've not done this systematically, uh, but we've had the opportunity to compare um, identical vector genomes in different serotypes integration in the mouse liver, AV8 versus AV2. And there was a pretty big difference um, uh, in two things. One was the integration frequency, and then also the size of cancatomers that formed. So with AAV2, they were on average two um, AV genomes per cancatomer and AV8, it was six um, or so at the same dose. So, and I had a brief discussion with Jude here um, uh, via the chat, and I, I had this hunch that it's really the single-stranded uh, stage of the AAV um, genome that's responsible for the majority of integrations. And once concatomers are formed or double-stranded, you know, it's much less prone to, uh, to integrate. I'm, I'm wondering what other people's comments are on that. Well, one quick um, thing is I, I think, a, you, know, you know, we showed AV2 on coats much uh, less rapidly than AV8. So that, the, that, that's, the, why, that's why I get that helps with that hunch. That's exactly what I'm saying, Mark. That, but, that, that, so you would predict that the uncoating kinetics would have an, inf, have an effect on, um, right. on, but on in terms, integration frequency. Right. But in terms of mechanism, if they uncoat less rapidly, and if you assume that it's annealing, the AV2 genomes may anneal uh, less frequently or slower. And as a result, if those were the intermediates that were integrating, um, you could also argue this, you know, the same reason that you don't see as much integration, but I'm very open to the idea that it's the single stranded forms. I, I'm keeping an open mind on this. Well, we, again, with the self-complementary vector, we're, we're certainly getting more integrations in the liver. 
again, more or less proportional to transduction. But uh, I would add here that uh, in terms of seeing more concatamers, depending on the serotype, uh, remember that a concatamer formation is essentially a second order reaction. Uh, well, it's so larger more, concatamers, not more, uh, larger, larger. Larger, larger yeah. concatamers. But again, a second order reaction, the more genomes you have uh, available in the nucleus at the same time, uh, the more likely those are to form. Agreed. That makes sense. Yes, agree. So, so uh, kind of moving on a little bit. Um, so we talked about uh, the relevance of the models, but uh, in terms of those models, what sort of integration profile would sort of inform the safety risk in the human? And in particular, I want to talk about what uh, what uh, Phil Tai uh, mentioned in terms of aberrant genomes uh, and. Uh, in particular, Randy's observation of one of the integration events that had a piece of plasmid DNA in it. Obviously, that wasn't a post-infection uh, um, aberration. It was a production aberration. Uh, so can these integration profiles kind of inform what it is about a particular AV uh, uh, that might pose a risk? I have an opinion on this. So I think that the integration profile per se in a neutral context um, is difficult that can tell you much, okay? So unless you see, you know, a very strong bias to integrate to, towards regulatory regions, which is not the case, apparently, you know, I, I don't think it's very, very, very informative. I don't think that, you know, the different, between the different AAVs, you're gonna see differences, re very relevant differences integration profile in terms of safety. Okay, that's, that's my opinion. Uh, what is important is that the integration profile, uh, it can tell you a lot if the, 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 there are expansions, okay? So I agree a lot. So it's not just you have to find a particular carcinoma or any kind of transformation, okay? Cell transformation, but uh, you, you need to see also uh, the, 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 the size of the clones, right? So, so if you have one clone, with, a, with an integration might be in a gene that you don't, you, you, you know, or you don't, then, then it's important to check, you know, this clone is evolving over time. So of course I understand that it's complicated, you know, in, in solid tissues to make a, a repeated biopsies, but, you know, I'm going to show you probably some, some solutions to that, uh, a solution to that. Uh, and so I think that it's important to check, you know, the, 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 the genes that you are getting and the expansion of the clone. It is bigger related to the others. Per se, the profile across the chromosomes is not going to tell you much, I think, my opinion. Can I speak to that briefly? Um, I agree with Eugenio on his uh, assessment. The, it, it would take something pretty extreme to see in an initial integration site distribution that that looked really dangerous. I mean, what would that even mean? What we often do for uh, lentiviral integration uh, data sets is compare the new vector to uh, uh, initial transductions from a few trials that turned out to be safe and you show there's not much difference, but that's not a really rich source of information. And I, I agree there's much, much more to be learned watching the longitudinal evolution with uh, clones coming and going, the geno genetic consequences and stuff like that. Um, it, it would take something really extreme to say that this looks like an unsafe profile of initial integration. I just wanted to add there that I also agree with what's been said. So um, one thing is that I also see integration side analysis more as a, a let's say, tracking tool than a, let's say, diagnostic tool for potential genotoxicity or anything like that. And one thing to consider, because the comparison uh, to historical data sets is really powerful. A tool for um, lentiviral vectors and so on because there are really a lot of clinical data sets available. But uh, something worthy to mention for AAV vectors is that there is a limited amount of clinical integration data available. So it's really hard to, so when you have no control, no toxic control to compare, it gets complicated to really be able to drive any conclusion to say this is safe or this is not safe. And then, yeah. 
I, oh, I just wanted to comment, and I think these are very, very good points, you know, especially for, you know, looking at colonial expansion and, and, and you know, longitudinal studies to really be uh, critical for informing us about the impacts. But I, I, I do really feel like a kid in a candy shop, you know, when, when you guys are talking about the mechanisms um, of integration, you know, double-stranded AAVs versus single-strand, because, um, you know, part of our uh, findings is that uh, the heterogeneity that we find in the ITRs really do impact uh, the percentage of these truncated genomes, which we find are uh, um, have a composition of these self uh, self complement uh, vectors. And so, uh, if you know purity and heterogeneity of AEVs have a role, I think you know these tools that we've now developed can start to address some of these questions about the mechanism. So, so do you find that those differences in the ITRs affect the microhomology regions that would influence where the integration occurs? Because that, you know, likely plays a role in these integration events, even right. short so, microhomology. Right, right. I, I think that that certainly has a role, um, uh, but <clears throat> more more along along the lines of sort of what what um, I think, I believe is driving integration is, um, you know, whether uh, um, species can uh, quickly form episomal species versus whether they, they stay linear, right? And whether that be single strand or whether they be, would they remain in the double strand conformation and whether there is a DNA damage response that's also associated with it. I think this is, these are all mechanisms that, uh, uh, we need to parse out, right? Because I, I do believe that, I don't know whether it's, it, th that these microhomology domains is a strong driving factor, right? So they're, they're, there's a reason why they integrate into promoters. And I, and I think integration is kind of an opportunistic uh, mechanism, right? So promoter sequences are, are more open. And so they're going to go into these positions where they integrate. Now, now whether microhomology within those conditions, within the environment of an open chromosome, um, is is critical or not? I think that still has to be assessed. But um, I, I'm very very interested in, in what you, what your thoughts are in terms of um, you know the the interplay between between episomal forms versus linear concatenators uh, that that still persist right uh, within this finite window of, of of integration whether whether those things are important or not. Well, we we have an idea that our loop formation may influence sites of integration. And, and we're actually studying that now, but don't have data definitively yet, but very soon. It, it, may be worth, it may be worth pointing out that for the retroviruses, there are specific tethering mechanisms that dominate. Um, the gamma retroviruses, the integrase binds the BRD proteins, um, and lentiviruses, the integrase binds LEDGFP75. So BRD proteins are at gene five prime ends. LEDGF is distribu distributed across transcription units, and that seems to largely dictate the integration patterns for each of the two. So it's not something vague about opening. It's some very specific uh, interactions. And you know, there, of course, there's um, there's no integrase with AAV. So the question would be what one question might be, what proteins are likely to bind onto the episomal form of the DNA? And then who do those guys like to bind to? I actually have a question at this point, given that uh, actually to, 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 to Rick, you know, given that it is known that AAV, you know, they, in particular the ITRs are bound to uh, DNA repair mechanic, uh, factors, wouldn't be this kind of a tethering Mechanisms towards the DNA. However, it's not specific, right? It's going to be distributed. It's complicated to study. But, but I think it does relate to the propensity to integrate into pre existing double strand breaks uh, because you're likely to get caught up in that same repair event. So, 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 so is the tethering factor the DNA repair protein that is, is, is dragging the, is taking the AV towards the, 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 the the broken DNA, the genomic, the cellular, the host genome that is broken somewhere. And, and so yeah, both, both interact, the, right? Yeah. Kind of hijack, is hijacking gonna, that. Right. I need non homologous I need the is going to look for the nearest free end and, and put it together. Uh, one, 
one me. one point I want to bring up, and I'll uh, I'll address some of this in, when I give my talk. But um, one question I want to throw out uh, is how accurate have the integration frequency measurements been in the presence of episomes? So these 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 ITR capture um, um, technologies that that are that that are basically looking for uh, adjacent um, uh, genomic DNA. You know how well does that work when you have an overwhelming presence of confounding episomes and uh, uh, in in the in in that mix? Um, I've um, my, I've I've been struck with um, with what I believe are significant underestimates of the actual integration frequency. Um, I, I think that most of these uh, well, methods I, I think are coming up with results that are much lower than we are finding um, and, and at the same doses. Um, so I'm um, particularly Philip, um, I mean, you, you, you seem to be going uh, towards long sequences, but you were really focusing on sequencing the AAV genomes themselves. Um, what about applying that approach to looking for um, junctions? Yeah, we, we have a lot of unpublished data where we've used uh, smart sequencing to look at junctions. Um, and in that, yeah, uh, we haven't revisited that, that work because it didn't really seem like it was able to reveal anything much different than what um, the conventional you know, short fragment sequencing technologies were able oh. to reveal, so. Well, you know one what? thing it would reveal is concatamers, right? I mean, so, um, uh, I was struck uh, in, in, uh, by, by, uh, 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 by the assumption that um, those sequences, Dr. Lillicraft, that don't have junctions in them are episomes. Um, mm -hmm. How would you know that, uh, that that's not integrated? Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and so what, wanna, wanna, I, I'll, I'll talk about that. You, we have a limited data set. We've, we've applied PAC bio uh, sequencing to AAV integrations. And what we do find is that actually there are a lot of concatameric integrations. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and, and, and so I think your plus, the other thing you can do with your technology is you can look um, at a distance at what's happening to the genome around the AV integration. Do you have deletions? Do you have insertions? Do you have AV induced mediated nearby rearrangements? Um, so I, 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 I but, think but, but I'm, I'm also really interested in just in what's your estimate of the integration frequency? Does it dovetail with the Illumina uh, measured integration frequency or is it different? In those studies, we never compared episomal versus inter integrated species. Uh, we were just kind of looking to see uh, whether we could find new events, right, compared to previous data. So we basically took samples where uh, we knew uh, to a certain degree that uh, AAV was integrated uh, using conventional, I think back then was just using pyro uh, methodologies. And then we applied that material for, for smart sequencing and we didn't really see a huge uh, deal of differences. In those studies, what we were actually looking for were intact ITRs, right? So uh, I think in some of the early studies, all of the integration events seemed to be attributed to partial ITR integrants and never saw full ITR integrants. And so we, we thought that we could use PacPal to identify those, but we also never picked up any uh, full uh, ITRs. But, we were also using the RS2, uh, which the throughput for that wasn't very good. And so um, we kind of uh, shelved that project because we didn't see much differences from the PyroSeq data. So, so I think depending on the method you use for sequencing any type of PCR in the presence of many episomes, I think it can either over or underestimate integration events because a lot of weird stuff happens. We don't totally understand. But it was your lab who also showed the presence of translocations. Oh, oh that was with, I, I don't know if that was just with AAV or with nuclease mediated AAV. But, you know, that's another thing that I think is sometimes hard to pick up are translocations. And, you know, most translocations they occur will probably result in a lethal event. You won't see it. But I think we, we can also can think about whether,
and how often AVs may induce translocations. So this is a very important issue. Uh, I think some of my colleagues uh, uh, at UMass are now looking for techniques such as uh, uh, proximity, uh, proximity uh, labeling technique to identify cellular factors uh, that contributed to ITR binding. And but more challenging would be identify interaction between ITRs and as well as the genomic DNA. I think uh, using uh, promise, uh, proximity uh, labeling and other technique, we may be able to identify those factors. Thank you. So we're almost out of time, uh, but before we go, can we just uh, talk for a minute about what would be a relevant model system? Uh, and, and certainly Irene has talked about it, and I think Marcus is gonna talk about it more, but what features are we gonna look for here? I think no model's perfect. <laughs> they all have their pluses and minuses. And... Uh, but, but what do we use to assess risk? I, you know, personally, I'm just gonna say, I think the various models people are using um, are all gonna lead to information. And I, I, I would say it's unclear which model is going to be most predictive at this time, but, you know, I, you know, others can chime in. Yes. So, so in our experience with lentiviral vectors and gamma retroviral vectors, the models we that they were using before, they were the wild type mice, uh, which were at least uh, with the mm, transduction levels, the levels of marking that uh, could be achieved at that time, you know, were not were not that high. So, so the wild type mice were not so sensitive, and unfortunately, you know, we uh, we, we we saw that you know. Adverse events occur, severe adverse events occur also in humans. So after that, you know, the, the, the sensitivity of the mouse models increase because uh, using higher doses, for example, uh, Chris Baum and others are using, using, you know, very high doses of vector and, you know, showing some sporadic tumors caused by specific vectors. You, we specifically, in our experience, we use tumor from mice uh, models that uh, actually Gil, you know, introduced already. And, and, and that, you know, give you, you know, you know, pretty good, you know, they're quite sensitive. You can tell you, for example, vector A compared with vector B, vector C, you know, what is the best choice? So one of the things that, you know, is that could be tested with AAVs is, for example, percent dose finding, you know, to understand what are the doses that over certain level uh, can provide, can, can induce cancer. But this is a complicated because then you need to consider the human situation that is different. Uh, the second point, however, is that uh, using these, these, these mouse models, you can test also different, for example, promoters, right? So we know that using moderate promoters, you know, is safer than using very strong promoters. So you might actually build up copies with a moderate promoter to achieve therapeutic uh, expression. And you know, while reducing at the same time the risk of insertion of mutagenesis or actually of gene deregulation. So that's 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 one of the my 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 opinion. Jing, you have a comment uh, as a toxicologist. What's your perspective? You seem to you're, be you're, muted, Jing. You're on mute. Okay, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm mute. Um, so in terms of what model will be the best model to predict um, the, you know, the uh, safety of the AAV integration, I think this really needs to come from the, uh, what we um, see in the animal or in the human data, you know, whether um, there's anything we can, uh, we know about the, uh, what can be translated from the, any of animal model, animal data we have generated so far, Mm -hmm. um, whether in the small molecule, or small, um, you know, the rodent or to the uh, large animals and how that um, compare with the human, uh, you know, the actual, um, what happened in the human patient, uh, whether it's where you evaluate the integration uh, rate, integration uh, profile, or also some of the genes that's being affected. And so far from the animal data we have seen, um, we see that we constantly show that those animal data 
um, generated, um, we know the integration frequency is relatively low. And then the um, profile is um, somewhat random, uh, even though we know some of the, um, the, uh, the active genes are likely to get hit with integration. That's pretty uh, consistent across the animal uh, models. Um, but so far, we haven't really seen any of the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma development in the um, patient population. So that's the translation piece we have um, been seeing um, in missing. So this afternoon, we will have a few talks, I think, from the clinical side, um, especially the Unicor um, case. Um, I hope we can see more of this um, kind of translation piece, just to see what kind of animal data we have seen so far um, can be um, translated and can be utilized to inform the uh, safety risk in the uh, patient population. Until then, I feel like there's so far we, um, the animal models, uh, we can use it for um, study the, um, the factors that contribute to the integration, whether it's the promoter region or the dose or some other form of the, um, the transgenes. Um, but in terms of the safety translation into the human po uh, population, I still don't say much of the, um, you know, be able the translatability of there. So I think the animal model, what is effective to inform safety on, in human, is we really need to build uh, those translation first. So one, one point I want to capture I, that. I, I could not wait uh, to hear uh, Marcus talk because personally I thought his model of uh, humanized mouse liver will at least address uh, potential integration profiles in human hepatocytes. But because of a timing issue, we may not be able to see a human HCC. Yeah, so I, I just wanna uh, capture one point vis-a-vis -vis safety of AAV. We've been really talking, everyone here, about liver-directed AAV gene therapy. And I just want to capture the notion that it doesn't matter whether it's liver directed or not, if it's a systemically administered vector that is targeted at the CNS, uh, uh, for example. And one, one, of the, one of the easy safety things that could be done at least there that I just wanna be sure that we capture this is uh, if you're targeting the CNS, let's use a promoter that doesn't work in hepatocytes. Or if you're targeting the muscle, let's make sure that the promoter is not ubiquitous and works in hepatocytes. Um, that way you can at least minimize the risk of oncogene activation when you're going into the diseases where you don't need to target the liver. Um, and, and this is particularly a concern of me when we're giving massive vector doses to, to, to young babies with neurological diseases. Their, their, their liver is, is just full of AAV um, uh, with the serotypes used and, and and there's a, that's an easy thing we could do as a field um, is to pay attention to whether the promoters are active in the liver or not. And with that, I, I hate to cut this conversation short. Uh, we've run over into our lunch break. Uh, so I, I think we'll adjourn now and we'll be back at 12.50 uh, Eastern time uh, to continue with some of the uh, uh, clinical discussions. <laughs>
Thank you. 
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope you had a pleasant lunch or coffee break or um, dinner break, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I'm excited to recommence the roundtable today by welcoming Eugenio Montini to the virtual podium. He'll share his uh, experience with uh, approaches and also some reflections on his past experience in, in this area both from the perspective of looking at adenoviral um, integration and retroviral integration, and I'm sure bring a lot to the discussion through his presentation. Virginia. Thank you. Um, let me try to share the screen. Can you see the screen? Maybe if you can shift to presentation mode. Okay. Can you see it? Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so, um, so I work in the, in the institute uh, is the Serafera Institute for, uh, for Gene Therapy. And my expertise essentially is working on safety and also integration studies, especially for uh, lentiviral vector-based uh, uh, gene therapy approaches. Okay, so, so here in the, the, the presentation, you know, essentially I'm going to talk about uh, approaches and reflections based on past experience. And actually, I'm gonna skip a little bit on that. Okay, I'm going to show actually what I think which is going to be the future, you know, of uh, vector integration studies, you know, for uh, um, um, in vivo gene therapy. Okay, so a little introduction of the matrix cell, cell gene therapy, actually on the integration studies. So the molecular monitoring to our integration site analysis have been, you are, have been already had an introduction. Okay, is important, you know, in the matrix cell, cell gene therapy because, uh, as you know. Uh, from patients, we can get the matrix stem cells, okay, from the bone marrow, and uh, transduce them with a retroviral vector or gamma retroviral vector of a vector of interest that can transduce these cells. The vector integrates in the genome of this uh, the, 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 this, this enriched uh, cell population of the enriched stem cells. Then, after uh, upon reintroduction into the into the into the into the patient, essentially you can see that the hematopoietic system, the, the cells start proliferating and differentiating into different cell types. And so you can see, for example, in this case, there is this integration side represented by the red bar. All the progeny of these cells will contain the same integration side, okay? And so that is interesting because, you know, we can study the integration sites that just drawing, drawing the blood from the patients and analyzing different cell types, okay? We can study, you know, how the hematopoietic system can be reconstituted. So it's important not only for safety studies, but also, you know, for basic biology to understand, you know, how the therapy goes, you know, how the, how the metabolic system uh, uh, develops, okay? Uh, this is interesting, and we have the luxury to do that because we are working indeed with blood cells, so this is a liquid uh, tissue, okay? However, you know, also there are some, some limitations on this because, again, you know, we are limited to study blood cells or, let's say, bone marrow biopsies, or you can study also, you know, the tissues, but still, again, you know, these are invasive biopsies, you know, for example, in the liver, or, or the eye, the, the, the brain, you know, it's very, very, very bad to do that. So, so this is not exactly uh, easy to do. Um, now in the genotoxicity for the gamma, the, the genotoxicity that we observed, you know, in the gamma retroviral uh, trials, and actually, you know, some unfortunately I have seen now in other trials too, uh, has triggered, you know, essentially the improvement in the technologies for integration cell retrieval, which now are quantitative and you know, there are proofs you now that are quite good, you know, to detect the amount of, the correct amount of the, the clone that present in the blood. Uh, of course, you know, improved bioinformatics for integration cell analysis and uh, Rick Bushman and, and others, you know, also, also Manfred Smith, uh, and also a little bit ourselves, you know, contributed to this, uh, normal types of representation and so on. So essentially, there has been a lot of developments, including, for example, you know, the developments of sensitive in vitro and in vivo assays for genotoxicity testing, you know, the better understanding the molecular mechanism involved in genotoxicity. And that led, you know, to understanding that the lentiviral vectors, or oh, well, vectors harboring, you know, uh, self-inactivated long terminal repeats, so the void with enhancers, you know, in these uh, portions, you know, they were safer with the, 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 the the original counterparts, which had had this analysis in the LTR. Now, also we use uh, uh, additional uh, genetic elements, for example, insulators, you know, to increase the safety. Okay, all these, you know, the type of knowledge, you know, I think it could be important, you know, can be transferred also into the AV field, although with important changes 
and uh, differences that are mainly considered. Uh, so how we do the integration site analysis in the patients, well, essentially we transduce the cells in vitro. We can get the DNA from the cells in vitro uh, after transduction, okay, as a neutral profile. Although, you know, these cells have been uh, transplanted, good part of the cells have been transplanted to the patient, you know, and then we can decide, you know, specific time points to harvest, you know, the blood cells from the patient, okay, extract the DNA and perform the integration site analysis, okay. So, uh, sequencing, map the integration sites, and then you can find many, many, many types of uh, annotations, right? Including the genes that you targeted and also the position within the genes and so on. This is, this is history. I mean, this has been already quite well established. Uh, so this is uh, uh, some suggestions, you know, from, 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 uh, from, uh, from FDA. Essentially, what you need to do, uh, the integration site analysis needs to be done essentially on uh, target cells which have a high replicative capacity or and or long survival. So short cells, you know, short lived cells do not need this, this, this type of analysis because they're gonna die out. Uh, target cells, they need to be accessible for the assay. For example, liver cells or blood or so on. Maybe I will be not visible. Uh, to study vector inter integration sites, uh, at least 1% of cells needs to be posited by PCR, not in the PCR. This is our suggestion. So uh, for integrating vectors, vector and transposal base, you know, usually what you do essentially is perform uh, two, uh, uh, in, uh, two time points uh, for the first time, time uh, five years. So you analyze, you know, let's say time point one and six months, you know, 12 months after transplantation, you know, to analyze how it's going. And then this, you need to do this for five years, or at least it's suggested to do this for five years. And then uh, you can do once uh, uh, for the next 10 years. So there are 15 years of follow-up suggested you know, to this. Of course, you know, if you find a predominant clone dominant, so, so then you should do the analysis no more than three months later. These are again suggestions. Or until vector sequences are not detectable. Now on these, these are for, for gamma retroviral vectors. Now also for AVs uh, that have been suggested this type of analysis. However, you know, only, you know, with the common, common, uh, commons, you know, five years follow-up. Um, so how can we, so there are important differences here. So if we can analyze the blood and, and of course, you know, we cannot perform many, many biopsies, you know, in liver or other tissues, you know, because they are invasive, I told you. So we, we found, you know, essentially that uh, we recently published that the cell-free DNA uh, could be a new source for, a, for, a, for, a, for, a, for vector integration studies, okay? So the idea is that, you know, because uh, we, might be transduced the, the directly, the induce, uh, transfuse, induce the vector and transduce the liver directly or the bones and so on, you know, we get also not only cells that circulate, for example, blood cells, but also we can have, you know, uh, chunks of DNA, you know, which is called cell-free DNA that is released by dying cells from different organs of the body. Okay, these are short, short chunks of DNA that are still chromatinized and that can be used, you know, for, uh, could be used, we integrate ourselves, it could be used, you know, to perform integration site analysis. The idea is that then you can interrogate also cells that are present in tissues that are that in solid tissues and not only circulating cells. The, 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 the approach is always the, the more or less similar to the uh, ligation mediated PCR um, amplification. So in which you have the, the, the vectors, the, the genome is already fragmented because uh, there is already found this in the plasma. Now then you can perform uh, essentially the attach a, a linker cassette and perform the PCR amplification to amplify the junction between vector and the genome. So uh, we perform these, uh, of course, having the samples available, you know, in uh, MLD, in seven MLD patients, my, my, uh, patients that uh, hematopoiesis cell patients, uh, gene therapy patients affected by metachromatic lipodystrophy with a little uh, storage disorder. And essentially uh, from these patients that have been already characterized before, we analyze both cells and um, uh, cell-free DNA. And as you can see here, that from, the, for the, from the different, uh, each different patient along different time points, we retrieve you know, you know, from hundreds to thousands of integration sites. Okay, of course, you know, when we work on, with, uh, uh, with cells, you know, we have many, many more samples and much more DNA to work with. So we get many more integrations. So you can see here in this graph that you have, you know, polyclonal repopulation. So each bar represents a, a single time point. Okay, and these, uh, each, each single, you know, block within the bar, you know, is at the size of the clone. 
and the, 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 on the lanes, you know, that connect, you know, means that the clone can be found also in the following time points. As you can see, you know, here is a kind of polyclonal repopulation and the cell free DNA provides similar results. Although, of course, we have less integrations because the amount of DNA was lower. Um, so the distribution of these integrations was very similar, you know, uh, to the, the distributions uh, the, along the cell free DNA and the, the cellular DNA was very similar. We know that the lentiviral vectors do not integrate uh, totally randomly into the genome. They prefer, for example, gene dense regions, as I'm showing you here. And essentially the patterns, you know, the patterns are very similar. So you can see these spikes here of integrations, hotspots and integration sites that are targeted, you know, fine in both, in both uh, using both sources of DNA. Okay. So this is important because, you know, the, the analysis are comparable. Okay, now an important point is that, as you can see here, for example, you can find integrations in the bone marrow or blood, mar blood derived cells, okay, different types, mononuclear cells, progenitor, T cells, and so on. And then, of course, you know, uh, we, 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 we observe, you know, the, the integrations that are found in plasma, and we found actually a pretty good overlap. So meaning that the integrations that we found there are also found in the, in the cells. However, we do find also a lot of integrations that are not represented in the in the cellular DNA. And so we found indeed that the cell free DNA has a lower, let's say, overlap okay, of integrations compared with the cells uh, related to the uh, coming from, from cellular DNA. And this means probably that uh, the difference, we are observing probably new integrations that we missed before, and probably these because are coming from solid tissues. How to prove that? Well, you know, oh, sorry, we, we also can say this. One of the advantages also of using this, uh, this approach is that, that uh, this uh, 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 LibiSec is able to identify uh, essentially uh, also clonal expansions. So these are samples that we obtain, you know, uh, in, through a collaboration, you know, with Brown et al., you know, this has been published with the whisco syndrome clinical trial, you know, which uh, unfortunately several essential mutagenesis events. So here there are, so there is one patient that we are showing with two integrations, one in LMO2 and TAL1. These are the integration sites in, uh, in the cells that we observe in the, in, the, in the mononuclear cells. You can see the expansion of this, uh, of this clone, which is a leukemic clone, okay? Uh, and at, at this time point, you know, where, where leukemia was diagnosed. And again, we can see exactly the same situation with the, with the LIBISEC. So also interrogation of the liquid biopsy, you know, so the, the DNA, the circulating DNA, is okay. However, there is an advantage also to using uh, circulating DNA is that, for example, in another case, in a, in a severe adverse events of T-cell lymphoma in a patient from a gamma retroviral based clinical trial from his kid, okay, um, there is an integration here uh, located, you know, upstream the LMO2 gene that induces an, uh, an expansion, you know, it was a lymphoma. So if you look at the cells, that circulating cells, you know, and analyze the integration sites, you can find integration responsible for the, for the, for the tumor, okay? However, you know, this was represented very poorly, 0.4, 1.4% at the most. And here, there was a point in which was diagnosed, okay? So instead, if we look at the cell free DNA, you can see here comparable time points, 74 days, you know, a month, sorry, you know, before a diagnosis, you know, we actually found that the LMO2 clone was 74%. And indeed, because this, the clone was hiding essentially in the thymus, okay, it was not really circulating. And the few cells that were circulating, actually, you know, we catch them, but they were not really representative. In this, day, in this case, we had a better representation, you know, of the size of this clone at the organismal level. Now, the important thing is also that we perform also studies in uh, uh, published previously, you know, in, uh, from Cantor and Zani et al., you know, which uh, dogs, you know, affected by hemophilia. Uh, were treated, you know, with lentiviral vector expressing uh, factor nine. And uh, so, as you can see here, we op uh, obtain, you know, uh, these dogs have been treated that uh, the livers, you know, were from six to nine years, okay, uh, follow up. Uh, we had the plasma samples, you know, uh, for specific time points up to, you know, let's say almost uh, one year and a half, two years. Okay, and so, and so here you can see that for the different time points, we were able to retrieve, you know, uh, you know specific, uh, Actually, few integration sites for this uh, for this for this dog, you know, higher number for this one, and here very high the numbers for this other one. So telling us that there is a consistency, you know, probably related to the vector marking levels, which actually were quite low. We also observe the integrations, you know, 
at, at the liver tissue, okay? But you know, the interesting thing is that the overlap was minimal, okay? So you can see here that the, the, the overlap overall was varied between the two and 5%. So essentially telling us that, uh, yes, you can find a lot of integrations, you know, but still, you know, probably the complexity is so high that, you know, even, you know, analyzing uh, the, the, the integrations in the blood plasma, you know, it was more, uh, I think it's quite informative. And it's also nice to see that you can track actually integrations that stay long-term, especially in this, uh, dog uh, O59, okay, you can see essentially a lot of sharing. You, know, you can see all these this, 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 this bars here, you know, essentially that show the distribution of integrations across time. Telling that there are long-lived populations. Can we analyze this, uh, this study? So yeah, this, this situation, yes. So uh, first thing is that we, we observed that uh, the, the expansion, so the, 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 these cells, okay, the hepatocytes probably, or anyway, liver cells that uh, can undergo to replication because we found essentially cells uh, actually integration represented by, by several genomes. Okay, however, they reach more or less ten, a maximum 10, 14 genomes. Most of them, you know, were represented by one to four genomes. Okay, instead, we found that, for example, in the cell-free DNA from the MLD patients, you know, the, the the genome count was higher, and this is, it reflects also the biology. So, the blood cells are replicating you know, faster, you know, of course, you know, this is well known, compared for the, the, the liver cells, which are essentially, oh, well, liver, which is a slowly replicating, uh, proliferating organ, organ. So the regeneration is much slower. And of course, you know, the representation in genomes, which represent the proliferation of the cells, you know, is different between the two organs. Uh, so the other thing is, as I told you before, we were able to find, you know, the same integration, you know, of a, a group of integrations, you know, repeatedly in different time points. And so, uh, so you can have observation one, and observation two, and you can look, for example, you know, the data set of integration, the observation one, time point one, compared to time point two and calculate the overlap between the two. And through specific calculations that actually was actually pioneered this uh, in, in integration studies by Rick Bushman, you know, essentially you can calculate the, the, the population sites you know, that you are analyzing. And so this is the population sites that are proliferating in liver or regenerating the liver over time here, the more or less in a, one, one year. And you can see here two dogs, the M57 of 59. And you can see here that more or less the, 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 the number of market cells, you know, the population of market cells, you know, maintains, you know, between the uh, 5,000 and the more or less less than 10,000. So uh, finally, you know, we also perform some experiments in which we induce, you know, uh, histiocytic sarcomas in a mouse model of CDKN2A, which is deficient. Uh, so actually, it's, it's tumor prone, and uh, you can induce tumors quite easily, especially by activation of BRAF with this kind of vector. This is an antiviral vector that has an active LTR that can activate you know, uh, very easily genes. So it's not the vector that is using gene therapy. So as you can see, this nice, normally developed cancer Okay, because indeed they are deficient because it came to A. But when you inject this vector into the mice, you have a strong acceleration of tumor onset. So this is very, very, you know, very preliminary data, you know, so this is an histiocytic sarcoma we find in the mouse. And these are some, you know, uh, liquid biopsy that we perform here, one and two, you know, and this is in the liver. And you can see that essentially you can find, you know, a strong presence of BRAF integration here, you know, uh, actually this probably this from this histiocytic sarcoma. And plus, you know, you find actually the tissue, the same integration was among the dominant ones. Although, you know, in the liquid biopsy, you can see this effect of expansion much more enhanced. Finally, very few slides now, uh, the liquid, the, 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 the cell free DNA is interesting also to study, be studied, you know, not only because the integration sites, but also because per se is a biomarker, you know, essentially the more or less by cell free DNA it reflects more or less the, the, the status of the body. So you can do exercise, you can have a high levels of uh, cell free DNA, you can eat a lot, you have uh, very high cell free DNA, but you know, still normal conditions, you know, or let's say, you know, in rest, you know, you normally, uh, you, your, your circulating DNA should be, you know, relatively low. So between, you know, the nanograms per, per ml of plasma is less than 10. These are the regular levels. So in MLD patients, okay, some of the MLD patients, we observed that even before transplantation, okay, before conditioning and anything, you know, they had, you know, borderline limits, you know, so quite 
almost almost beyond the the, 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 the pathological threshold. Some others they had higher, you know. <clears throat> One has less, and the other one we didn't have the time for. So one point that we noticed that the MLD04 essentially had a very high um, uh, cell-free DNA, you know, uh, always. While the others, you know, you see a decrease in the cell-free DNA over time after gene therapy. And the interesting thing is that this uh, gene therapy patient was a patient that essentially was an energy malign chromatic look at the MLD patient, which actually was already symptomatic, and before which, unfortunately, the therapy is not that effective. And indeed, you can see here, you know, the MAR, the MAR score, you know, for the brain, and it was, you know, in a very, very good shape. And this reflects also, you know, the condition is reflected also probably by the expression of the, the high levels of self DNA. And this also turns out to be significant. So again, this is very preliminary, but apparently, you know, the analysis of self DNA can tell you also how the fetus uses the therapy. Okay, and this, for, for example, for the Roman solar disorder could be, you know, an interesting point also for the AV field. Also, the other important aspect is that, for example, when you look at the cell free DNA in the patients that develop uh, leukemia, the ones I showed you before, or, uh, or uh, lymphoma in this case here, you can see that uh, here, you can, here when you have the diagnosis of the, of, the, of the tumor, okay? And you can see that the cell free DNA is already high, okay? Here in gray is the normal values. Okay, is already high, you know, uh, quite early. So you you might be this observing the, the, the amount of cell DNA can tell you, you know, if something is going wrong. Doesn't tell you if it's a tumor or anything, but you know, you, you should check better. So uh, finally, uh, so the the the, uh, the antiviral and the retroviral gamma retroviral integrations can be analyzed by with the cell using cell DNA. And I think this this approach is complementary, not destructive, you know compared to the safety monitoring based strategies on blood cells. Uh, this may allow the identification of expanding clones growing in solid organs, as I show you with the uh, gene therapy patients uh, with uh, uh, bad, uh, bad adverse, uh, adverse uh, disease, uh, adverse events. Um, open the doors to the longitudinal integration studies in these gene therapy applications. And uh, low cell-free DNA concentration in blood plasma relates inversely with the efficacy of the treatment in MLD disease. Now, uh, again, in part, you know, correlates the health, uh, high levels of cell-free DNA directly correlated with genotoxicity. And I think, you know, this could be, you know, in the future, you know, standard, especially if we standardize, you know, the, the, which is already quite standardized, you know, the, 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 the system can be used for AAV. And we are actually now already, already collaborating, you know, with uh, some partners, you know, to, to, to actually perform longitudinal studies on AAV, uh, large animal models and patients. Uh, so this, of course, is a, is a is, you know, it's a group, it's a, it's a, has been a work with, you know, required a lot of collaborations, and it was very important for us. Uh, but especially, you know, Daniela, uh, essentially that uh, developed the technology, you know, that's been, you know, working on this, and she's on top of that. And Andrea, that take care about the bioinformatic part of, of the, the integration site analysis. And, and these, you know, of course, you know, uh, probably Mark is going to show you also the, the, the work, you know, from Andrea in the his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenio. Very, very interesting. Looking forward to discussing that um, in the roundtable shortly. Ricardo, over to you. Thanks. Let me share my presentation. Here we go. Okay, great. Can you see that? Yes. Great, fantastic, thank you. Well, let me just start by thanking Kevin and uh, the other members of the round table for inviting me and giving us the opportunity to present our experience evaluating the integration risk in a patient treated with our hemophilia B gene therapy. Um, I should also say that I, as a relative newcomer to this field, I found the roundtable to be you know, very educational. So, um, so let me just start with just a little overview of what I'm, I'm going to tell you uh, before I tell you. So I'll just give you a little overview of, of the case and what we found. And then I'll go into the epidemiology for uh, hepatocellular, hepatocellular carcinoma and the risk factors. I'll tell you a bit about the case. I'll tell you about our molecular analysis and our comparison to previous human studies, and then some conclusions, uh, because I think they're, they're relevant to what we're uh, discussing here today. Um, 
So uh, just a little bit about our study. So uh, this case of hepatocellular carcinoma arose during the course of the HOPE-B phase three study for our gene therapy, which we call Atranides. Uh, it is an AV5 based uh, factor nine uh, gene, th gene therapy with, uh, in, in which the factor nine gene contains the Padua variant, which makes it hyperactive. And we've enrolled 54 subjects uh, they've received a single dose of two times 10 to the 13th, the genome copies per kilogram. Uh, the average factor IX activity increased to normal levels at 12 months post-dosing. Uh, and the most common safety findings were uh, transaminase elevations requiring steroid treatments. This was observed in nine subjects. And there were some infusion-related reactions in seven subjects. Uh, there was a severe adverse event of hepatocellular carcinoma that was reported in a single patient. And we uh, were placed on clinical hold by the FDA and we embarked on a molecular evaluation. And we determined that this case was unlikely to be caused by the treatment with our gene therapy. So let me, let me take you through, through our uh, evaluation. So first of all, a little bit about uh, hepatocellular carcinoma epidemiology risk factors as they relate to hemophilia. So um, the uh, primary liver cancer is the sixth most common uh, kind of cancer. Sorry, hold, hold on one second here while I just make this smaller. Is the sixth most common cancer worldwide. The risk factors for development of HCC include hepatitis C, hepatitis B, uh, advanced age, male gender, cirrhosis. Um, and approximately 80% of HCC cases are linked to HPV and HCV infections. And then there are, of course, a few other risk factors that include alcohol consumption, obesity, exposure to some environmental toxins, and uh, metabolic disorders like uh, NASH and, and FALD. And uh, frankly, the and, and then in addition to that, the incidence of HCC is higher in the hemophilia population uh, though it is not, in fact, associated with hemophilia per se, it is largely because the um, especially older hemophilia patients were exposed to hepatitis C and hepatitis B in the uh, uh, late 70s and 80s before the blood, uh, the, the blood supply was appropriately screened. Um, whoops, what's going on? Okay, so a little bit about, about the patient. So uh, the patient was a 69-year-old white, uh, non-Hispanic male. He was enrolled in the HOPE-B study. He had a past medical history of hepatitis B uh, that had, was diagnosed in 1980. Uh, hepatitis C uh, that was initially diagnosed as non-A, non-B and was confirmed in 1991. It was genotype 1A. It was eradicated in 2016 following a two-week course with uh, uh, the, uh, the combination therapy for hep C. Um, he's of course older than 50. He had uh, mild stetosis uh, on liver biopsy. He was a smoker. He had a family history of cancer. And he received a tranides on the 29th of October of 2019. He, the mean factor nine activity uh, at six months and at 12 months was approximately 44%, and he had no transaminitis. So this is the timeline of uh, how we dealt with the adverse event. So first of all, the patient uh, was assessed with a fiber scan. This was a requirement for the trial, and he was not found to have uh, fibrosis or liver cirrhosis. Uh, AMTO61 was administered in October of 2019. Uh, at around the same time, he received a chest CT to evaluate a lung nodule. Uh, and at the time, uh, when we look back, we found there, there was no evidence of any malignancy in his liver. Uh, uh, he also received an abdominal ultrasound in the beginning of 2020. Um, the mean, uh, as I said, the mean factor nine activity was found to be 44% at 52 weeks and he had no bleeds. Uh, in October of 2020, at his last visit, he received an ultrasound and in the course of this ultrasound, a liver lesion was detected. 
Uh, this then led to a CT scan with four phase contrast and a needle biopsy, which confirmed a diagnosis of a hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, this then led to us reporting a serious adverse event to the FDA. Uh, he was scheduled for surgery. He uh, was then positive for COVID-19, so the surgery was postponed. Uh, when he went into surgery, it was discovered that he had not just one lesion, but a, but a second lesion. Uh, one of the lesions was completely resected. The second lesion was not thought to be operable. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, we got a biopsy from a surrounding tissue from that first lesion. He underwent uh, TACE uh, for the S8 lesion and is on the waiting list for a liver transplant. Um, so uh, let me tell you a bit about how we analyzed the sample. So of course, one of the key questions was, is this uh, hepatocellular carcinoma related to uh, our gene therapy? So we performed uh, four, um, well, we, we looked for four things and performed a variety of molecular analyses in collaboration with GeneWorks and uh, Manfred Schmidt. Uh, so we did, uh, we used qPCR to uh, look for the vector copy numbers, both in the tumor and in the surrounding tissue. We uh, looked for vector genome integration using a three prime ITR uh, sept LMPCR and shear fragment analysis, which is what we've seen before in, in some of the earlier talks. We also did whole genome sequencing using uh, the Illumina platform. Uh, we looked at mitochondrial DNA integration, again, using the Illuma, Illumina next generation sequencing. Uh, we looked uh, using, we looked for genomic mutations, both in the HCC and in the HCC adjacent tissue using whole genome sequencing. Uh, and then we looked at the transcriptome uh, using RNA-seq. Uh, and we also looked uh, not only at the mRNAs, but also at the microRNAs. So this is what we found. So first of all, we found uh, uh, about similar uh, vector copies per cell in the HCC and the HCC adjacent tissue. So around three uh, vector copies per diploid genome, so around three per cell. We then used uh, uh, SEPT uh, LMPCR to determine the number of integration sites per cell and the location of the integrands. Uh, you've all seen this before, so I won't take you through exactly how this works. Uh, suffice it to say that there is a random DNA shearing event that provides a signature for uh, the specific cell uh, in which uh, the integration occurred. Uh, this is then followed by a uh, primer extension, an amplification step, and ultimately by sequencing. Uh, so uh, what we found was that the number of uniquely mappable integration sites was approximately comparable in the HCC sample and in the HCC adjacent sample. We found 56, 56 uniquely map mappable integration sites in the HCC and 39 in the HCC adjacent sample. Um, what you see uh, on the right is a list of the most uh, common genes. Uh, in general, it, uh, seemed as if the integration was, if not completely random, at least um, semi-random. Uh, we did not observe uh, any integration event that had more than two different shearing patterns, suggesting that there is no there was no dominant integration event, and also that there was no clonal amplification in either the HCC or in the HCC adjacent tissue. In fact. Uh, uh, we found only two integration events that had two shearing counts, and every other integration event had only a single shearing count. Uh, we then uh, proceeded to do whole genome sequencing of the HCC adjacent uh, tissue as well as of the HCC. And in doing this, we identified uh, uh, five additional integration events. So a couple of things about the whole genome sequencing. We uh, covered the genome. 127-fold uh, for the HCC and 107 for the non-HCC tissue. And then we mapped the integration sites to the human reference genome, as well as to the AMTO61 vector sequence. Uh, 
there were uh, very low numbers of sequence reads for uh, each integration. In fact, we only saw one sequence read out of 127 and 107 respectively for each one of these. Um, and um, so that suggests that uh, there was no dominant integration, uh, certainly not a clonal integration in the tumor sample. Um, we also used whole genome sequencing to uh, determine whether there were any mutations or any large translocations that might be driving the HCC in the patient. And so in doing this, we discovered that the HCC sample had large translocations on chromosome one, on chromosome eight, and on uh, the X chromosome. These are duplications. There was also a deletion on chromosome eight. Um, the whole genome sequencing also identified uh, a set of mutations that are characteristic of HCC. The most uh, salient ones were P53 or TP53, which is of course a common tumor suppressor and uh, NFE2L2, uh, which is NERF2, which is another common uh, HCC driver mutation. We then proceeded to do RNA-seq of the same tissue samples, uh, and we looked at the genes that were differentially expressed. Uh, we found that there were a small subset of differentially expressed genes uh, in both the tumor tissue and in the surrounding tissue. The tumor, uh, the differentially expressed genes in the tumor are characteristic of HCC and overlap with other HCC signatures that people have, have observed. Uh, we found a number of fusion uh, genes that are characteristic of, uh, of HCC. Uh, but we also found that the surrounding tissue uh, looked as if it was pre-malignant. And uh, there, were, there was actually a lot of similarity between the surrounding tissue and the HCC, suggesting that um, there was a sort of pre-malignant pre state in, in most of the liver and that there had been perhaps a triggering mutation that led to the HCC in this patient. So I just want to finish by just comparing what we have observed in this one patient with uh, what we have observed at Unicure before in other patients. So uh, before we did this in our patient from the HOPE-B study, we, have, we had also looked at integration in the liver of patients treated for acute intermittent porphyria. And uh, so if you look, uh, these patients were all dosed with lower doses of AV5. This is on, I should say, in the context of AV5. Uh, and um, they had uh, integration uh, rates per cell that were approximately similar to what we observed in both the liver and in the, in the, in the liver HCC sample, as well as in the HCC adjacent sample. Um, so this was a little surprising. We expected that the higher doses that we had used in the HOPI study might in fact have led to higher rates of integration. Uh, there are a number of differences, including slightly different techniques for actually detecting the integration event. So that might actually account for some of the differences. Um, but I would, we would say, broadly speaking, what we have observed is consistent with what was observed in the past. Uh, what I have uh, below here is what we have done in one of our studies, we've done a number of non-human primate studies, but this is just one of them where we've also measured the number of integrations per cell. And again, the integrations per cell for um, you know, similar doses in non-human primates is comparable to what we have observed in humans. Um, so in as much as it's helpful, it seems as if the integration rate is relatively conserved from non-human primates to humans. In both the uh, acute intermittent porphyria study and in the HOPE-B study, we did not observe any specific hotspots. We did not observe any clonal expansion. Uh, but of course, there are important caveats. This is a small number of patients. Uh, there are, um, you know, they've been, they, they, they were uh, assessed after a year. So perhaps there wasn't enough time for expansion. But what is completely clear is that uh, this case of HCC is probably not to do to an integration event. 
Um, so just a, a quick summary of what, of what we have found. Um, so uh, what would we have expected if a, the AAV integration had actually driven the HCC? So we probably would have expected, uh, well, very frequent integrations in, H, in the HCC and probably one or two dominant integration sites, given that the HCC is uh, largely clonal. And we did not observe that. In fact, the rate of integrations was uh, low and it was about uh, similar between the HCC and the HCC adjacent tissue. Um, we, uh, what would we have expected in the whole genome sequencing? Again, we would have expected an integration in a tumor promoter that would have changed the expression of that tumor promoter. And in fact, we did not see that. So this uh, suggests then that the, this tumor was not caused by uh, AMT061 uh, or Etranidas. Um, so yes, I've just gone through, through the conclusions. Uh, the, uh, we identified a uh, cancer in a patient in one of our studies. Uh, the patient was 69 years old, had a number of risk factors for HCC. Um, after the biopsy, we found that there was a very low rate of AV5 integration. There were no dominant integration events. There were no genomic hotspots. The whole genome sequencing of the HEC revealed uh, that there were large deletions and duplications and other mutations that underlie the HCC that are unrelated to uh, our AAV gene therapy. Uh, so the HCC in this case is unlikely to be related to the integration of the of etranides. And um, I guess one additional thing is that the rate of AAV integration, at least in this patient, did not appear to be influenced by the fact that he had pre-existing liver disease or in fact, by the presence of the HCC. So perhaps that's an N of one, but perhaps a useful data point. Uh, this ultimately resulted in the FDA taking us off of clinical hold uh, in uh, the second quarter of this year. So that's it for me, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Ricardo. So I'd now like to hand it off to Marcus Grompe for our last presentation in this session. Okay, just a sec. I want to go to my first slide. Am I in full presentation mode? Yes. Okay. Um, for, uh, here's my conflict of interest uh, slide. Um, I would like to um, thank the organizers for uh, allowing me to speak here. Um, and I want to um, um, give you uh, my view on AV integration and liver cancer. Um, is the slide advance uh, working? No, you are not. In, uh, you're not on, you're not on full presentation mode. Okay. Okay, um, so I'm going to uh, give you four uh, brief vignettes uh, in the time I have. One is about uh, serial transplantation um, uh, of AAV transduced hepatocytes as, as a means of getting rid of episomes as an artifact in the integration site measurement. Then I'm going to uh, show you um, what we uh, uh, took, how we took advantage of this to look at uh, AAV integrations in human hepatocytes. Um, I want to briefly address the issue of uh, how liver regeneration plays into the risk of uh, AV-induced cancer, and then finish up with uh, the data we have on comparing the risk assessment in, in mice and, and, and uh, uh, larger animals. Very briefly, um, the system that we've relied on is a mouse model that's deficient in an enzyme in the tyrosine catabolic pathway. And this pathway is uh, irrelevant, uh, except for the fact that um, I wanted to mention that uh, in this system, hepatocytes that um, have the gene that's been knocked out, which is FAH, have a potent selective advantage. And you can see here, these are normal hepatocytes transplanted from a healthy a wild type mouse into the FAH knockout mice, two days after transplantation, you see individual hepatocytes. 
these clonally expand and eventually uh, completely reconstitute um, the, the liver. And so this is the system, it's akin to a bone marrow transplantation for hematopoietic stem cells uh, that allows us to um, uh, farm liver cells and expand them at, at will in a, in, in a transplantation system. The important thing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, gene therapy and AAV is it doesn't matter whether the FAH enzyme comes from an integrated gene therapy vector or from the natural genome of the cell, any um, hepatocyte that has a functional FAH gene will um, uh, can be positively selected. Also, because the cells undergo massive cell division, uh, they expand at least a thousand fold in, uh, in, in these repopulation experiments. Uh, you saw from Marquet that AV episomes are easily removed by cell division, uh, even with a partial hepatectomy. Well, this is, uh, this is like five partial hepatectomies in a row. Uh, each hepatocyte will have divided at least five to 10 times in this system. So we can put an FAH expressing AAV um, uh, in, into an FAH knockout mouse. It'll repopulate the liver. We can then harvest those AAV transduced hepatocytes and then transplant them into a first and then a secondary recipient. Each time the hepatocytes divide extensively and there's a, there are absolutely no episomes left. Um, and so this is why we are in our studies working against essentially an episome free background. Um, Mark mentioned in the early days, we collaborate with them with, uh, and they, they, they used an FAH retroviral vector um, to, to, to do the first uh, mouse hepatocyte integration site analyses. And in the supplementary figures of one of these early papers, there's this Southern blot um, that speaks to the uh, nature of AAV integrations. And what you see here is the FAH uh, AAV genome at the bottom. <clears throat> and then Southern blot analysis with single cutters um, where the enzymes used would cut once within the AAV genome. Um, and then after repopulation, of course, the, most of the liver consists of AAV transduced uh, cells. And so you do, you, it's easy to detect FAH by Southern blot. But the important thing here is with single cutters, you can see this in these starred bands, um, you can easily see uh, a band, an upper and a lower band. And if this was a random, uh, uh, if this was a um, uh, um, random integration of a single copy, you would never be able to see a band on Southern blot. So what we are showing here is that a large percentage of the integration events actually consist of concatomeric integrations. Um, you can actually do dense atometry on these bands and estimate that it's about five to six um, AAV genomes per hepatocyte. Um, and you can see both the head to head and tail to tail configurations as evidenced by these two different bands. Um, so um, again, even back then we knew that uh, a concatomeric integrations uh, are quite common uh, in hepatocytes. And this is not something you would see by the commonly used integration site analysis. So recently, and this is not yet published, this is uh, revision is under review. Um, we applied this serial transplantation system to human hepatocytes to look at AV integrations. So we used a simple um, RFP expression vector, so not an FAH vector, and we used wild type human hepatocytes. Um, we then took these hepatocytes and repopulated immune deficient FAH knockout mice um, these, these mice can be repopulated with hepatocytes from any species, uh, human, monkey, dogs, um, you can choose, and you can, they can be serially transplanted. And so since this was an RFP reporter, we used the presence of RFP expressing human hepatocytes as a measure of functional AAV integrations. Uh, we then also used flow cytometry to purify the uh, AAV transduced human hepatocytes. And then we applied um, uh, a different technique to look at the integration sites, which is capture pack biosequencing. So this is long range sequencing. The average read length was about 5,000 bases, but we took the genomic DNA and we used probes from the um, RFP um, 
AAV to pull down genomic DNA fragments that had vector integration. So this was an enrichment process. And then we, um, we, uh, we deeply sequenced this with uh, long range sequencing. We did this two different ways. The first way was we transduced the human hepatocytes in culture uh, overnight um, with an AAV DJ RFP. Then we took those cells and put them into the immune deficient mice. So that's the ex vivo approach. And then we also did it uh, where we injected the RFP virus uh, into already humanized um, uh, um, FRGN mice harvested the human hepatocytes and then serially transplanted them multiple rounds. I'll here it only shows uh, uh, a first and second recipient, but we actually did it another round after that. So here's the first data slide. You can see on the top, um, the we we're able to gate in on human hepatocytes with cell surface markers that distinguish mouse from human. And then among the human hepatocytes, we can measure the frequency of red cells. In this particular mouse, it was 0.64%. Uh, so about one in 150 um, uh, hepatocytes uh, had an AAV integration. Here in the bottom, you can see over, we did this with multiple animals, of course, and you can see that with, after the ex vivo transduction at an MOI of about 100,000, um, um, we saw AAV integrations in about 2% of the hepatocytes. When we gave the AAV in vivo at the doses that would be commonly used in a gene therapy, one times 10 to the 13 per kilogram, you can see that the integration frequency was between a half and 1% uh, in these experiments. Um, in collaboration with Eugenio, who spoke earlier, um, uh, and, and Andrea in his group, um, these um, uh, uh, we did this uh, capture pack bio uh, sequencing. Uh, here's the pipeline. We basically did a standard um, integration site analysis uh, to learn uh, um, um, what these RFP expressing human hepatocytes. Uh, had in terms of integrations. So um, I don't want to go into all the details. A lot of it is similar to what had been previously seen in mouse um, hepatocytes. Uh, here you can see the uh, integration sites very clearly cluster around the um, uh, transcription start sites. Um, both in vitro and in vivo, uh, AV transduction gives the same result. And, um, but the thing that we could see with this technique, um, because of the longer reads of about on average, I already mentioned 5,000 base pairs, is the rearrangements in the AAV genome and also concatamers. And um, this will be uh, published in this paper, but uh, we found that um, in the human hepatocytes that were transduced in vivo, 60% of the um, AAV uh, integrations were rearranged, and many of them, as you can see here on the left, were heavily rearranged with multiple breakpoints and shuffling within the vector genome. And uh, it was uh, still around 30% uh, with the in vivo um, uh, uh, um, uh, transduction uh, after serial transplantation. So, so, our conclusions from this are basically that um, in this human hepatocyte um, system that the integration frequency of AAV, both in vivo and in vivo is around 1%, one in 100 hepatocytes at standard MOIs, um, which is quite a bit higher than, um, than uh, um, some of the numbers we've, for example, just heard um, uh, in the Unicure um, uh, presentation. And, um, the, the important thing here is we're looking at integration by the presence of reporter gene expression after removal of episomes, rather than uh, the assumption that our integration site analysis will capture uh, all the events. So how dangerous are AAV integrations? Um, um, back to the uh, earlier paper by Randy, uh, 
um, uh, several papers show that mice injected with AV as neonates develop HCC, but adult mice injected with the exact same RV usually not, do not develop HCC. And so the question is why not? Um, um, what's going on? Is it replication? Is it cell division? Is it inflammation? So um, in a paper we published earlier this year in molecular therapy, we tried to ask the question um, whether chronic regeneration and hepatocyte cell division um, um, are the confounding factors that just explain the difference between neonates and adults. Um, we actually used an AAV that specifically targeted at this various, very dangerous oncogene in mice, um, the Ryan locus, and uh, a very strong promoter, CMB beta actin hybrid promoter, CAG promoter, uh, was recombined in there by, by the means of uh, uh, homology arms. Um, in humans today in the United States, the most common cause for chronic liver regeneration is a fatty liver. About 25% of US adults have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and 5% have chronic hepatitis from, uh, from fatty liver. So we tried to mimic that by uh, putting mice on a high fat diet, which is a standard model. So um, the diet was started after weaning as soon as they can eat their own food. And then AAV was injected in fully adult mice around um, 10 weeks of age. Um, and some of the animals then got a partial hepatectomy. This is published and you can read up the details, but the important thing here is um, even when we use just an RFP AAV, so one that actually didn't target the Ryan locus, um, the animals that received the high fat diet, 50% of them developed hepatocellular carcinoma that was re uh, related to AAV integrations and on the regular diet, none did. So this really shows that NASH or fatty liver and the associated chronic liver regeneration um, uh, um, combine pathogenetically with the AAV integration to cause cancer. And, and neither of these alone uh, um, uh, is sufficient. And if you use the Ryan locus, um, uh, a simple, uh, th the Ryan targeted AAV, a simple partial hepatectomy uh, uh, inducing liver regeneration without fatty liver. Uh, will uh, will make the hepatocellular carcinomas occur occur in a hundred percent of the animals. Okay, so this is sort of the summary of that. In a normal adult liver, AAV therapy doesn't cause HCC. In a fatty adult liver, um, at least in mice, it does. So finally, um, you know how representative are mice versus larger animals? And so we did actually were funded by the NCI to try to um, look at our humanized mice as a model for hepatocarcinogenesis. And we used, um, uh, we transduced human hepatocytes ex vivo with oncogene containing AAVs as a starting point that was gonna be our positive control. And in the, we also then end up, ended up piling various uh, gene knockouts uh, uh, or um, uh, AAV that were targeted to activate certain oncogenes on top of that. We quickly got tumors when we did this and we got very excited. You can see here only a few weeks after putting these human hepatocytes into these mice, uh, did, we got tumors. But then the big disappointment came when we performed staining for human specific marker, in this case, FAH, uh, to the cancer. So here you can see there's the tumor cancer. Um, and, um, and what we found is that 100% of these AAV, uh, uh, of, these liver, of these tumors were actually murine in origin, in origin. Even though we hadn't transduced any mouse hepatocytes, ex vivo, only human hepatocytes, but apparently the human cells carry enough AAV with them to then transduce um, the mouse hepatocytes upon transplantation and cause cancer. So to date, despite extreme efforts, um, we have not been able to 
uh, get a human primary hepatocyte to transform into an HCC in our system. Um, in contrast, mouse hepatocytes uh, seems like are so susceptible to oncogenesis that um, that uh, lateral transfer from human to murine cells uh, is sufficient to cause cancer. I also wanted to share with this group an ongoing non-human primate study that was funded by the NCI. The funding is now expired. And so if there's anyone in the audience who uh, would like to us in collab collaborate with us in analyzing um, uh, the animals, uh, we very much welcome that from a funding perspective. Um, the goal of this experiment was to maximize the chance of an AV induced liver cancer in order to ascertain the maximum risk of HTC. And so to do this, we really kind of went all out to create a dangerous AV integration. We co-administered three AAV vectors targeted um, uh, to the promoters of HRAS, uh, telomerase, and the uh, human equivalent of the Ryan Locus MEG-8. Uh, in, uh, in infant rhesus macaques, we used AAV6 because um, uh, that, that the, our, our monkey colony, it's hard to find uh, seronegative monkeys, um, but they were AAV6 negative. And in order to maximize the integration frequency, these same animals were given a CRISPR-Cas9 AAV that was going to make a double strand break in the uh, oncogene promoter regions. Um, so the goal was to create as many uh, integrations in these oncogenes as possible. Uh, the animals are now three years out and we have not seen any AFP elevations, no nodules on imaging and they seem perfectly healthy three years after uh, uh, been given this oncogenic cocktail. So in terms of the relative HCC risk, despite what we're showing you with the integrations of AAV and human hepatocytes, um, 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 the question is, uh, um, how dangerous is this really? Um, I'm quite convinced that mouse uh, uh, as a system massively overestimates uh, on a per cell basis, the HCC risk. So the main conclusions from my talk is that our recombinant AV randomly integrates in mammalian hepatocytes with a frequency of about 1% at standard doses. Um, a human adult liver has about 100 billion hepatocytes. So you're looking at, let's say you want to relativize our data and say it's only 0.1%, you're still looking at 100 million random integrations, which is close to genome saturation. Um, the integrations are frequently kind of catameric, and uh, the AAV vectors are heavily, uh, genomes are heavily rearranged um, when they integrate. Um, chronic regeneration, and this is really only common sense, um, uh, um, is a, uh, greatly enhances the risk of HCC. And mouse hepatocytes are much more susceptible to transformation than human hepatocytes. And, um, Murine hepatic models, therefore, are likely to overestimate the risk for HCC. And here are um, the acknowledgments. Duanel Dalwadi ha has done the, uh, a large uh, percentage of this work. And I thank particularly Eugenio and his lab for their help with the bioinformatics. Hello? Yeah. Marcus, thanks very much for that uh, presentation. And now we'll move into our discussion. I think one of the first things um, that's really stimulated by the presentations is this part at uh, this point that Marcus raises uh, around um, really what is the frequency of integration and um, how can we reconcile the um, differences in integration observed by molecular methods and, um, and those found by clonal expansion of um, RFP. I suppose, of course, one of the logical explanations is that um, the sensitivity of certain molecular mechanisms on a per cell basis might be lower um, than anticipated. And I suppose the RFP approach could, in principle, overestimate by reporting on cells that are maintained episomally even after several cell divisions. But maybe 
um, the team could have a, um, a brief discussion on that point. Marcus Ricardo, maybe you guys could take turns weighing in on that quickly. Go ahead, we can go. No, no, Marcus, you start. I, I was actually thinking about the very same thing as you were speaking. And I was wondering how we could be off by, you know, 10 to 100 fold. And uh, I, uh, you know, the, I mean, I, what can I tell you? I, I, you know, I had a couple of thoughts. One is that um, it may be that uh, we don't, you know, by sampling the way we sample, we sample just a small part of the liver. Um, we may be missing, you know, regions that have more integration. So we might be underestimating in some ways. On the other hand, you know, at least in non-human primates, we do sample all over the place and we do more or less have, at least using the methods, the molecular methods that we've been using, it, it does seem as if it's sort of on the order of point one percent to point zero one percent. So, yeah, I, I don't have a good explanation. So I don't know what what are some thoughts you must have considered this because your your estimate certainly is much higher than what we observed. Um, I mean, so one one point I want to make is that the, the frequencies we're seeing are very similar to what we see in mouse hepatocytes. Um, so I I I don't think it's a species difference in terms of the frequency of integration at a given MOI. And we have some people here that have, like Doug, that have done in vitro work. Um, um, and I, I also uh, uh, I think they would support that. I, fr I have the strong bias that these PCR-based methods that uh, require something going across an ITR vastly underestimate the integration frequency. Um, yeah, so, so can I, I, I mean, that, that I'm just, that's, that's my bias, Ricardo. I, I think that the methods are not good at capturing uh, uh, the majority of the events. Can, can I ask two questions, Ricardo? I still don't understand how the vector copy number was the same in the tumor and the adjacent tissue, but yet the integration number was so much lower. I mean, those cells should have divided and lost most of the episomes. So, so that I, I still don't understand. And, and, and I wanted to also ask Marcus, um, in, in, the, in the mice that develop the HCC where the rates are much higher and you don't see it in the human cells, aren't those FAH deficient mice? I mean, FAH deficiency in a cell autonomous manner increases the risk of HCC independent of any other factors, right? Yes, I mean, I didn't have the time to go into it. We also just did it with wild type um, mouse hepatocytes. Um, so, so you're right. I mean, that's the first answer is they're already uh, HCC prone. And, and so that, that might be the diff different. The, 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 you know, Eugenio and other people have published lentiviral mutagenesis experiments in, in the liver and stuff. It's super easy to get uh, uh, Snorri Thorgerson at the NIH and so forth. Um, it's super easy to get um, a transposon uh, mediated mutagenesis has also been done. Super easy to get um, mouse HCC with from random integrations. Um, yeah, and, and, and but, but, but you are point. right. You are, you are right. You need you need some some promoting agent, right? So for example, fat liver, in your case, or uh, we we use for example carbon trichloride a little bit, you know, just to push. So so yes, but yes, we do actually, and we get Ryan too, by the way, with lentiviruses. Yeah, so Marcus, I have a question for you, Marcus. Yes. So based, uh, congrats to your beautiful study. I'm just trying to understand. Is there any tropism or efficiency difference in terms of AV targeting between murine and the human liver? Uh, particularly, I want to know the genome copy number differences between the two, or they are same. Um, so we used, uh, based on some preliminary studies we've done, we use AAV serotypes that actually like human hepatocytes in the humanized animals. Um, so so um, the mouse, uh, hepatocytes are actually not getting the same vector copy number as as the humans. We used both AV uh, LK03, which is developed by Mark Kay's lab, that which is definitely prefers human hepatocytes over mouse hepatocytes. 
and also AAV DJ. So, um, so when you when you use the chimeric mice, you can't really do a side by side because you know we, we set it up to really be transducing the human hepatocytes preferentially over mouse. D DJ should transduce both pretty well. It, 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 and it does, but you know, in our, we captured only human hepatocytes for serial transplantation. So we really didn't oh, look yeah. at mouse integrations in those same animals. Um, um, and, and, you know, if you serially transplant them because they're FAH deficient, they're not gonna repopulate. Um, so this was really targeted at only the human uh, hepatocytes. But I wanted to bring it back around yeah. to Ricardo to give him a I chance can, to yeah, answer uh, yeah. Mark's question. Yeah, I was hoping to answer your question. Yeah, so we, we of course, the data is the data, but I, 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 we do have a hypothesis for why that's the case, which is that the, um, the, the HCC sample was only about 40% tumor. So in fact, some fraction of the, of, of, the, of the cells that we were looking at were actually sort of wild type. So I think that's why we didn't see, you know, the sort of dilutions you might expect. And of course we didn't do single cell analysis. So we don't, we don't really know. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, we were mostly looking to see if there was a dominant clone which we still should have seen if, if you know, with a sort of 40% purity. Um, but only if your capture method, um, you know, captures the majority of the integration events. So what about, you know, the, 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 the HCC requires um, activation of telomerase, for example. Did, did your group or are you, is your group planning to do targeted sequencing of the uh, promoters of, of, of uh, no, these known oncogenes? You, you did RNA-seq, so you you know which oncogenes are up in, uh, in your tumor. Telomerase, I'm assuming, uh, you know, maybe one of the cyclins, one or two of the cyclins. What about sequencing those regions in a targeted way? Um, again, I'm concerned that the, 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 the random capture method um, is very prone to missing integrations. And you could yeah, have- so may, Maybe I can comment that... on the technical parts because we have um, been doing uh, some of the analysis for these studies and it's, it's a recurrent topic. So basically um, what we have seen, so if you have a look at the studies uh, already published on the academic side and now uh, with the different studies, so we will see that we have been using a range of methods. So it started with LIM PCR that for sure, uh, so in the end it was substituted for obvious biases due to restriction enzymes. It uh, then went to the non-restricted that it was less sensitive and now it came to sharing methods that uh, okay, it's sort of almost every lab has own method, but the, let's say principle is the same for the PCR based ones. So from what we are doing uh, in the end, um, so for sure, everything is accompanied by a positive and a negative control, right? So, and it, this is particularly complex in the case of AAV because it's not so, so since every vector is different, so at least in our case, we place the primers outside the ITRs, so almost every vector gets a primer set, right? But for example, we have characterized the method on Lendiviral that we always have the same primer set, we could generate clones, spike them into polyclonal backgrounds and do limiting dilution experiments. So in the end, the techniques uh, we are using, they are quite characterized in terms of sensitivity and uh, quantification limits uh, and all these kind of parameters also in the precision and accuracy of quantification of clonal frequencies. Uh, for sure, we can't stay the same for early vectors because we can't generate those controls for all these studies, so at least from the industry side. But um, I mean, it's they are quite sensitive, and it's true. So uh, there are concerns regarding the artifacts generated during the ligation procedures, but it's also true that most of the people is adding the appropriate controls, and you can actually monitor the number of false positive integration sites that you get on every run. So in the end, so there are some artifacts that might be, it's true, nothing works 100% efficient, but we also had the chance, for example, to compare PCR-based and target enrichment-based uh, methods. And so in our experience, target enrichment is a bit uh, less sensitive compared to PCR-based methods, for example. 
So despite, uh, also in the end, you also have a ligation uh, step in there because you have to put your adapter somehow. But um, it's also the same case for every vector, you have a different weight set. So if capture efficiencies vary, a target enrichment are designed for whole genome sequencing uh, and this, uh, sorry, old exome sequencing. So the, let's say, piece of DNA that you're trying to capture uh, when you are targeting integration sites of vectors, it's really small. So the proportion is small, the capture efficiency is way, uh, uh, let's say, um, lower compared to all exon studies. But still, I mean, when you uh, do some control experiments, you are still uh, able to capture um, copies at really low levels. So at least even below the dozens of copies. So in the end, it's true, the methods are not 100% efficiency, but we are talking about you. Uh, so, I mean, from your data, you have integrations rates of 1%. And in most of the studies would see is I don't know, in the one time to the minus three or so. So it's a really big difference just to be attributed to a technological or technical issue from at least my point of view. I was gonna actually say one more thing, which is that we did whole genome sequencing as well. And we actually got coverage of all of those oncogenes that were upregulated. Now we would have expected that if in fact, this was a really common occurrence in the, in the tumor, we would have identified the insertion sites that way, which we did not. Oh. So I don't think that that, you know, so in some sense, the two methods were orthogonal. It did really did not, it does not appear at all as if there is a dominant integration in you know, in, in, in any in any of the genes that are upregulated, which we looked for specifically. But what, um, what about a hit and run mechanism? I mean, you can't totally rule that out. I mean, granted, this patient had lots of reasons to have HCC, but I mean, we, we even with all these methods we're using, we're, we would miss hit and run type mechanisms where the AAB led to a deletion and you wouldn't actually find the AAB sequence in the genome. Of course, you know, there are always possibilities, right? It's conceivable that there was a deletion that was caused by the AV or maybe the AV contributed extra inflammation or something. Those things we really can't completely discard. All we can say is that it doesn't seem very likely that there are other things that seem significantly more likely in at least this specific patient, right? The patient had hep B and hep C and uh, had a history of cancer, and there was pre-malignancy in the whole liver. So I think, uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look as if this was, and and there was no dominant integration. So taken together, I think the data, you know, strongly suggests that it is not uh, caused. Uh, uh, I absolutely you know, agree. I mean, I mean, this hit and run mechanism is kind of cool, but I mean, integration studies has been, you know, quite well established. You know, that are sensitive. Of course, you know, with AV, you might need to have a lot of oligos covering the whole genome, right? This is important, absolutely. But, you know, besides that, you know, I think, you know, that so far the technologies, you know, like uh, PCR-based methods, there, there are known. I mean, you know, these are the most sensitive methods, which are now the standard, okay, for the studies. Now, I understand capture methods, they are nice, but, you know, they are no sensitivity, and they are good, you know, to work with, for example, mouse models or, you know, animal models. You know, I don't think that a small biopsy, you know, is gonna give you enough DNA to make a really a, 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 a meaningful study, you know, in clinics. So I think, you know, PCR-based methods are gonna to, to stay for a long time still. Right, and of course, I would point out that even when hit, with hit and run uh, methods, you would expect those to be able to be identified with somatic mutation callers. Um, no, I mean, and, I... I, yeah. I yeah, I think the hit and run is a little bit hand waving. I mean, we're really talking about AV integration here um, uh, as as the cause for 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 liver cancer. Um, the, I, I had the same question as Mark. So um, you know, uh, I think it's generally accepted episomes are lost by cell division. How is it possible that a tumor that wasn't present at the injection time? Uh, you know, it was a sizable nodule at the time uh, it was seen by imaging, you know, you know, at least 10 cell divisions. H how is it possible that the episomes weren't diluted? And you, your data also show basically shock, showed clonal abnormalities in the adjacent tissue, uh, 
which basically means, um, uh, you know, P53, I think, and you mentioned another oncogene, um, where, where was found in the adjacent tissue to have mutations. No, so, no, no. Sorry, that's wrong. So the P53 and the other mutation were actually, and, and NERF2 were found in the tumor, but not in the adjacent tissue. There were some additional mutations in the adjacent tissue, especially the gene expression profile looked as if there was inflammation. Uh, in, in, in terms of why there wasn't any dilution, I mean, the answer is we don't really know, but my intuition is that a, a relatively small fraction of the tumor biopsy was actually tumor. In fact, we know that from the, uh, from the whole genome sequencing. So, uh, I mean, there probably was dilution in the cells that divided, but then some significant fraction of the cells did not divide. And that is what we picked up. There is some dilution and you can see this actually. So there's a loss of about 20, 25%, 30% uh, of the, of the uh, vector of genomes in the tumor, but it doesn't go to zero. So, um, so that's our interpretation. We don't, we don't really know. But, see, that, see, but, but, but the point is you could have the 20% difference from the, from the non-dividing hepatocytes perhaps in the tumor sample, but is it possible that the detection of the integration copy number and the episomes are, are discordant and everything you're measuring is integrated genome? So you really do have like a concatamer, let's say, of three integrant, a three integrant concatamer in the tumor, um, and that when you measure the tumor integration number, it's a different approach, different method, and it's giving you a different result. Because I, I think these methods are all prone to, to errors and things. I, I mean, inherently, not that anyone's doing anything wrong. Yeah, so okay, Ricardo, let me, well, let's, let's, let's actually get to, you know, because yeah. I, I, I feel like we've educated this question about as well as we can with the, 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 the time, and we do have some more time to, to come back to this, but, you know, let, let's try to put ourselves on the spot to, to answer a practical question, which is that we, um, we recognize that there, um, to, to many patients, there may be um, benefits for AAV gene therapy, despite the arising questions about integration without question. And um, a, a key concern that we want to surface and have an open discussion is with this in mind, what are the best ways to proceed? You know, given the limitations of all methods, what's a reasonable set of strategies to employ, both for selecting vectors to bring forward towards the clinic? And uh, what should be our considerations in preclinical studies? What methods could be constituted as best practices and should we employ? And then likewise, um, when um, cases like this arise, what, what should be our best practice? And obviously we're learning as we go, we're understanding the science um, as we proceed. And um, I, I really value an open discussion um, to try to put ourselves all in a way in Ricardo's position and say, um, you know, what, what might we have done and how can we do well um, by our study participants? So maybe, maybe we can start with the, um, the, the, the preclinical issues. David, maybe over to you for that. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I can begin the discussion. And it's, it's actually about, I mean, clearly there's a lot of discussion about what should be done in the laboratory to analyze uh, the genomic information appropriately uh, and not avoid artifactual problems. But there's also the issue of actually just getting access to the material. And so I wanted to ask Eugenio some questions about his uh, provocative and interesting studies with the cell-free DNA. So if you're faced with a patient who's going to undergo uh, AV gene therapy uh, to a solid organ like uh, the liver for hemophilia therapy, it would be a hell of a lot easier if we could say that they could have blood samples drawn at regular periods of time to screen what's happening in their genome. So um, Along those lines, we know that about 70% of patients who get this delivery, sometime in the first two to six months, they lose a bunch of liver cells because they have this elevation of uh, transaminase, ALT levels. So if we were to, to collect cell-free DNA from those individuals who are showing evidence of cell death, how representative do you think that material is compared to what's happening in the rest of the liver? So, so really, it's a, yeah, it's a representational question about the analysis on that material. 
Yes. So, so uh, it's exactly what happened in the in the hematopoiesis and cell gene therapy. So we do actually harvest very early uh, samples, right? In which you're going to have a lot of cells. So the patient is going to have a lot of cells that are going to be short-lived progenitors. They are going to enter, you know, the the, the bone niche, and they're going to do their own things. So they are going to die out. So you have a big wave, you know, of that, and then you have the true long-term repopulating stem cells that stabilize the metopoiesis. So I expect that if you take the cell free DNA from time zero to actually even before, and then over specific time points, uh, and then study not only the integrations, but actually even uh, sequencing the whole uh, uh, cell-free DNA, maybe even looking at methylation, you know, you could calculate not only, for example, the uh, AAB genomes per se, okay, how they paid, because you can also look at just the genomic sequences of AAB, just the chunk of sequence that you find in cell-free DNA. You can find integration sites. You can track them if they, if they persist over time. Um, and, and so I, I think it will be a dynamic picture. It will be not only just to look at integrations, my opinion would be very interesting was to sequence, uh, to look you know, at, uh, um, at uh, molecular signatures, to look, for example, the cells that are shedding, right? So you have specific methylation patterns for hepatocytes and kind of things. We are actually working on this. You know, uh, we, are, we are really pushing a lot on this because we were really surprised about the results we, we got with the, with the dogs. You know, they, they had very, very, very low levels, uh, you know, very, very small levels of, uh, of marking, but still, you know, we were able to retrieve, you know, thousands and thousands of integrations over time. So, so I, I think that, 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 that thing uh, is it's, it's quite interesting. I must say for efficacy, hemophilia, of course you have, you know, the readout of the factor nine in the blood. So, I mean, uh, but for other diseases, for example, that are not hemophilia, which you, you don't have a specific marker, the, the analysis of cell DNA will be important also, will acquire a further importance. Yeah, I think that the, the issue is gonna be, uh, because people are now beginning to do human uh, liver biopsies in trials, but I think the question about what will happen to those samples and how to interpret that information is still very unclear. So I think that, that, that there must be a better rationale to present to clinicians and to patients about what it is. Um, and you know these longitudinal studies, which I think animal models will help us with, hopefully will get us to answer those questions because these are not, I mean, they're not that difficult, but they're not without um, complications. So they've got to, you know, I think we have to be very careful. Um, so I mean, in, my, in the case, I, I must say something, you know, so usually the patients in gene therapy uh, are, you know, they, they have to go in general to do some checkup, right? So clinical uh, monitoring that is uh, actually normal. Right? So you have to do that, right? So, and so when they get the blood for do their own clinical analysis, we get the leftovers. And so we can do the integration site analysis. So we do, we minimize the, the, the discomfort of the patient. This, is, this has been agreed, you know, with the, also with the regulators and so on. Yeah, I, I, if, if I could, could add something, uh, you know, we generally think that a liver biopsy is you know, pretty invasive and perhaps not warranted unless there is some other reason for suspecting that there is something amiss. So we have in our trial, at least, have incorporated uh, ultrasounds more frequently as a way of catching uh, any abnormalities, which is in fact the way in which this patient uh, was, the HCC in this patient was identified. Um, I think that blood might be a lot easier. I mean, I think if we could somehow monitor cell-free DNA, that would actually give us another way of looking to see whether there is anything going on in, in the genome. That would be very interesting. Yeah. The other thing I would say is that we, we have, of course, and, and the field has, that we have patients that have had received AV gene therapies we have, you know, some patients that have received their hemophilia gene therapy five years ago, and, you know, so far anyway, they seem to be doing, you know, really extremely well. So I, I it seems at least for AV5 to be really very safe. Um, so I guess I, I, I do hesitate a bit to subject people to fairly invasive uh, monitoring, unless we have a very good reason for doing it. 
If I could pick up on what Ricardo said, I mean, the, the, the issue is, I mean, I think we have to accept that in humans, there is going to be integration. It's going to be very, very low. If we stay away from patients that have higher risk for uh, carcinoma, hepatic carcinoma, like uh, hep B, C, fatty liver, cirrhosis, alcohol, and so on, uh, the question is, what do we do now and how do we monitor? And, and I think one, one thing that Ricardo pointed out that uh, we should think about is monitoring our patients with ultrasound. We can also use alpha beta protein, but there's positives and negatives, false positives and negatives with that. Um, and then the question, if we're gonna monitor people with, with uh, ultrasound, and let's say we do it every six months, should that be only the high risk patients or the high dose patients or everybody? Uh, but um, I would suggest, I, I think the idea that uh, and what Eugenio presented in terms of the cell-free DNA is very, very interesting. That needs to be worked out, however, in experimental models uh, in terms of what fraction of the, of the cell-free DNA is actually coming from the liver uh, without inflammation, with inflammation. That just needs a lot more work going forward, uh, but that might be very useful. But the fact that we just see integration is not the issue. The, the, it's really integration that is causing a, a real risk for, for hepatocellular carcinoma. And that's the thing that we have to focus on. Yeah. Uh, but I have a comment on this. It's very difficult to say that in integration, even if it's nearby, an oncogene is going to cause anything. Uh, this is, is not a problem just related to the, to the integration, okay? It's a problem related to any kind of mutation. So if you have the look, for example, in the cancer field, okay? I'm talking about cancer field in which, you know, there are thousands and thousands, unfortunately, of patients. You know, if you found mutations in the cell-free DNA, let's say BRCA1 mutation, so there, there is no possibility to have any clinical intervention unless there is a clinical readout so even the molecular, so the, even the molecular readout is very important, cannot substitute the, the clinical part. So this is, this is a limit of the molecular analysis that we have to take in consideration. Regulators are never gonna tell you uh, that an integration near LMO2 is genotoxic per se. I mean, what, or it's gonna be able to cancer. You have to see that. Right, and Just, the key figure of merit, it seems to me in Junio's talk was the ability to detect an increase and in the, frequency of the particular integrand in circulating DNA prior to the other diagnostic detection. Whether or not that's possible in the liver is of course not, not yet clear and something you know, to be further, um, further investigated unless I'm mistaken, um, or certainly with AAV in any case. But I wanna, I wanna navigate back to um, some of the key concepts. It certainly does seem like from the preponderance of the preclinical data that we saw today, that um, many of the HCC cases that reported in rodents are associated with integration nearby proto-oncogenes and driving transacting effects on those genes rather than providing evidence for induced loss of function through gene interruption. But I wonder if somebody um, like, um, you know, uh, I would say we've heard less from like, um, like Randy or Guoping Gao, might say a word about their impression around this. Um, and I think an important thing that we haven't heard as much about today, since um, perhaps maybe Randy's talk was, are, are there elements, you know, do we think promoter strength or enhancer activity are um, key aspects of the biology here? This is certainly something that has been surfaced over many years in the lentivirology and therapy field. Um, are there ways that we can design AAV vectors to be inherently safer um, despite knowing about integration. Maybe we could talk about that for a little bit. You know, we, and what, what would be the methods or the tests that we would use to try to, um, um, to, to understand that difference in vector biology? Is, is Randy on the phone? Cause he had, oh there, he has. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm here. So I just, yeah, I, I think that the, the mouse, you know, the, like like everybody said, the mouse is probably more susceptible to cancer. And I, I, I agree with that, but I, I think there's some things to be learned there. And, and, and I think in, in tox studies, you know, you want to use, you know, a sensitive model. You don't want to use something that's, that's totally inert to, to toxicity. So I, I think the mouse model is, is 
is a is good for that. I, th I think that using a, a targeting approach like um, uh, Russell's group did, and I, I think there was another paper who did something similar, targeting some of these promoters, um, these regulatory elements to that area and definitively showing that, that they don't operate genes in the area. I think that might be a good way to start. And I think, you know, there, there's, I think what we're learning now is that, well, you know, there's, there's a potential toxicity. So if you don't, if you don't need to use these strong promoter enhancers for your disease, disease and you find that you can get really good efficacy without them, then, then maybe just, maybe there, there's nothing lost by not using them. And, maybe, and I, I think that there's, it's, sorry. Can you no, hear me? Didn't you show in your own data that when you use weaker promoters, you don't get as much HCC, right? Oh yeah, yeah, we didn't see, I mean, it was, all these are retrospectives. So I, I think it's, you know, it's still, something that sh should be you know further proven but yeah for for h hat which is a, fortunately a commonly used promoter we we didn't see a lot of toxicity and i thought that was that was a good thing because you know a lot of people choose that promoter when they're targeting the liver so so i think that's good and then also in kathy hyde's study um for av2 she looked at the you know cancers in mice and she found she was treating older mice, but she, she found no toxicity with that promoter also. So I, th I think that's, there, there are some promoters out there that, that are, um, you know, that seem to be less toxic and, and those should be used if there's no loss in efficacy and it's, it's not gonna affect the efficacy of treating your disease. So in general, uh, my personal view is uh, if we could accomplish tissue or cell type specific gene expression, uh, uh, we could achieve at least uh, uh, two positive outcomes. One is reduced immunogenicity uh, and transgene-related immunogenicity. A second is you could reduce potential uh, promoter-activated uh, uh, oncogene expression. So from that point of view, I, I think, yes, tissue and cell-specific promoters should be considered for many gene therapy applications. That, 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 to me, that's a low-hanging fruit, uh, liver-directed gene therapies, be it the eye, be it the brain, you know, be it muscle, um, you know, demonstrating that that promoter you're using doesn't have any activity in hepatocytes. I think that is something that's easily achievable um, and, and would add, would, would greatly alleviate the concern. I, I think one thing... To, 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 to really capture the AV goes everywhere after systemic administration, but the only thing we're really talking about here is HCC. No one's mentioned rhabdomyosarcoma or, you know, or, or uh, lung cancer or pancreatic <clears throat> cancer or, or gut or anything where it's, re it's really only the liver that's, you know, where there's any, even in mice data that it's oncogenic. Um, so all of these other tissues are off the hook uh, based on, the data we have, um, or is, is anyone aware of a pancreatic cancer or lung cancer, a brain tumor? Uh, well, I, well, Marcus, one, this I, is Randy. There, there's, there's just, just to answer Marcus's question. Uh, Wally at all, um, he's, he's listed in the uh, historical papers in my presentation. He did observe birth, both hepatocellular carcinoma and an increase in lung cancer in his, in his paper. I, I was going to say that one thing that, that is important is to remember that we now have human experience, uh, not, not just the Unicor trials, but uh, you know, Biomarin, we, there just, there's now a lot of human data. So what we really need to do is we need to find models that look like the humans. Uh, and of course we haven't had, we have, and so, you know, for all toxicology, including toxicology associated with AAV, it is important to match that. I mean, you don't do anybody a service if you select a very sensitive model that doesn't reflect what happens in humans any more than you do people a service if you select a model that isn't sufficiently sensitive. We kind of need to match that sensitivity so that we can do the sorts of experiments that you can only do in preclinical species, really mostly keeping these animals for a really long time. So, um, Honestly, I'm not so sure that, that the fact that mice are 
really susceptible, makes them such great models because we've now done a lot of studies in non-human primates and dogs and, and, and people. And for the most part, even when it comes to liver tumors, uh, these have turned out to be remarkably safe gene therapies. Um, the other thing I would say is that we did encounter in the process of our analyses in all of our studies that there are there is also integration of wild type babies. Of course, we're not giving people quite the same doses, but still, uh, you know, we're all subject to some of that as well. So I think that has to be, you know, we have to consider that as well. But, but Ricardo, the one thing you have to be so, careful about is the number of people that have received therapeutic gene therapy, that is the dose was therapeutic to treat the disease and followed for a long period of time is still pretty pretty minimal. And most of the non-human primate studies, the animals aren't followed that long. No, this is yeah, true. Can I add what can I'm I saying add, though is sorry, that, it, I, well, well, that, I mean, that's, that's true, but it's, it's, it's also true that we now we're starting to have that data, right? So, you know, we're, we're past the point where we're saying, well, we don't really know what's going to happen. Let's go for the most sensitive thing. Let's go for the one that's appropriate. Uh, sorry, Randy. panelists. Um, if you could raise your oh, hands I, I, and, and lower oh, them um, so I, that I can make okay. sure that everyone gets I, a chance to to speak, that definitely be appreciated. Okay. Um, you know, just um, just one. I, I have. I just had one comment. I'm sorry. So so in regard to the mouse, like nobody's saying it's it's the best model, but it's it it's a useful model. And I, I think that the cautionary note for for you know the mice is we're getting really good at transducing humans, and that's why we're getting efficacy right now. With, with our improved serotypes, but we've been using these improved serotypes in mice for quite a while. So I, I think that, you know, we're kind of at a point where, you know, we, you know, we're, we're gonna get more integrations in humans. Um, you know, I, I, I saw some, some uh, you know, the AAV2 study from hemophilia was released and Ricardo showed that the patient that had the cancer had 40% uh, factor eight activity, which is quite high compared to, um, you know, what's been achieved in the past. So I think we're getting at a point where we know we're getting more transduction in, in the human liver. And I think that, you know, there's, there's a greater risk of toxicity just in general. And that, I, that's I think, all I wanted um, to say, thank you. Yeah, hey, th thanks for that. I think that um, Ricardo would almost certainly remind us that in that case, um, those patients are expressing a mutant form of factor nine, which is more active. Um, so there may or may not be uh, more of it than has been encountered in other contexts. I think that's an important point to make. Um, David, over to you. Yeah, I, I had a question about um, increasing oncogenic safety. And actually, it's really to pose to uh, Marcus. Marcus, you you raised the issue of uh, CHIP earlier this, this morning about having a, a CHIP phenomenon also in the liver. There may be a clonal uh, stem cells within the liver, which potentially would give those cells an advantage even before the delivery of AAV. So do you think there's a concern about giving AAV therapy to um, older individuals, 10% plus who will have CHIP and their hematopoietic cells will be transduced? So it could be there could be insertional mutagenic events, not activation events maybe, or there could be clonal cells within the liver which would give those cells an advantage even before the integration of AV vectors? Well, I think that's purely theoretical. It's just what I was saying is we know nothing about clonality of the adult uh, liver in, in, in humans. Um, and, you know, it, that phenomenon was completely unanticipated in hematopoiesis. You know, no one saw that coming. <laughs> Certainly not me. And and uh, and and here it is. Um, you know, with the advanced molecular methods, we we know it's happening. So, um, I, I I was thinking more along the lines of before we overinterpret clonality data, uh, let's make sure it doesn't happen spontaneously without AAV. But I also wanted to uh, go back to Ricardo. We we haven't had. Uh, the French group who's found um, AV, uh, natural AV mediated HCC. Um, and so I, I think, um, you know, that the that, that data are already out there, uh, in my opinion, conclusive, that uh, a promoter or enhancer containing AAV, in this case, wild type AAV2, can cause cancer uh, in humans. Uh, and, and it's not a single case you know, we're up, you know, uh, um, Jessica Zuckman-Russi is now up to 20 or so. Um, 
you know, where basically there's clonal AV2 integration, the natural serotype uh, uh, in, in front of a classic driver. Um, she's also gone back and shown that these integrations actually do activate the gene uh, and, and increase transcription. So we, we can't just say that AAV doesn't cause cancer. I mean, there's at least 20 cases out there where it happened naturally. Uh, the question really is, you know, how common is it? Um, you know, and you already mentioned that when we're going in with gene therapy doses, we're probably increasing the likelihood of such an event just based on dose uh, over what happens with natural infection. Um, so, so, you know, Marcus, this is, I think, precisely why I'm trying to guide us to the practical in the conversation, since the recombinant vectors that we're using are not, um, you know, are, are not the, um, the viral insertions that are found in those patients, and they differ from case to case. Um, how is it that we can practically um, devise methods to discern between the two? And uh, that's really a, a direct question to you. What, what would be the best practice that we would have at our disposal today? I, I wanna take it from the theoretical to the practical based on what we know today, um, because it is a real consideration for many of us. And um, so, you know, in, in your point of view, what, what could be the best practice, what should be the best practice today, both for preclinical selection, as well as what you might think about doing um, if you were to encounter an event um, in a patient in a clinical trial. Um, so let me I, put you on the spot. Yeah, okay. So I agree to totally with Ricardo that liver biopsy is invasive, painful, uh, risky. It's, it's out of the question. Um, we, I think that um, our standard... So let's just have worst case scenario. There's a certain percentage of patients that's going to get an HCC. If you discover this early enough, by imaging or by alpha fetoprotein monitoring and all and so forth. It is a manageable disease. And depending on what you're treating with gene therapy, it's, it's in my book, would be an acceptable risk benefit. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about uh, by and large conditions that would require a liver transplant or something, you know, uh, very, in, you know, invasive medically to, to treat. Um, so um, I, I think, Standard tumor monitoring, uh, Ricardo mentioned ultrasounds, alpha feta protein, uh, you know, liquid biopsies. I, I think that's sort of a bare minimum until we know more that we need to follow these patients. It's the younger they are, uh, the more uh, vi vigilantly, um, you know, Q6 months um, or something like that. Um, uh, and Ron mentioned, you know, uh, let's stay away from uh, NASH and so forth. I would, I would also add to that, there's a number of liver conditions that people are targeting for gene therapy that inherently have chronic regeneration, glycogen storage diseases, Wilson's disease, et cetera, et cetera. Th there's a number of conditions on that list that, um, that have an inherent tumor risk already. Um, I, 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 th I think we have to be concerned about those conditions as targets. Um, um, I just want to bring that up. There, there's, there's some high risk genetic liver diseases. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not saying don't treat them. I'm just saying really carefully monitor them. Uh, um, for and, you know, Given the uneven results in, in Randy's uh, mouse studies and, and your own experience um, for you know, re really doing your best, I think, to bring forward next generation methods for you know, probing um, vector safety, you know, what, what, what's your top line practical um, conclusion about what, what, a, what a reasonable best practice could be? for trying to select the safest amongst a group of, of vectors that one is evaluating preclinically. And uh, what, what, what do you think might be the best practice for selection from that perspective? I, I would say this is my, you know, I'm first of all for non, again, I wanna just harp on that point for those non liver targeted diseases, prove to me that your vector doesn't activate anything in hepatocytes. Um, and for 
um, I, I think a lot of the vectors, particularly for the secreted protein diseases, um, you know, the general mantra is more, more is better. In other words, the more protein uh, the, the hepatocyte makes, um, um, you know, the, the better the vector is. Um, again, I, I, I agree with Randy uh, that basically maybe the promoter enhancers uh, and enhancers that, that are used in a vector be optimized um, so that you get your therapeutic benefit without maximal gene activation. So I, I am in favor of, of, of testing, um, you know, the transcriptional control elements in, in the murine model just, and if you could show in the mouse that it's better than your standard promoter, um, I think that that would, you know, be a big plus in my book. Uh, um, so I, I think that would, that I would consider that something that should be done. So, but I, I don't want to be the only one giving my opinion here. I, right, I think, right. No, I want to make sure. And, that I, we and I think around, the so... standard old fashioned, you know, we have a lot of experience in genetics with monitoring kids with tumor prone conditions for cancer. Um, and, and, and we know about the time intervals that need to be looked at and the tests that need to be done. We could just apply that to gene therapy patients. Jing, you have your hand up. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. So I just want to ask one question. So um, when we talk about those pre-existing conditions uh, in the patient, um, do we actually consider that AV therapy actually poses additional risk to the uh, tumor development and um, actually uh, exacerbate the disease condition in those patients, you know, with those uh, H, um, uh, um, hep C um, infection or fatty liver disease. So if it's not additional risk, should we um, worry about, I mean, um, the, 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 the AV integration cost um, insertion of mutagenesis um, in those patients? And actually um, sometimes may, you know, people may think uh, exclude those patients from the clinical um, trial. Um, so yeah, I just want to, um, get um, panels um, idea on that. So, uh, so I, I can, but I, other people have their hands raised, so I'll wait. I, I, I do have opinions about that. Yeah, R R Ricardo, why don't you go ahead? I mean, we're, you know, just for the entire audience, we're very naturally transitioning to the next discussion topic about um, best practices. And, you know, we're really, I think, interdigitating the conversation of post-approval considerations and, and best practices for preclinical development with, within this broader frame. So Ricardo, why don't you go ahead? Sure. So, uh, you know, we, we've consulted the hemophilia community and we did it extensively when we were thinking about the inclusion criteria. I mean, you might all wonder, why did we enroll this, this patient in the first place? And the consensus was that uh, because a significant number of patients with hemophilia were exposed to hep B and hep C because older hemophiliacs often still bleed and have target joints and have generally difficult um, disease courses, uh, that it was somehow not, uh, not acceptable to exclude them. And, uh, you know, I think we, we listened to the physicians and the patients, and that's in fact why we ended up with the inclusion criteria that we had, which in fact is the same inclusion criteria that uh, the other hemophilia companies have more or less followed. So, um, so that was the first part of it. Now, the second part of it is we have, of course, looked really extensively because a significant fraction of our patients have HIV and hep B and hep C. And so do we actually see anything? And so far, well, even in the case of this patient who obviously had a number of, of risk factors, we, it's, it's not, we don't, we almost certainly don't have enough data, but given the data, the 54 patients plus uh, the phase two A patients plus the phase one patients that we have, we don't see any evidence that the AAV gene therapy, even over the course of five years, increases your chances of having uh, an HCC, even if you have risk factors. Of course, we haven't looked very long. And of course, there are things we don't know. You don't know what you don't know. But, but that's, 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 and so we're, we're like every other uh, therapeutics company, we are trying to balance the risk and the benefit. 
and you know we i think thought that the the that we were, you know, we, we, we still think that we're doing the right thing in that way. So um, as we think about that risk benefit uh, ratio, you know, clearly the translatability of the findings in mouse HCC are a key consideration. And I, I think as a group, we should try to grapple with the drawing together of the threads of what we heard today. So on one hand, um, a subset of uh, vectors seem to cause HCC upon administration in younger animals um, with high doses. Um, others do not seem to be associated with that. And um, the jury is still very much out with respect to the risk in, um, in canine models and, and in patients, although it's clear that integration can, can occur, raising the theoretical question. And I think um, I'd, I'd like to uh, perhaps, let's see, just being reminded that we are, I think, supposed to take a brief break. Um, yes, and I wanna respect that. Maybe we can take a five minute break, but when we come back, I really want us to address that key question. Um, on one hand, um, we don't know what we don't know. On the other hand, um, Marcus's talk raises questions about the ability to um, draw a direct line between the um, ability of vectors to transform mouse cells and to transform human cells um, in a comparable model. And I want to make sure that we come back to that after a, um, let's say, a 10-minute break. So see you guys back in, in 10 minutes, if that's okay. Great. Thank you.
we have Doug back, Ron back. We'll uh, give everyone else a minute more to join. Hi, Kevin. Is, I, I'm assuming nobody can hear us right now, right? No, I think that um, even during the breaks, um, I can hear uh, you. Panelists. No, 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 but the audience can hear us. So the one thing that I mean, we've been talking about a lot of the uh, the amount of integrations, but yes, I guess I the, think the everyone can was, hear. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. The, the entire audience can oh, hear sorry. us as we're, as we're speaking. Sorry. So, okay. I mean, in the mouse studies, we were talking a lot about, you know, the, the, the mice having more integrations. But I guess the, the thing that was never clear in our studies to me was... I don't think they have more integrations, Randy. I think it's the same in human. Anyways. Yeah. Okay. But I, but I guess the point I was getting at is I don't know how many bad integrations you need to get the cancer. Do you need multiple... You know, integrations near an oncogene to cause the cancer, or do you just need one and that's, you know, that's it? And yeah. I guess that was never really clear in, in the mouse studies what was well, going on. Well, you know, with, with, the, with the Ryan locus targeted vector that, that, that David Russell um, published, it was single hit kinetics. In other words, every single integration the Ryan locus gave rise to an HCC. Oh, is, that's, is, in his, that's in his PNS, <clears throat> PNS paper. So from that one mouse study, if you manage to hit that locus with a promoter, you will get an HCC in the But, but th those are in neonatal animals. And the question is, how targetable is it in adults? Because I, I think it may be different. Has anyone looked at, Randy, yeah, let's, have you guys looked in let's, adults? Let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's continue to drill into those yeah. things now that we're back in, yeah. in turn. So just, just briefly, um, because many of the, events are at this um, imprinted locus um, in, in rodents. Um, yeah, let's, uh, Mark, maybe you wanna say a word about your thoughts on how expression there or risks of alteration in, um, in that locus seem to change with age and what you think might be behind that biology. Well, I mean, it's a really complicated imprinted locus and we studied it for a while. Paul Veldmanis, who is on this call, is in the audience, uh, studied this and probably remembers more than me. But the, the point is that the regulation is really complicated and the expression generally turns down uh, during development, both I believe in mouse and in human. But if you look in human HCC, there are, um, many of the RNAs are upregulated, but I, I'm not sure it's universal in all HCC. But I, I think the, the point is, if the locus is shut down, is it either, number one, harder to target by random integration, or two, is it harder to reactivate? And that I don't know. Important questions to ask, I think, with, uh, with further investigations. Are there other but the Comments only on other last thing particular. about that about that point is I think there's lentiviral data in the liver retro where they also saw lentiviral activation of that locus, but I, I I'd have to go back and look at those. You oh, no, no. yes, yes, yes. Oh yeah, you so know. right. We we set we set we set essentially a, a model in which we had a lentiviral vector with active LTRs with hepatospecific uh, promoters, and ancestral transcreatine specifically. Uh, which is quite powerful. So direct injection of this uh, vector, single direct injection in newborn mice, uh, uh, actually induce hepatocellular carcinoma. We induce, for example, in CDK in 2 mice, we induce hepatocellular carcinoma through activation of BRAF, insertion and activation. So, so make a, a truncated form of BRAF that's always active. In wild type mice, uh, we we prone the, we, we use also carbon tetrachloride to push a little bit the the, 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 the proliferation and uh, cycles of death and proliferation and so on. And uh, we again got uh, RTL1, uh, we got SOS1 also, uh, and uh, essentially more or less, uh, I, I think that's, 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 that's all. And uh, you did, did you repeat that study in, in adult animals to understand whether or not that same locus was in play? To, to yeah, um, yeah that's no no actually smart. we use uh, young animals on purpose because it gives us more time 
to, to, to follow the mouse. So one of the issues of the mouse is that it's short lived, right? So, so if you compare the neural lifespan, so many, so of course, you know, the integrations occur, you know, activate the oncogene and then it require additional mutations, probably loss of P53 or CDK and 2A, who knows? I mean, you know, there, there, there are probably many events. And so it requires some time. So in our hands, the better, so the, the earlier we provide the heat, the better. But we think it's just because the window is 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 bigger, you know. So we can we can we can have we we'll have more time to see bad things occur. So perhaps so something I, like I, a tax sequencing across time in the liver of rodents could address, you know, could be a proxy for open chromatin at that locus and the likelihood of integration at that site. One of course could also you know, recommend that ASGCT think about experiments where people transduce at different times and look at the likelihood of integration at that particular locus. That seems to be, you know, th there's kind of the broad question of, you know, which loci are broadest concern in different contexts and I'm sort of brainstorming about ways to, you know, adjudicate that shifting risk with time in different contexts. Um, I, the, the expression data, I think, is known, but I think the question of do you get uh, lesser integrations in older animals is an important point, and I don't know that anybody knows that. Yeah. Has anyone? Could I make a quick this? comment about the rean locus in older mice? Sure. Yeah. Uh, just just a quick comment. So this is from coming from the Penn group of the OTC mice, where they eventually observed cancer as a mice treated older. They actually did observe uh, integrations in rean. I think the complicating factor, and it's it's kind of I think it's an interesting you know thing to think about, is those mice are. You know the the mice that actually have the OTC disease are prone to cancers. So then the question comes becomes: Did the rean locus is that normally expressed in in mouse HECs and the OTC type cancers? And then did that allow the AV integration to integrate there and maybe exacerbate that phenotype in those mice? Which comes to the question when you're treating you know individuals who are prone to cancer, which I, I, I think you have to do with some, with some of these severe diseases where there's no other treatment. Um, and, you know, be, being somebody who works with MMA and has actually seen this in our mouse model, we are still pursuing AAV gene therapy because we think, you know, the risk outweigh the benefits and, you know, the patients are our candidates for liver transplants when they have severe disease. So I, I think, you know, there is, there is a precedence for RIAN being found. It, it's an unusual finding. And I do question whether, you know, the finding is because these mice are prone to cancer and that locus, you know, starts to transcribe when these mice are, you know, um, going through the, the, the carcin tumor genesis. So that, that, that's just a, a comment about, about the uh, question about the rean locus. Great, great, great. Let, let's, let's turn the page to this um, consideration of some of the differences in and uh, liver cell biology, hepatocyte biology that Marcus raised around um, um, how transformable they are in different contexts. And, you know, Marcus, the question I had for you about your system was, you know, you, you showed that relative to, you know, your ability to induce transformation of mouse cells, it was quite difficult to do um, in human. I have kind of a technical question, but then wanted um, almost sort of a control experiment and then, um, you know, was hoping to follow up on some, you know, crisp points from that for, from you. One is that um, if you take cells that are already transformed, you take human um, hepatocarcinoma cells, um, do they successfully engraft in that model? Uh, yes. And also, I didn't, we, we do have a control um, system where we use a combination of three oncogenic uh, lentiviruses. <laughs> and it, it turns out two, uh, two is not enough. We need three. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we can, with high efficiency, make HCC. So they are transformable, but it takes T antigen plus telomerase plus um, C mic. Um, uh, and, and, and two mm -hmm. out of the three is not enough. So, but if we use three lentis, we will get HCC and they engraft beautifully. So, um, um, I'm, I'm convinced, I don't know what the exact efficiency is, but if, if there was a true tumor cell in there, it, it would read out pretty well. Um, great, great. 
So, yeah. so your conclusion, if, if I may, please, please edit it, um, you know, but to, just to try to as unbiased way as I possibly can to, to bring the concept forward is that, you know, the, um, it, it seems that we are um, detecting hits um, that the AAVs can convey on mouse, um, but the fact that um, it appears that um, it requires more hits or a different combination of hits um, to be editorialized by you um, in humans uh, may explain the difference in your observations thus far based on the experiments you've carried out. Do you want to say more about that? I, I, I agree with that. I, you know, there's generally, it's not well understood why some species are more cancer prone than others. For example, pigs are to extremely resistant to uh, you know, most things that cause cancer and almost in uh, other animals. No one really understands why. So I, I don't really know what, why it is. Uh, uh, you know, it, it may, may be the, t the telomere length, uh, who knows what it is. But the, the bottom line is, I, you know, I don't want to throw out, I'm, I, I'm a fan of gene therapy. I, I, I think we need to be careful, but we shouldn't, you know, uh, uh, overreact. Um, that being said, I think talking, we, we, we have an oncogenic human virus that's been well studied, which is HBV. It, I think it would be extremely useful for whoever is making the conclusions to talk to an HBV expert. You know, what is the normal latency? I mean, I believe it's so long that even if our AAV gene therapy was gonna be causing liver cancer in 50% eventually, we would not have seen it by now. Um, and, and so I, I think we, ha we, we don't have near long enough follow-up. We know from HPV, you know, how long it takes. Um, and and yeah, but, that, you know, that needs to be considered. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons that HPV model may or may not be relevant. But Marcus, in your human hepatocytes, did you ever find integration at Ryan Locus? Um, no. So, so, you know, there you know, is, but, uh, I, 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 but, you know, in our experiments, we actually made CRISPR Cas9 plus homology arms and we targeted that locus. Right. But let me just say there, and, 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 and that, again, that, that did not transform them. Right. But I, I don't, oh, you did not, because there is some data about the micro homology regions in the human Ryan locus. And there's one of the micro RNAs is in a slightly different place. I don't remember the details. And some have argued the situation in humans may be different than mouse at the locus itself. So that's something we could easily look into. And I'm sure we could figure that out based on what we already know. Yeah. If somebody would take the time. I, 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 one, one of the things, um, uh, um, Kevin, that I, that I think I would really would like to, um, uh, I think one of the jobs for the field is to ask the question whether the, so I think in, in some, in, in, to some extent, it's a numbers game, right? If the integration frequency is really 1%, um, like, like we believe, um, then, you know, that's if in a sense, a hundred times more risk than if it's really one in 10,000, like some others uh, seem to be finding. I think it would be really important to nail down the answer to the question whether the sequencing-based methods are capable in the presence of an overwhelming number of episomes to measure integration frequency accurately. Um, and and I, I think that's just, I, I, I believe that you know, despite what's being said that the sequencing based methods are not good at measuring integration frequency in the presence of episomes, but there's experiments that could be done to definitively answer that question. And that would be to spike in known integration events into episome containing cells and apply your methods and see whether you get the right answer. Um, that, that, that seems like a very reasonable, right? Because you know, each of the methods has their challenges, right? Um, passaging of the cells or inducing their growth is a, you know, has a sort of um, key experimental perturbation that may affect it, outcomes. You know, it, on, on the other hand, it's clear that molecular methods could underreport. So I feel like that's a, that's a great granular 
suggestion for a way to think about the way the the field would would do better to take a, a sample that's contained entirely of an integration event so that you know there's sort of unimolarity between the integration and the um, genomic DNA and to use that as an absolute control for um, the um, the ability to detect that um, that event one would be able to make a you know a, sta a standard a standard curve now it's it's difficult to do that for every single integration event that one would encounter but it would be able to help you deal with kind of systematic issues like problems with ampli uh, amplifying across the um the terminal repeats that that you you raised in the discussion today marcus that seems quite seems quite reasonable to me well so I, think mind? I just want to make sure i'm kind of restating the recommendation fairly yeah I, also, I just want to put that in context so for example you know let's say a patient gets hcc you do a biopsy right and then you want to apply the methodology that ricardo mentioned you got to be sure about that. Uh, uh, you know, you got to be absolutely sure about it, uh, and then the data become fully interpretable. Um, um, so that's an, one reason why I think it's so important. Yeah, you know, let's stay on that for a second because I think so. That's that's one great recommendation for um, thinking about how to really quantify, you know, really benchmark um, these these assays. Um, perhaps we could hear from others. Um, um, Guo Pingao, you know, uh, others on the panel, um, Ron, very pleased to hear from you, Mark, others about how, you know, if we look at the Unicure ex experience, I think from the, you know, I think from, a, you know, a, a, you know, from an outside looking in perspective, there is certainly a, a wide variety of molecular tests employed. And, you know, is that the right group of tests? Well, you know, how do, how do people, um, look at that, and, and I think we've heard one suggestion about how to think about improving our um, certainty about the quality of the results from those tests. But what other approaches could we um, could we use to improve on or get to greater confidence about our findings? So, I, if if I can just say because I I, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, the 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 a lot of this analysis was done by Manfred Schmidt at GeneWorks and um, you know they have in fact done at least some of those experiments I mean the assays are pretty well validated they are meant to be clinical assays and I think that they actually have spiked in uh, various integrations I think the real problem is that in principle there might be some subset of integrations that you don't know about that are the ones that you're not spiking in, um, and you know, um, and then there might also, I guess, theoretically, be uh, concatenators that have integrated. Though, again, I'm a little, I, I don't fully understand why you wouldn't also detect those. I mean, they they might be, you know, you would of course treat some of them as if there were uh, episomes, but the but at the margins, you ought to be able to see them. So, I um. So I, I don't fully understand that, but I but I, I I do know, of course, that there are just a wide variety of controls. I mean, this this was meant to be presented to regulatory agencies, and so um, you know, uh, I mean, I at least in terms of, of quantitation, I think uh, you know we understand more or less how well the assay performs. I, I just think that we maybe we don't have another standard. It's the the sort of passaging is not you know, not, not viable for a human, for a human biopsy. So I don't think we consider that idea. Um, I mean, it's very, it's, it's very late in Europe, but if you're still with us, would you like to um, comment on this? Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, I have to. Yeah, so, um, I mean, as we as said before, I mean, the say is, uh, used, I mean, and it's not only what we are using. I mean, uh, there are several labs work on integration side analysis. So I maybe understand the concern from the point of view that, uh, so not sure if the problem is that you consider that when there are episomal forms, uh, the assay is not able to, uh, let's say, capture all the integration sites or something like that, for sure. For example, in our case, what we can say is that uh, 
if we are talking about a PCR-based method or even for target enrichment, we have to adjust sequencing depth when we are dealing with vectors persisting episomally. So like, for example, AAV. And then when you do your data analysis, which for AAV, they are particularly complex also because of the rearrangements and um, all the things that has been discussed and seen by others, um, you actually distinguish your integration side from what's not an integration side. For sure, um, some of the regions that you see as vector vector or rearranged vector, they could have a stretch of genomic DNA at the very end and your sequencing rate couldn't be enough or so. So for sure, that's, that's it's, nobody's claiming that they allow you to retrieve 100% of the sequences, but uh, I mean, many of them, for sure, as I said before, AAV is particularly complex because you can't generate a control sample for every assay. And this is the challenge, I think, uh, from the technical point of view, that uh, for a lengthy, you can go generate single cell derived clones. Uh, the World Health Organization is trying to um, promote their standards. This will not be uh, will not work for AAV because every vector is different. So every primer set is different, and everyone. So you can doubt which is the primary efficiency but, uh, but or amplification Irene, if efficiency. I, if, 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 if I may, if I may, um, just because I, with with all speakers, I want to try to keep us on on, on topic. Um, you know, could you comment on the two particular things that were raised, which are. Um, do you think the methods that were employed by Unicure can discern between a concatamerized integrated vector and episomal vector? That's the first question. No. So it's uh, so the methods applied were short read sequencing. So it's not possible to know if those concatamers were integrated or not. Uh -huh. So the ratio to the it's also what was mentioned before um, from the data set from um, David is that that's based on the assumption. Uh, so based on a paper from 2014 uh, from, I think, uh, Janowitz et al, that uh, they showed that AAV preferentially integrates a single copies. So and uh, everyone, so this is something that we have also published before from the academic side. And um, it's an estimation because for sure you can't uh, demonstrate or be 100% sure that those vector vector uh, forms mm -hmm. are um, oh. episomal. So it's based on this uh, assumption. And with the short reads, you won't be able to say anything and then, in this regard. And then the other, the other question I would raise just quickly, because it came up is, you know, could you give us a sense of some of the types of um, validation and quality control that has been um, run on these assays that relates to the discussion that, that Mark raised, that Marcus raised. Yeah, yeah sure. So it varies from uh, one assay to the other because it's not always the same from PCR based and PCR based, but I mean, there are, con uh, there are um, characterization of qualification experiments ranging from limited, limited dilutions of clones to see what's still the lowest spiking that you can run. There are exper experiments, this is mainly targeted for lengthy vectors where you spike a known clone or several known clones into polyclonal background and you characterize how well are you quantifying and how what's your dynamic range, basically. So uh, yeah, I think they are also controlled for false positive events. So you know if your actual integration side numbers are above your background levels or not, for sure. There is no uh, zero false positive rate. So yeah, that's a bit the efforts done in that sense. And this is evolving. I mean, also from the technical side, I think that everyone is putting as many controls as possible. And in order to, I mean, these high sequencing depths, they bring more artifacts for sure. So, yeah. But in, your, in your limiting dilution, are you spiking it into episome 10 vector copies, 15, 20 vector copies per cell background, or are you just diluting it with regular genomic DNA? Um, I, I, I think that's, that's the key technical confounder with AAV is you have all of these ITRs and vector genomes that are gonna re that are gonna bind your primers, um, okay. and, and that's oh. that's why that's it's hard to overcome that. Um, 
I don't agree. Uh, no, so no, no. I think let's score, let's score the no, point I, I now don't. because time time is I, short. I, the, I the, really, this is something that we should circle back around to. I, I as think a, this is a, a really important topic, though, because I've seen a lot of data, some of it's proprietary, where episomes really influence the ability to detect integrants. And even if you just add back episomes, the problem is in vivo, the episomes don't exist as one form. There's concatomers, there's, you know, mal circles, linear forms. So this all influences the these these technologies. But in yeah, all yeah, sense, let's, let's, be, yeah. as far as sampling, you're only getting a sample of what's there, not all of what's there. You need to do some other mathematical technique to put together what the population is. And so the dilution effect may or may not influence that depending on how you handle it. Okay, wait, just, just we, I'm we, here if, that we could just if just, I might <laughs> fastly answer yeah. to the dilution yeah. experiment. So um we don't have a control AUV samples, okay? So that's super complex. But what I can say is that, let's talk about Lenti. We have a clone and we spike it into polyclonal background, okay? And we check how many copies of these clones we can detect. The polyclonal background of these Lenti uh, copies, they act as your episomal forms because you are actually detecting all of them. So it would simulate a, a comparable situation because you have the same background of, let's say, non-targeted integrated events. I don't agree with that because the number of episomes you'll have with AEV is so much higher than Lenti and Lenti aren't the episomes all the same, pretty much the same structure. Mark so so let's yeah. let's I, I want to hear I, I'm gonna stop you guys um, okay. because we're we are in a we're in an endless we have found ourselves in an endless loop that it is my responsibility to break us out of okay so um, Fr Fred you you've been very patient and I haven't had much of a chance to speak so I'd like to turn it back over to you okay so we've done lots of um, uh, mon clinical monitoring of integration site populations, lots of reconstruction experiments uh, along the lines of what Irene was, Irene was mentioning, and I agree with what she was saying. So a few comments. Um, the ITR can interfere with PCR. We find with, um, with plasmid vectors, we can PCR through one ITR. We can't get through two very well. So there can be an inhibitory effect there. Um, for the spiking experiments, I agree that that kind of uh, measure can be useful. But again, to get back to something I said before, um, you're never sequencing or you're very rarely sequencing all the integration sites in a sample. You're getting a sample of the integration sites that are in your specimen. And so if you want to know what the population size is, you need to do some kind of mathematical reconstruction. I think uh, Eugenio, I think, mentioned this. So um, the fact that there's an inhibitor in there, and I agree that the episom episomal DNA would be an inhibitor potentially, but that needn't necessarily matter if you're doing your population size reconstruction well. So a lot comes back to the mass surrounding that. Um, another kind of thing that people haven't mentioned, if you're going to do a reconstruction, what are you going to use in your DNA exactly? Are you going to use a full ITR, a partially truncated ITR, a really, really truncated ITR? It seems like that may influence the outcome also. So we almost always find truncated ITRs in our integration sites. But is that um, because the full length is inhibitory or not? And so um, I think it's probably our, our recovery procedures are yielding a reasonably good look at the population. But I think it's probably progressively worse the longer the ITR, which is something that is worth discussion also. And then I'll make one last point, which is the PCR conditions matter. As your PCRs get hotter, stuff like that, you get through the ITRs better. So there's not just one way of doing it. There's lots of um, pieces there to optimize in order to capture your samples better. And so all of these things, go, I think, go into um, estimating the population size of the integrated um, forms and then um, circling back to addressing some of the questions you've been discussing. Great, great. Th thank you so much for that um, perspective, Fred. I think that's so very helpful. I, I appreciate that. I, I want to close this issue while acknowledging that it's something that we as a group should come back to um, subsequently in another setting to really drill down into. I think that critically important will be drilling down as an HGCT community around best practices around this. And I think we should try to do that in a future open forum, if that would be my recommendation from this. Um, there's clearly progress understanding that can be made around this as we better understand what forms are regularly integrated by different sequencing technologies. Um, I want to make sure that in what little time we have left that we hit one other major biological point which um, a variety of speakers um, 
came to. And I think this is quite important given the observations, um, not only in rodents, but also in canine models. And that's really this question of what should we expect um, clone size to be if we um, are accurately uh, measuring it in different contexts. And I think that uh, what was surfaced really was um, our lack of understanding of the natural rate of replication of hepatocytes in different settings. And understanding that I think is quite critical for understanding um, whether or not we should expect clone sizes of one or two or many. Um, I don't know if, if many of you have seen the bioarchive paper um, that I guess is still um, under peer review looking at carbon-14 dating in the liver as a means of birth dating human hepatocytes, um, which suggests that the um, lifespan and the rate of turnover of hepatocytes may be higher than it is um, in, in rodents. And certainly, um, you know, the, the, the turnover and division may be happening over long periods of time. That's, you know, I think one interesting methods, one of the interesting methods that people are using in, in human tissues to try to birth date samples. But, um, you know, I wanna come back to Denise and, and, and David and, and say, you know, in, in a kind of bridging animal model like the dog, how might we think about um, really trying to ask this question in um, a rational way of, of what the lifespan of a liver cell is, what, what we expect about its normal clonal behavior, and how could we inform ourselves around that to try to understand what clone size should just naturally be. Um, because after all, um, you know, these integration sites are a form of lineage tracing. We use lineage tracing all the time in developmental biology to read out what we um, infer to be the normal physiological clone size during development and regeneration. How, how might we approach that in the dog? And maybe I'll go to Denise first to, to, to hear her thoughts and then David, give you a chance to weigh in. Yeah, I mean, I think, Kevin, this is an important question. And, you know, it's been raised throughout the day that this is something that we just really don't understand so well. I think, I, I mean, I, I think that one topic that has not come up so frequently in the discussions today is trying to um, sort of evaluate the natural history of what is going on in the liver. And I mean, Marcus certainly brought this up, but you know, a model like the dog could provide opportunities where we could feasibly do liver biopsies over time and, and try to understand better what is happening in the liver um, in terms of natural uh, proliferation of hepatocytes perhaps, but also what is happening to the AV integration events over time. I mean, I think that one point to keep in mind about, um, I mean, certainly our data in the dogs is that, you know, these integration events were not in just random genes or the, the clonal expansions we detected. You know, at least half of these genes are genes involved in cell growth and cancer. So I don't think we can dismiss these necessarily as just proliferation over the natural history of the dog. So I, th I think we just have to, uh, I mean, I just, I, I not, not to be, uh, the data should not, um, I guess, you know, as Marcus pointed out, we're not trying to be alarmist here, but I mean, I think we have to step back and, and say, you know, a clonal expansion of over a hundred cells is something that we have to pay attention to. So I don't think this is normal proliferation of the liver, but again, we don't know very much. And I think a model like the dog would allow us to evaluate more carefully over time uh, what is going on in the liver. And maybe and, and David could add I guess, to that. I, I guess I would just question Can I, can I just I mean, ask a quick question? I, I just question. wanna you know, say that those two things don't cohabitate very well together though. You know, I think that um, you know, there, there are two separate issues to pay attention to. I, I think you yourself acknowledge that we don't know what to expect for clone size. And I think that's an important thing to say. And, you know, I think it's critical that we continue to follow these dogs. I think it's, you know, clearly critical that we need to try to link together changes in gene expression with clone size, which is still also 
a, a critical you know piece of this puzzle to try to understand that 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 relationship. Um, but I'm exactly trying to drive us towards that you know that 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 understanding to support um, mm. to support that view. So uh, David, o over to you. Can I just yeah. ask one more question of Denise to just put some background on? I forget Denise, what was using your method? What what integration frequency overall did you? find in your in your remind us what that number was well that's a very uh important question and uh rick and i discuss this frequently but we have not attempted to determine an integration frequency based on our data we do have to do some additional controls but i mean at the point being that we know we're underestimating we know we're underestimating because we use primers that reside in the itr and many of these itrs are not intact and so um, we would be underestimating if we tried so you to don't know the that. number at this point. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No. I'm That's backing okay. out, Kevin. Yeah, no, 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 no problem. No problem. We have time for that. Um, Dave, Dave, but I want I did want to make the point that that was one of the reasons why we haven't tried to address that question is because that we know that, a, um, that, that value would not be accurate based on the methods that, that we use, because all of the methods, as we've discussed, have limitations. So we have not attempted to determine that frequency at this point. Um, so Kevin, I think, I think it's pretty obvious <clears throat> from the session that we've had today that we need much more um, biological knowledge for all of the species we're interested in, from humans to mice. <clears throat> um, I mean, we're not gonna have human data that's gonna be reliable or useful for several years the largest studies are still only five or 10 years out with five, 10, 15, 20 people. So I think that it's really important that although maybe the mouse has, I mean, certainly species specific differences in terms of um, toxicities, sensitivity to oncogenic events. I think that, that, that there's, we still must work with all three and plus I guess non-human primate models to learn about the biology through longitudinal studies, where we can do things, at least in the preclinical models, which we cannot do in humans. So I think that the, the, the amount of ignorance is actually frightening. And when patients approach clinicians and say, tell us what to do here, I don't know what the hell they're gonna say, apart from the fact that there are additional studies ongoing and that at the moment, there's no profound, short-term problems with oncogenicity. But you know, that goes to 10 years. Beyond that, I don't think we know. So that's, you know, so let's, let's, and, and let's put a that's, marker that's down an, on- That's an adult, on, David. That's an no. adult. Yeah, yeah, no, it, yeah. right. Let's, so yeah. Let's, so, yeah, let's, let's put a marker down on that because I, I do want to make sure we come back to that. I think that's a key point, but, but, but David, can I, can I redirect the question to you that I, I directed to Denise, um, which is, how, how might we, you know, can you imagine ways that we can take advantage of the dog um, as a, a model now where there is considerable experience over long periods of time with AAV to think about ways that we could measure clone size um, through orthogonal methods in the dog? Um, you know, could it be, um, you know, um, drift in sequence from an early stage, um, you know, based on the type of, um, you know, um, somatic mu uh, mutational calling that Marcus referred to. Um, should be thinking about something like, um, you know, a very low frequency um, um, administration of something like a, a, a Cas9 guide LNP against a particular locus that we think is benign as a community. And we would induce um, a mutation there that could serve as a kind of barcode, um, the unique indel in each cell clone that could be followed out over time. You know, this is me brainstorming, but you know, what, what do you, what does the team think about um, and the group think about that kind of approach for learning in dog about how we might think about the, you know, the, 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 the growth of clones in that preclinical model? What are, you, what are your thoughts? So, so I, think, I think the idea is very good. I mean, we, we've now got some benchmarking in albeit 16, 17 animals that have gone out to a decade. 
So we, we, we have a bunch of data, we have tissue that's still available to go back and do further studies to resolve some of the technical issues that have been discussed today. So we could look with um, other orthogonal um, assays to substantiate or not the things that have been discussed today out at 10 years. And then you could establish longitudinal studies in these animals that are somewhere between 10 and 20 kilograms in size. Repeated liver biopsies with interventional radiologists are relatively straightforward. And so every six months, you could go back and ask what is happening about um, uh, episomes versus integrated copies and the uh, evolution of the integrated copies. So I think the model um, is decent and should be pursued. It just doesn't have, it won't have the end number in terms of what you could get in mice, but it certainly allows you to do longitudinal studies, which would be difficult in mice. Yeah, but it even occurs to me if you had something like just a, a collection of dogs at many different ages, you might be able to collect blood to get a consensus genome sequence and then do um, very deep sequencing in different liver biopsies um, in order to be able to obtain a sense of clone size through somatic mutational calling. And um, you know that, that, that that would be a completely orthogonal approach to the ones that we've heard about today to be able to determine clone size. So you know, maybe you know, we should be brainstorming as a community about approaches like this. And you know, in the last few minutes, I really wanna turn back to, I think the important question that you, um, that you raised, and that is that as we think about um, these emerging findings, what, what are the sorts of um, things that we should be asking ourselves as a community as um, we contemplate really what, what we would say um, to patients or recommend that physicians say to patients based on our understanding of the science. Ob obviously, it will be tempered by their perception um, as a physician of the risk-benefit analysis. But when we think about communicating what the risks are based on the totality of the data, um, maybe we could go around the, the room and, um, and surface each person's um, view. So may, maybe since you're on screen, we can maybe talk to you, David, since um, you've, uh, you, you sort of already uh, nodded at, at your, your uncertainty. Yeah, so in summary, I think it is an individual risk benefit analysis. You know, in a disease like hemophilia, where there's increasing um, availability of alternative, very effective and safe therapies, there will still be some patients, maybe quite a few patients who would be interested in not having to inject themselves frequently for five years, 10 years. So I think it's, it's although um, there are, yeah, safe, um, other ways of delivering that therapy, gene therapy, will still be considered with all the uncertainties that we still have, that we've been discussing. Some patients will say, give this to me. And of course, in the, in the more severe metabolic diseases or neurological diseases, um, Marcus has described, um, it, it's a very, very different risk-benefit analysis. And so some of these risks that we've described um, will be put aside and people will go ahead. Denise, maybe let's hear from you. Well, I, I, I agree with, uh, you know, David's perspective, especially with hemophilia and the risk benefits. I mean, I think the other thing that keeps coming to my mind is that, you know, at this point, we many, many hundreds of patients have been treated with AV vectors. And while we do know that they have not been followed out for much more than 10 years at the, at the longest, uh, follow up at this point, um, you know, we, we haven't had any adverse events related to AV integration. And I think if I was thinking about how we might communicate with patients um, and, and think about what these theoretical risks are, I think we have to sort of step back and maybe keep that in mind um, while certainly coming to a consensus on how we can further investigate this so that we can really start to understand better what the risks are. Thank you. Mar Marcus, over to you. Me or Marcus, I didn't. Oh, Mark, 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 why don't you go ahead since Marcus is gonna find the mute button. Okay. I mean, I, I think keeping things in perspective, I, I think there, 
there is a risk. I mean, I, I think it's small. I don't think we should be alarmist, but I, I think we are using gene therapy to treat serious illness and remind people that for a lot of serious diseases where small molecules are used, one of the major side effects of, of these are inducing tumors and some of the treatments for lymphomas, the, the, the treatment actually, one of the major side effects is secondary uh, tumors due to the drugs. So if you keep that in perspective, I, I think we have to make people aware that this is a possible risk. But again, um, you know, the risk benefit, I, I think is, you know, I think of it as my own loved one uh, and all the diseases we've discussed, I would definitely do it. And Ricardo? Yeah, I don't have much more to say other than that, uh, you know, I come to this from having, you know, a, a career developing other kinds of medicines. And um, what we're facing is not unique to AV gene therapy. And essentially every medicine that you're developing has some set of risks. And it's always a question of, do the benefits justify those risks? That is true for AV gene therapy. Uh, compared to a lot of other things that we give to patients, AV seems to be really pretty safe so far. So I, I guess that's kind of how I would have that discussion. That is not to say that, you know, you shouldn't have an informed discussion, but uh, I think it's comparatively safe. I, I think the one additional viewpoint that isn't quite represented here, but probably ought to be represented at some point is that of uh, people who are experts in HCC, because um, it is clear that HCCs, even in people who have, for example, hep C or hep B at birth, take a really long time to develop. Right, so people with you know have B at birth develop cancer in their you know fifties or sixties. So that might also help to inform that conversation, though it's not clear that in that case it's just insertional mutagenesis. It's also inflammation and other things. So anyway, just some thoughts. Helpful. Yes. Un unfortunately, the invited HCC experts couldn't join us on uh, on this particular day and time that we had the most attendance. Um, Donna, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I just like to uh, make a comment also about the relative uh, risk benefit uh, equation. I think it's very important to highlight and emphasize to patients and their physicians the theoretical versus the documented risks, because um, some of the risks we've been talking about have been shown, have been. Um, uh, demonstrated preclinically and are theoretical risks for the clinic, but actually haven't been seen yet uh, in the clinic. And so I think that's important to highlight. I think the other aspect is that all new drugs and especially drugs that represent novel modalities and it's basically what I've been involved in versus my whole career is drugs with novel mechanisms of action, siRNAs um, and so on. Uh, and they have unknowns. And so at the end of the day, it's a question of you know, risk benefit, uh, but certainly highlighting uh, what we do know uh, and um, uh, obviously uh, the fact that the drug has uh, also of course passed regulatory muster in terms of getting into the clinic uh, and therefore been evaluated also by the regulatory agencies for risk benefit is, is an important aspect. I'm short, but maybe we can hear from Guangping and uh, here's, here, uh, hear his view, and then um, we can try to wrap up with some next steps and hand it off to uh, Dr. Davidson to close the session. So uh, this is a great uh, roundtable discussion organized today. Thank you very much. So first of all, I, I'm clearly seeing the map, uh, gaps between pre-cleaning the data, small animal data, large animal data, and the clean, human clinical data. That's, I believe, I'm saying very clear. Second part, I feel based on the clinical data we have so far, it seems to be uh, quite safe uh, uh, in terms of uh, the risk for HCC or any other tumor genesis seem to be very, very small. The risk is no as compared to many other traditional drug uh, developments. And however, there's one thing I clearly see as well, that is uh, the need for long-term follow-up. 
So right now, our long-term fallout seems to be primarily based on, on growth pathology, meaning monitor any uh, tumor growth or tumors. But I'm wondering if it's uh, responsible or irresponsible if we do uh, periodically uh, in some patient population, particularly those liver targeted uh, gene therapy, uh, do some biopsy studies uh, to understand molecular status of the vector genome processing and the status, and, and uh, if there's any integration and profiles of those. So, so I personally, I thought that could be informative, even though as uh, uh, Marcus indicated, you know, how many sites you can do a, a um, biopsy and how information uh, informative that will be for your uh, drawing the conclusion. But still, I believe it should be, uh, would be um, informative. Thank you. Great, great. I think that um, if I were to try to um, just briefly enliven some next steps, it's very, very clear that a, a subsequent gathering to drill down into the issues that were raised today around vector components, around um, the natural clonality of the liver at different times and different ages after different stimuli, a um, improved understanding of the factors that predispose to HCC, um, and, um, and I think also very importantly, continuing to drill down on the improving technologies for measuring both the ratios of integrated and episomal vector, as well as um, the precise forms of integrated vector are all um, areas where um, important discussions should, should consider and where you know, a white paper might focus its attention on improvements, um, surface um, areas where better understanding would be required and discuss best practices for, for moving um, towards them. Um, Bev, I, I wanna hand over to you um, for final remarks and any other comments based on um, um, your view of the round table today. And, uh, and Dave, I wanna make sure you have time for last word too. Um, and, and again, thank all of the round table participants for their, their participation. Kevin and Doug uh, and all the panelists, thank you so much. This has been an incredibly rich discussion, fantastic discourse. And uh, you know we've learned a lot today, but we've also learned that there's a lot we don't know and that we need to know. I want to also thank um, all of the ASGC staff, ASGCT staff for really helping coordinate this, keeping us on task, um, and, and, you know, and all the attendees, the there were great questions during all the talks and the discussion in the chat was, was also incredibly rich and uh, thoughtful. So for those of you uh, that could follow that while you were listening to the presentations, um, I think, I think uh, we all learned a lot. I'd like to remind folks that we have other organs um, <laughs> in our bodies. Um, and that I think that we you know, could benefit from discussions on what may be happening. Um, I think it was raised that you know, these integration events do happen in other tissues and other cell types, but it would be wonderful to begin to think about how we can codify that information, compare it uh, and learn what we can from, you know, from those organs and the liver to, to come up with some you know, broader recommendations. To all of the attendees, please uh, um, fill out the survey link, uh, survey, which is, there's a link to that in the chat. Um, there is a recording for this meeting that you will have access to if there are talks that you missed or points that you missed, you wanna go back and reflect upon, you know, you can certainly do that. Um, ASGCT will also share the learnings from uh, today's meeting and in upcoming comments and, and other form and in fact, I think there's a suggestion that we, we may wanna consider a pre-meeting workshop um, at the annual meeting in May, where we really drive down on some of the key points that were raised today that I think can't be solved um, in, in just a few months time and we'll need further direction. 
Um, the society is going to share this information uh, in a response. Uh, request a comments from the FDA Cell Tissue and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee on Vector inter Integration and Oncogenicity Risks, uh, which will be coming up. Um, Dr. McCarty, uh, who co-chaired this event with Kevin, is going to be speaking at the ASGCT Poli Policy Summit on September 22nd, so just around the corner. And he'll in that in that event he'll provide a readout from today's sessions um, regarding AAV vector integration. ASG, ASGCT is also going to utilize this data um, to inform a presentation and recommendations to the FDA at the society's annual FDA liaison meeting that comes up later this fall uh, in November. So with that, again, um, I'll pass the, the torch back uh, to ASGCT uh, staff for any closing remarks. Um, and any further comment from the panelists. Again, this was just a really fantastic day and I look forward to further discussions.